So there they are, Aiden and Ellie, the only survivors to have not succumbed to the apocalypse. Still in their late teens, the two are in their prime, at least when it comes to baby making. The good news is they have the hots for each other, but can they repopulate the Earth? You all know that there's a version of human history that involves two folks getting it on and kicking off mankind. Those two starstruck lovers were Adam and Eve, a couple that made the Garden of Eden their home. We're not exactly sure what kind of food they had to sustain their lives in the garden, but probably a bit more than the forbidden fruit. As for Aiden and Ellie, there's plenty of food on their lonely planet. The old blue ball didn't get whacked by an asteroid or anything similarly cataclysmic. It was forward-thinking artificial intelligence that wiped everything out. But then it destroyed itself just before it could finish off the last two humans. The animals are still around. The AI was programmed to ensure the sustainability of the Earth at any cost. And then it figured out that humans were going to destroy the planet. So the only rational thing to do was to destroy all the humans. Yeah, whoever developed that program sure upset a lot of folks. For the first couple of months, Aiden and Ellie didn't really think much about starting mankind again. They spent much of their time hanging out in rich people's houses and driving fast cars. Ellie almost drove into a tree one day, and after that the couple decided not to take too many risks. There was some serious business to take care of. Thankfully, they lived in Los Angeles, California, which having a mild climate meant the couple didn't have anything to fear from a brutal winter and the fact that there was no electricity. Let's just start by saying that while the apocalypse was a bit of a downer, these two got very lucky in terms of their chances of survival. They also had the added bonus of not being related. That's a good thing, because studies have shown that when children are born from folks who are related, there's a higher rate of infant mortality. Even if the kids did survive, there's a much higher chance that those kids will be born with some kind of defect. Nonetheless, Ellie and Aiden's offspring might be born healthy, but what about the offspring's offspring? Now we run into difficulties. In a study undertaken in Czechoslovakia between the years of 1933 and 1970, scientists looked at the children of parents who were first-degree relatives. First degree is someone in your direct family. Procreating with these people isn't generally a cool thing to do. Even if first cousins get it on, the offspring has double the chance of having a birth defect. In that study, the kids who were born to first-degree parents didn't have great outcomes. 40% of them had very severe disabilities, 14% of them died because of their disabilities. We have a very good real-life example of this, featuring a man you might think was trying to increase the population of his country. That man was King Chulalongkorn of Thailand, who ruled from 1868 to 1910. The guy did a lot of good things in terms of modernizing his country, and he was also a formidable baby maker, just as his father had been. That father was King Monkut, who had 82 children in total. One of them was Chulalongkorn. Following in his daddy's footsteps, Chulalongkorn had a lot of wives, consorts, and concubines, adding up to 116 women in total. To keep the bloodline pure, several of his partners, with whom he'd had children, were actually his half-sisters. Back in those days, it still wasn't clear how bad inbreeding was. But the proof soon became evident in the pudding, so to speak. He had a kid with his half-sister, named Daksinajar Nuradhi Rajbutri. It died just hours after it was born. He had eight kids with his half-sister Safang Varhana. One of them lived for just three days and most of them didn't make it to adulthood. Varhana herself lived until the ripe old age of 93. She was the product of inbreeding. In fact, if you research what happened to his 77 children, you see that many, and we're talking many, didn't live very long at all. A lot of them died when they were barely out of their fancy infant clothes. Many others died in their 20s and 30s. European royalty was also into keeping things in the family to ensure the bloodline was pure and also to make certain money and property stay within the family after someone passed away. European inbreeding in royal families was very evident in the Spanish Habsburg dynasty. Offspring were often weak and sickly. There was also the now famous deformity called the Habsburg jaw. The internet might have been down in Aiden and Ellie's Brave New World, but they did have access to books and libraries, and being the prudent folks they were, they read up on inbreeding. After going through a few books on the matter, they were rightfully afraid their kids' kids would bite the dust just as soon as they let out that first primal scream, or perhaps spend their short lives hobbling around while carrying a jaw that would put desperate Dan to shame. The couple also read about the Colt family in Australia and the marriage between June and Jim. In short, June was the child of a brother and a sister. She married Jim Colt. They were in New Zealand at the time. They had seven kids of their own and moved to Australia. More kids were born once those kids were old enough to have children, but the Colts didn't stray much farther than their own home, if you get what we mean. The children were born through incest. A lot of the kids had defects and some seemed a little mentally deranged and did things like hurt animals. Many were very sickly and prone to disease. Incest wasn't working out so well for the family. When an investigator found them, he said it was like nothing I'd ever seen. The story sent shivers down Aiden and Ellie's spines. 
with both of them just sitting for a while in the library, thinking about a team of kids running around with fungal feet trying to set cows on fire. But did it have to be that way? That's the big question today. Some, not many, of King Chula Longcorn's children that he had with sisters went on to have fairly normal lives, though admittedly it's hard to find kids who lived past the age of 40. Aiden and Ellie were now certain that a small gene pool was going to lead to a future offspring of physically and mentally ill kids once their own children started procreating. But what choice did they have? They had one kid, a boy, and named him Carl. Then they had another kid and they named him Asher. Damn, they thought, two boys. Then Carl accidentally killed Asher when they were fighting over toys, after which Ellie and Aiden had a third child and named him Sebastian, another boy. With not much to do, these last two adult humans just kept pumping out kid after kid, as many in fact as was possible given Ellie's natural aging process. The kids, for the most part, grew up fine, but the kids' kids were a different matter altogether. Let us explain something now before we get to the strange case of the extended family. You heard of that thing called DNA. While it has packaged into it 23 pairs of chromosomes, within every chromosome there are hundreds of thousands of genes. It's these things that will determine human characteristics such as hair color, but some of them are also bad to the bone, sometimes literally. Every gene has a couple of copies and they are called alleles. When two people have a child, they pass on one pair to the child. There are dominant and recessive genes too. If one pair of genes is dominant, you will have a trait of that gene when it's passed to you. With recessive genes, it's different because you need both pairs of the genes to gain the trait. For example, the gene for brown eyes is dominant. So if you get that, you will have brown eyes. But for blue eyes, it's different because that gene is recessive. You need both recessive genes to get blue eyes. In this case, both your parents passed on blue-eyed pairs of genes. But if one of your parents had the brown-eyed gene, you'd get brown eyes. Importantly though, as you know, not all children get the same DNA from their parents unless they are twins. You get 50% of your DNA from both parents, making 100%. Now imagine that DNA, say from your mom, was half a pack of cards. When the next child is born, that pack is shuffled, so the next child doesn't get the same DNA with all the same genes. But if there were lots of children and you kept shuffling the pack, at some point, some sets of genes will look similar to another child's. This is important to know as we go along with the Aiden and Ellie story. The good news is that many defective traits are carried in recessive genes. This is great because they aren't very common, and to get a harmful trait, you have to get a pair of them. This is exactly why it's good to play the field with strangers. Ok, that's a joke, but if your parents are related, there's more of a chance that they carry some defective gene, and in that case, the child might get a pair, and one thing leads to another, a child is born with a chin that looks like an old boot. If there are generations all from the same gene pool, at some point, even with all the shuffling, some bad genes might match up. The Habsburg Charles II of Spain was the man famous for his chin. It took generations of inbreeding to make him like that. In fact, he was born with scores of defects and disabilities which made his life hell. After many years of suffering, he died at age 38. Just to give you an idea of what can go wrong, here's his autopsy report. Heart was the size of a peppercorn, his lungs corroded, his intestines rotten and gangrenous, he had a single testicle black as coal, and his head was full of water. When Ellie read that, she fainted on the spot just thinking about future generations of her family. The first thing that came to mind was a grandkid of hers looking like a character from a movie she'd watched as a kid called The Toxic Avenger. But then one day she was reading from another book and something improved her grim mood. She read the lines, The evidence for the short-term effects of low genetic diversity is very strong, but all these things are probabilistic. There are stories of incredible journeys back from the brink. Anything is possible. You can get very lucky playing cards. Ellie tried to translate that in layman's terms and came to the conclusion that if she and Aiden knocked out enough kids, and those kids knocked out enough kids, then despite the fact that there will be lots of challenges, cow burning even, some of those kids could possibly flourish and the future of mankind could be in the bag. Ellie's hair eventually turned a shade of gray and at that time her beloved husband was a formidable farmer. Things didn't seem too bad. But some of her grandkids had lives that were, as one of her favorite writers would have put it, nasty and short. She and Aiden had 10 sons, 18 daughters in total. They in turn had kids with each other because that's just how things had to be. Evolution actually wants us to be attracted to people who are genetically different from us, but the future of mankind demanded they make do with each other. Ellie was still worried, having read that there's more of a chance of defects the more inbreeding takes place, such as what happened to the Habsburgs. If only Ellie knew what genes all of her grandkids had, she could safely match them so children weren't born unhealthy, but that wasn't possible. She had a reason for some optimism though, when she read about the people of the small island called Pingalap, who lived far from the busy world in the western Pacific. 
These people were almost wiped out in the 18th century when a typhoon struck the island, but 20 of them survived. They flourished after, even though a recessive gene ensured that many years later a tenth of the island was afflicted with color blindness. The thing was, this disorder, called complete achromatopsia, was thought to have come from one man, but it didn't show up in the population until the fourth generation, but still not everyone got it. This made Ellie happy. She sat there with the book in her hand, and with one of her granddaughters crying from a crib nearby, she repeated those words in her mind, anything is possible, anything is possible. We are going to bounce back, she said under her breath in a determined voice, even though out of the corner of her eye she glimpsed one of her less successful byproducts giggling while throwing an aerosol can into a small fire. There was a long way to go yet, and what's called the founder effect was still in full swing, meaning a profound lack of genetic diversity as generations interbreed. Still, while Ellie's family admittedly all looked very similar, she held out hope that in generations to come there would be natural mutations and some diversity would occur. Since Aiden in those days seemed only interested in tending to his vegetables and cattle, he'd become so distant, Ellie read more and more. In some ways, they were a perfect couple, with she being the academic one and he being so good with his hands. One day, Ellie told Aiden that there were instances in history in which animals likely created entire populations after starting as pairs. They were eating when she looked at him and shouted, RATS! What? replied Aiden, feeling confused. She told him a single pair of rats started a population on some island and the rats thrived. He then gave her a familiar look and said, don't tell me you read that in one of those printouts from that old website Quora. Ellie went quiet and returned to her room, where she read the printout again. It said, Starlings in North America originated from just 60 individuals. There are a couple hundred million of them now, most of which are nearly genetically identical. That seemed like good news, but she understood that a small population was different from the last two. She couldn't find any examples in her books when an animal species had gone down to the last pair and then started up again. Ellie died first. She was 93. Aiden, 92, held her hand as she drifted into the great unknown. At her side were all her kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. One of them, known as Chinny to the rest, made her moan in distress just before passing away. That poor kid had just put some broken glass in his mouth. But she remembered some words written by a scientist back in 2015. If the whole world were founded by two people, you would have to get lucky in the genetic lottery many times. Ellie and Aiden might have been lucky, but as Ellie took her dying breath, she just couldn't know. Surrounded by all those faces, things didn't look too bad. Nonetheless, she knew things could take a turn for the worst. She also knew that a long time ago some researchers said you'd probably need 98 unrelated humans to repopulate a planet. But there she was, looking at people who had come from her and Aiden. So, could it happen, really, the repopulation of the planet from these two? The answer is yes, it could, maybe. But as those scientists said, there would have to be a lot of luck. Perhaps if it did happen, thousands of years later no one would believe the story of Ellie and Aiden, the avid researcher and the Cabbage Patch Kid. The reality is scientists aren't sure how we evolved at the beginning, but they certainly don't think it all kicked off with two randy people in the Garden of Eden. They know there were a couple of types of humans, the Homo genus hanging out in Africa around a couple million years ago, such as Homo habilis, handyman, Homo erectus, upright man, and then it took quite a while for the presence of Homo sapiens, uptight man. Just kidding, it can be translated as wise man. Before Homo sapiens, the oldest form of humans mated with the newer kinds of humans, such as Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthals. Neanderthals and modern humans also mated. So in short, it wasn't as if there was only a very small gene pool when things started. With that in mind, we can't look at the case of Ellie and Aiden and compare it with something from the past. We can only hypothesize that if two people were left alone on the planet, they might be able to fill it up again. It's a long shot, but Ellie and Aiden at least tried. Before there were condoms slid onto bananas and videos warning of the consequences of sex, there was abstinence only. But what was sex education like long ago when medieval kings ruled the land? Sex education has come a long way since the Middle Ages, but not quite as far as you might think. To be fair, sex education got its start way before the Middle Ages. Most attribute the Kama Sutra as being the first book to really discuss sex in any great detail. Therefore, we can look at this book and its teachings as the first form of sex education. The Kama Sutra was written sometime between 400 BCE and 200 CE and would be one of the few books in existence about sex until relatively recently. As Europe entered medieval times, religion dictated many societal norms. This meant that the main form of sex education came from the church. Church court records and documents from the Middle Ages can give us a glimpse into what sex education was like during this time. At the most basic level, the main recommendation for sex from the church was don't do it. Sex was supposed to occur for a single purpose, and that purpose was to make babies. 
However, people during the Middle Ages, like the rest of history, were promiscuous and didn't exactly follow sex ed teachings of the church. Interestingly, religious leaders began to roll out a sex education campaign in Paris, France, when they realized how much sex was happening not in the bedroom but in stables. This might surprise you, and it definitely surprised the church, until you think about what was actually going on. Male servants often slept in the stables, so if he had a female admirer who wanted to get busy back at his place, they would be doing it in the stable. Since the church was the moral law in medieval Europe, they were responsible for getting the sex-crazed people of society under control. And one way they did this was through sex education using the Word of God. The Church of the Middle Ages continued to push in their sermons and teachings that sex was sinful, unless it was used by a married couple to procreate. In fact, one of the largest sex ed campaigns put on by the church was about how men needed to stay away from lustful women. This was reinforced by sermons reiterating that all sin originated with a woman who got humanity thrown out of the Garden of Eden. This was not just a Christian or medieval tactic, however. Across history and across time, women have been blamed for the lusts of man. They've also been blamed as the main source of STDs and the vector by which they spread. It was almost always the female's fault when adulterous behavior occurred in the Middle Ages and the years that followed. It seems that no matter how much time passed or sex education changed, women were still being blamed for the bad decisions of men when it came to sex. You could probably guess why having religious organizations being in charge of sex education would cause some issues. And this would continue for a couple hundred years, since sex education would not be taught in schools until much later. As the 1800s rolled around, slight changes started to be implemented in the way sex education was disseminated amongst the public. Contraceptives became more widely available. There were some very basic forms of contraception in the Middle Ages, but nothing was super effective. Interestingly, even though advances were made in contraceptives in the late 1800s, governments such as the United States banned them as a form of birth control. The sex education messages from the government in the 1800s were very similar to that of the church in the Middle Ages. Don't do it unless you're trying to have a kid. It wouldn't be until the following century in the landmark Supreme Court case Griswold v. Connecticut that married couples could legally use contraception. The idea in the 1800s was that talking about sex, showing sex, doing sex, basically anything sex-related, caused more harm than good. So sex education was put on the back burner. Not only was the government refusing to talk about sex education, but the church was backing this strategy as well. Like the Church of the Middle Ages, the Church of the 1800s spread this message of abstinence being the only sex education people needed. That being said, the church seemed to be preoccupied with another aspect of pleasure as well. During this time, churches created religious pamphlets and books that served as the main source of sex education in the United States and other parts of the world. One of the main points in these teachings was that people should not masturbate. In fact, the focus of many of the most popular religious sex education texts was on masturbation. Some ministers taught that masturbation could lead to memory loss, extensive exhaustion, and even death. Sex education had a long way to go in the 1800s, but at the turn of the century things began to pick up speed. It would be during the early 1900s that sex education started to move away from being taught by religious leaders like in the Middle Ages and start to be taught in schools. In 1909, Ella Flegg Young became the first female superintendent ever to oversee a major school district. Young was in charge of schools in the city of Chicago, where she had big plans for the curriculum, especially when it came to sex education. Although the program Young wanted to roll out was disguised as hygiene courses, they were really the precursor to sex ed classes. Young and many of the higher-ups in the city of Chicago were worried about the rapid spreading of STDs and the harlots that walked the streets of the city. It's interesting to note that females were once again blamed for the spread of STDs, along with making men do lustful things. So in that particular aspect of sex education, things still hadn't come very far. When Young proposed her sex hygiene curriculum to the public, there was immediate pushback. She pitched it as a course that would help students stay both pure in mind and body. Rather than talking about sex in the schools, the board wanted to just ignore the problem. It didn't help that when local Catholic leaders received word of what Young was trying to do, they put enormous pressure on the government to stop this early form of sex education. Many asked for Young to be removed from her position. Inevitably, the outcry against sex ed won out, and a few years after becoming superintendent, Young was forced to resign. The world was not yet ready to have its youth educated about safe sex practices and how the reproductive system worked. Actually, the United States seemed to be taking steps in the wrong direction around this time. You won't believe the sex education campaign that was rolled out next. In 1914, the first ever movie that can be considered a sex education film was released. 
Unfortunately, it was full of misinformation. The movie was called Damaged Goods, which probably gives you an idea of where this is going. The basic premise of the movie was that a man slept with a lustful woman on the night before his wedding. The harlot ended up giving the man syphilis, which was eventually passed on to his wife and the baby she carried. Spoiler alert, the main character was so ashamed of what he did he took his own life. Although the movie was not meant specifically for sex education, it does show the thoughts around sex during this time. The only concrete messages people received so far since the Middle Ages was, sex is sinful, women are harlots and STDs will be the death of you. Basically, people in power still viewed the best form of sex education to be abstinence, and this still wouldn't change for many years. In fact, the next source of sex education material would come from war. As World War II raged in Europe and the United States decided it was time to get involved, the government released pamphlets and posters warning soldiers about the dangers of loose women and prostitutes. The government actually took things a step further and decided that every woman could be a source of STDs. And since soldiers weren't receiving any kind of sex education in school, this may have been their first introduction to engaging with the opposite sex. This campaign had a clear objective. The government needed to keep their soldiers healthy, and if they caught an STD that made them sick, they couldn't fight the Nazi threat. This meant that men needed to be educated about the consequences of sexual promiscuity. And that was why posters were made as a form of sex education around STDs. To be fair, the posters weren't so much educational as just another way to try to convince people to remain abstinent. But like always, never worked. Between the world wars, the government did try to introduce some form of sex education into schools. In the 1920s, the US Public Health Service created a manual that had suggested topics about sex that might be discussed in the classroom. But like many times before, there was pushback. People still didn't want their children to learn or talk about sex, therefore sex education was to be kept out of schools at all costs. As the 20th century progressed, schools, religious groups, and anyone else talking about sex education doubled down on abstinence. The 1960s was a sexual awakening for many, but not for sex education. Mainstream information around sex gave two options, either you get married or you don't have sex. But progress was slowly starting to be made during this time. Although sex education curriculums tended to remain the same, more and more organizations argued that the way sex was being talked about needed to change. Advocates for better sex education argued that teaching about sex shouldn't just be about abstinence and shaming people, mostly women, who wanted to engage in the activity. Instead, the education around the carnal act should be more comprehensive and safe sex practices should be discussed. It was also during the 60s that contraceptives became legal, so sex was no longer seen as an act of procreation alone. As you can probably guess, this led to major backlash from many people and organizations. There was actually protests outside of government buildings and schools to try to stop the teaching of sex education. Then, in the 1980s, people were forced to confront the lack of sex education as the AIDS epidemic swept across the world. Public health organizations all advocated for safe sex being taught in schools and to inform students of the dangers of HIV and other STIs. There was still pushback from many conservatives, including George Bush Sr. and later his son, who both ran on a platform to fund sex education programs that only taught abstinence. But the right changes to sex education finally began to occur at the end of the 20th century. By 2015, sex education took the form of what we have today. Public schools began to include not just topics about sex and STDs in their curriculums, but also unwanted sexual advances and positive communication. To be fair, even today, sex education classes are not always great at delivering the information students need to practice safe sex. Oftentimes in the United States, health classes are taught by teachers who are forced into doing it and not trained on the subject. These courses rarely meet every day. Sex education is something that is required but isn't always taken seriously by the school. The reality is most young people today get their sex education from movies or the shows they watch. Many places have come a long way from abstinence-only teachings, but not all. There are still public schools that implement this type of curriculum. And in religious institutions around the world, this form of sex education can be much more common. So, even though we know a lot more about sex, pregnancy, and how infectious diseases work, unless the information is taught to every student and adult, we still have a long way to go in the world of sex education. A woman sits down to write a letter to a magazine advice column. Her husband is in the room next to her playing Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Every so often she can hear him curse and shout, at which point she grits her teeth in anger. He won't have sex with me, she writes, adding, the few times we've had sex, and I can count those on one hand, I had to beg for it. She's hoping someone will be able to explain what happened to this guy. Today, you'll find out. 
The example we just used is real. The woman claimed in the letter that her husband had slept with her once in the last seven years. Just like that, he stopped. When she asked him what went wrong, he just told her it just stopped working, meaning his John Thomas. He explained to her that this is what happens to men in their 50s. She didn't believe him, blaming herself and her weight gain. In the last paragraph of the letter, she wrote, I'm isolated, bored, frustrated, lonely, rejected, unwanted, hurt, and angry. I'm sick of feeling like I'm selfish for wanting sex with my husband. Part of the reply she got was, it's about your husband's failings as a human being, about his self-hatred, about his ineptitude and his decline. But what if he just lost his sex drive? Can that happen? Does it happen more to men than women? Who has the strongest sex drive in nature in general? What do we really want sexually? Those are some questions we'll answer today, among many other fascinating things we'll discuss related to men and women wanting or not wanting to get it on. But first of all, what is a sex drive? Another term for it is libido. You can't measure it. It's not an actual part of your brain, it's just a thing we talk about in reference to how much a person wants to have sex. All humans have these things called sex hormones, which regulate through biological processes our wanting for sex. If such hormones were absent or for some reason depleted, we might lose our sex drive. For instance, certain drugs can affect those hormones, such as some antidepressants. But there's more to sex drive than chemical reactions. There's the psychological side, too, such as you feeling the need for sex because you've become very attracted to someone. If a person really attracts you, your sex drive might go into hyperdrive. Or for a woman, her sex drive might get into third gear right before she ovulates, when the egg is released from her ovary. That's because her testosterone levels change during this stage of menstruation. This drive develops when we're very young, before we really understand sex at all. Then, when we go through puberty, it really gets going. Ask any teenage boy who's had to do his own laundry for fear of what his mother might discover. Boys generally get very horny at around the age of 15. This is the point in many boys' life when even sitting on a vibrating bus can cause a stir in his loins. Before this age, both boys and girls might get some kind of sexual interest in someone, but it can be vague. Still, one study showed that 25% of boys and girls as young as 11 or 12 reported that they think about sex. But when they hit their teens, something changes. It's in the early teens that many boys will start having sexual fantasies. What was previously a nascent and vague feeling about sex becomes something very much real. Only 10% of boys start masturbating at the age of 10, but by the time they're 11 or 12, it's around half of all boys that partake in the old five-knuckle shuffle. The vast majority of boys will slap the salami once they get to 13 and 14, while hardly any girls at all will masturbate before they are 13. From 13 to 14, only about 20% of girls will masturbate. These are rough figures we found in the book Puberty and Adolescent Sexuality. But we have to remember, there are many factors as to when the sex drive develops and as to when it's acted upon, such as our culture. Scientists tell us that when guys are around that sometimes difficult age of 15, they're in the most hyper stage of horniness. This is due to their raging testosterone levels. With females, it's very different. Their sex drive really comes into full swing sometime in their 30s. Just as a man's libido might be in its first stage of waning, a woman's can really get going. This, of course, can sometimes cause problems in a relationship. It's akin to discovering Chocolate Mountain when your teeth have fallen out and your appetite isn't what it used to be. In short, men are fast starters, but women catch up. But that doesn't mean both men and women can't be involved in a sexual relationship right up until their 70s or even 80s. One study we found said 40% of adults aged 65 to 80 are sexually active, and more than half, 54%, say sex is important to their quality of life. That's not the kind of study children and grandchildren like reading when thinking about their parents and grandparents, but don't think for a minute, kids, that the older folks can't wear out the bed springs. According to a paper written by researchers at Manchester University's School of Social Sciences, there are some sexual survivors who just don't retire their sex organs. These are the folks that are still going at it in their 80s, and they are loving it. Still, these folks are in the minority. The paper said by the time we reach 85, only 1 in 10 women are still interested in sex, but for men it was a quarter of them. For men, though, their drive isn't always represented by a phallus that can stand straight up when it's needed to go to battle. Luckily for them, there are drugs these days that can help that little phallus bring back the life. But as we said, there are more than biological concerns when it comes to sex drive. Plenty of women have hit stagnancy in the sexual realm in their middle ages, and found in later life, when they met the right guy, their sex drive suddenly flourished again. And the same goes for men. There are social elements too, such as people thinking they're past it. Old folks might be stuck in a home for the elderly, which is not exactly a sexy environment, but some older people might use their retirement to travel the world where they find their sexuality explodes again. But what about in general? Do either men or women have a higher sex drive? 
You already know that young males have a stronger sex drive than young females, but in the case of the married couple in the intro, they were both grown up. It seems in that circumstance the woman had the stronger sex drive, but if science is correct, this is an anomaly. It's also likely the man just didn't find the woman sexually attractive anymore. He blamed his age, but was he secretly fantasizing about a younger woman? A man in his 50s wouldn't usually just lose his sex drive. In fact, males aged from their late teens to their 60s will think about sex on average once a day. Although it's not easy to measure this, as you can understand. Still, men said they'll fantasize about sex a lot more when they're still young, but they'll keep fantasizing until they hit their winter years. Yep, your grandfather will more than likely still look at young women and imagine getting it on with them. A social psychologist at Florida State University named Roy Baumeister had made a name for himself studying the sex drive, as well as writing myriad well-known books on the matter such as addiction. He researched the sex drive for a long time, and after interviewing scores of people, he discovered that men get sex actually turned on in a spontaneous sense much more than women. He said men want sex more often than women at the start of the relationship, in the middle of it, and after many years of it. This goes for heterosexual men and homosexual men. He also found that men want a higher number of sexual relationships in their lives, and they're more down than women on average in having casual sex. Women focus more on having meaningful relationships, while men are generally more okay with having one-night stands and things like that. We know this sounds like an old-fashioned stereotype, but this is what researchers have found out. It seems men are just more simple in regard to sex. They look at women and some chemical reactions go off in their heads and they wouldn't mind jumping into bed with this woman. Women, on the other hand, will be aroused often only when other environmental factors are involved. As another researcher put it, sexual desire in women is extremely sensitive to environment and context. This social scientist wrote the book, The Social Organization of Sexuality, Sexual Practices in the United States. In a purely evolutionary sense, a male might want to spread his seed to as many women as possible if they look like they could provide him some offspring and proliferate his genes. But with women, it doesn't make evolutionary sense to sleep with any old man. They'll be looking for a suitable mate. As for masturbation, around two-thirds of adult men, married or not, will carry on beating the beaver. More so, of course, if they're not in a healthy sexual relationship. Still, they'll usually knock the odd one out on the sly even if they are with someone. On the other hand, only about 40% of adult women report masturbating, and if they do, they do it less often than men. Men also seek out more sex when it comes at a cost. The vast majority of prostitution is men seeking women or other men, rather than women seeking another woman or man. Even priests who've taken a vow of celibacy seek sex more than nuns seek sex. So, what's going on inside men and women? It's hard to say, but one researcher at Northwestern University tried to figure it out by conducting a sex study. She showed the participants a series of erotic movies while a device was attached to their genital areas to measure how turned on they were. The participants were asked how aroused they felt. The straight guys in the study told the researchers that what moved them the most was watching male-to-female sex, but also female-to-female. -female. Those devices told the researchers this was very true. As for homosexual men, they were aroused by seeing male-to-male -male sex. The women in the study said they were the most aroused by watching male-to-female sex. Maybe they weren't telling the truth, though, because the devices showed they were just as aroused watching men having sex with men and women having sex with women. One of the researchers concluded men are very rigid and specific about who they become aroused by, who they want to have sex with, and who they fall in love with. He said women are more open in general to having same-sex relationships, and while they might not do it, they have more of a capacity to do it. That's why more women report being bisexual than men. In terms of making out with people willy-nilly, women who were interviewed showed that many things influenced who they'd have sex with. If the person went to church mattered, but it didn't with men. With women, their friends had an effect on who they'd sleep with, but not so much with men. The study even said that education counted for something with women. The more educated a woman was, the more up for experimenting she was, such as giving and receiving oral sex. Education didn't seem to make a difference when it came to men. And all the researchers said that men certainly seem to have a higher sex drive and they are less vulnerable to outside factors when it comes to having sex. But is this just plain old-fashioned thinking? It wasn't too long ago that women were expected to hide their sexual feelings and impulses. That might still be true in some cultures, but it seems that men do want more sex with more women, and it doesn't have to involve a lot of proceeding chasing. Another researcher said women like a story, they're more complex. An example is that a lot of those online apps that tell a sexual story are dedicated to women. Women like a plot, men are okay with a paragraph. One researcher explained it like this. Women want to talk first, connect first, then have sex. For men, sex is the connection. Sex is the language men use to express their tender, loving, vulnerable side. It's their language of intimacy. Maybe some of you have started falling in love and said to yourself, if she liked me, she'd sleep with me. 
Maybe the woman thinks if he really liked me, he'd wait and let this story flower into something more than a bedboard banging against the wall. Even a woman's orgasm is more complex. With guys, they're usually done within four minutes. That's when they're grown up. When that guy who has the stiff socks has sex for the first time, he's more likely to last four seconds. But the average woman, young or old, would take on average 11 minutes to reach orgasm if she reaches it at all. In couples, men reported having an orgasm during sex 75% of the time, but with women it was more like 25%. The funny thing is, the men in the study said their partners reached orgasm 45% of the time. As for that couple in their 50s we talked about at the start, other studies have shown that it's actually women who generally lose interest in sex first. Sure, the guy could have had some kind of erectile dysfunction, which can happen to men as they age, but it's possible his member would have worked in different circumstances. Citing another study, the BBC reported that women were twice as likely to lose their sex drive when in a relationship, but this wasn't always about biology. It was often the result of a lack of emotional closeness. The study was undertaken by the British Medical Journal and involved 5,000 men and 6,700 women. Of those people, 15% of the men said they've lost all interest in sex for a period of three months or more in the last year, but for women it was 34%. Nonetheless, with men, the sex drive started faltering between the ages of 35 and 44, and with women, it was between the ages of 55 and 64. Again though, just because the sexual flame had died didn't mean the sex drive is gone for good. Various circumstances such as hard work or kids or even boredom play a part, but the drive would still be there if things were different. And if you think about what we'd already said, if men's sex drives are not as complex and they're more willing to jump into bed with more people, they will likely be having more sex at an older age than women. It's likely that as time goes on, men will feel more of a need to spread their seed than women will want to have sex for sex sake. The amount of sex some species have boggles the mind. How much sex is too much sex? What animal can mate for 14 hours straight? Which marine creature uses the largest penis in the world to copulate? Let's find out. We're going to start with dolphins, because like humans, we know they have sex just for fun sometimes. Animals who engage in sex for reasons besides reproduction tend to have a lot of it, because sex feels good. Dolphins are a prime example of this. They will copulate even if the female cannot get pregnant at the time. What makes the amount of sex dolphins have even more surprising is not just that they do it a lot, but how many times it can occur within a short period. When a male wants to mate, he begins posturing in front of a potential partner. If successful, the dolphins will line up stomach to stomach and intercourse will begin. Dolphin sex is rather quick though as the act is normally over in under a minute. But here's where things get crazy. Dolphins conduct many rounds of intercourse in a very short amount of time. Researchers have recorded two dolphins having sex 15 times in 15 minutes. That number alone is more sex than most animals will have in a year, or even in their lifetime. And remember, dolphins don't just engage in sex for reproductive purposes, but each one of their short bouts can be a pleasurable experience as well. The next animal you've probably never heard of. But unlike dolphins, the sex between these animals can last a long time. We're talking a really, really long time. The brown antichinus are marsupial mice that live in Australia. For the amount of time they live, they have a ton of sex. Females mate with as many partners as possible, allowing for multiple sexual encounters in a short period of time. However, there's only so much time in a day, and since the brown antichinus sex lasts around 14 hours, this is a limiting factor. Males begin mating once a year and go at it for a whole month. During this time, all the male does is have sex, and remember, each time he engages in the act, it can last for up to 14 hours. The male brown antichinus are so focused on sex that they barely eat, sleep, or do anything else for a whole month. Once two brown antichinus are done mating, they'll rest for a brief period of time and then go in search of their next partner. However, all this long sex takes its toll on the body, and the male brown antichinus literally dies from exhaustion after the sex-filled month. This means that at the beginning of the month, the male is a virgin, and at the end of the month, he is dead from having 14-hour sex dozens of times. You might have to wonder, is this such a bad way to go? The brown antichinus is a small mouse, but our next species is large, aggressive, and horny. Actually, it would be more apt to say tusky, as the next animal on our list of most sexually active species is the walrus. Male walrus can weigh up to 3,700 pounds. When they're ready to mate, which is frequently, they'll make loud vocal sounds that click, pulse, and whistle. The largest and most powerful male walruses have a harem of females that they have sex with. This actually happens underwater, probably because it'd be too dangerous for the massive animals to have sex on land, due to the danger of someone being crushed. Female walruses tend to mate only once every two to three years, which means if the male wants to mate more frequently, it needs a large harem of females. That being said, the male walrus has the largest penis of any animal in the world. 
When erect, the walrus penis can reach up to 30 inches, which is used to impregnate as many females as possible during mating season. So, when it comes to walruses, it's the male of the species who are doing most of the copulating. Our next species is often considered to be the king and queens of the savanna. However, what makes lions especially unique is their mating habits. A pride of lions can be made up of as many as 30 individuals, however, not all of them are able or allowed to mate. When a lioness goes into heat, she is only fertile for around 4 days. And you know what that means, if she wants to get pregnant, she needs to have a lot of sex. Since 4 days isn't a very long time, this means that lions mate several times an hour when the female's in heat. This is one of the highest frequencies of any species. Having sex multiple times an hour can be exhausting, but the lions keep at it as the window for reproductive success is short. The interesting thing is that after the 4-hour days of non-stop sex, the lioness may still not be pregnant. In this case, the lioness goes back into heat about 2 weeks later and the sex starts all over again. This means that every 2 weeks the lions are going at it like rabbits until the female gets pregnant. And speaking of rabbits, these animals have become synonymous with having massive amounts of sex. Unlike most animals, rabbits are fertile all year round and can have multiple litters a year. They also don't need to be in heat to reproduce as the act of sexual intercourse is what causes a female rabbit to ovulate. A female rabbit allows male rabbits to have sex with her about 14 out of every 16 days. This means for every 2 days of rest, the female rabbit may have had 2 weeks worth of sex. Male rabbits, on the other hand, are good to go whenever, so if the female will allow it, the male rabbits will have sex every day. The short-beaked echidna is another animal that has a lot of sex. But it's the ritual that leads up to the way they have sex that makes each round particularly unique. The females of the species of echidna are actually the ones having the most sex. This is because she will have a line of about 9 males following her around for an entire month waiting for her to be ready to mate. There's no sex during this time, but once the female is ready, the echidnas go crazy. This next part is especially weird, so prepare yourself. The female short-beaked echidnas have a forked reproductive tract. This would make sex with a single penis very difficult, but luckily for the males of the species, they have a penis with four heads. And it gets crazier. After one of the heads ejaculates semen into the female, the male will insert a different penis head that still contains sperm and go again. This means that each time the echidnas mate, they're actually having sex four times. And if you do the math, this means that for each time the female has sex with one of the nine males that followed her around for a month, she will have sex with 36 different penis heads. Our next species wants to have a lot of sex, but since during mating season males outnumber females around 8 to 1, only a very few get lucky. The Australian giant cuttlefish meet in the same location known as Pointy Lowly every winter to engage in a massive orgy. The amount of copulating that occurs during this time in the large gathering of sex-crazed cuttlefish is astounding. The problem is that the males outnumber the females by a lot. This means that sex between cuttlefish can be challenging if you're not the biggest and brightest in the orgy. But even the smaller cuttlefish want to have sex, so they'll actually change their coloring to disguise themselves as females and enter the orgy incognito. By doing this, they may eventually run into an actual female and get the chance to reproduce. And with so many males swarming around the cuttlefish orgy, it's inevitable that a female will have sex numerous times during that one session. This provides the opportunity to have a lot more sex than any animal in a monogamous relationship during the course of their life. It probably comes as no surprise that primates have a lot of sex. Humans are primates and we definitely have more sex than most animals because we do it for pleasure as well as reproduction. But our distant cousin the bonobo puts our species to shame. Bonobos are a species of apes that live in the Congo. What makes them particularly unique is they have the most sex out of any other primate species. And bonobos aren't picky with who they have sex. They will engage in intercourse with the opposite sex as well as the same sex. They obviously have sex for more reasons than just reproduction, and although some of the unions may be for pleasure, many scientists believe that bonobos have frequent sex to strengthen bonds within their societies. The copious amounts of copulation happening within a group of bonobos could be to show hierarchy and dominance in the group, relieve tension and conflicts, or just to solidify bonds with one another. But the amount of sex itself is not the only fascinating thing about bonobos. They engage in some sexual activities in some pretty creative ways. Researchers have recorded bonobos having sex while swinging and in other acrobatic positions. Sex for bonobos seems to be as creative as it is fun or meaningful. This is so true that a National Geographic biologist named Franz Duval even said, whereas the chimpanzee shows little variation in the sexual act, bonobos behave as if they've read the Kama Sutra, performing every position and variation one can imagine. 
It is also interesting to note that there is much less conflict in bonobo societies than in other primate species, and this includes humans. So perhaps we could learn something from the bonobos and practice more love instead of war, or at least more sex instead of fighting so much with one another. And this brings us to humans. Where do we stand in the amount of sex our species has compared to others? You may be surprised to learn that humans actually do engage in more sex than most species. Not compared to bonobos, but compared to most other animals, we engage in carnal activity more frequently. This is because we really enjoy having sex. It feels good and we live in a society where sex sells and therefore is encouraged. It's unclear whether other species experience orgasms the same way humans do, but for species like dolphins and bonobos that have sex just for fun, it would seem there is some pleasure attached to it. A 2017 study found that humans are estimated to have sex around 54 times a year when sexually active. This is just over once a week. And although other species may have the same or more sex than us, we are unique in that humans don't mind spreading out our copulations throughout the year. We also don't normally have so much sex that it kills us, which allows us to have more sex over the course of our lives than some other species. Talking about you, brown antichinus. You've just finished having sex and it felt great. Now you want to do it all over again, but there's a problem. Your body won't let you. You try as hard as you can to get things going, but nothing happens. You're in the refractory period after sex, and although your partner might be ready to go, there is nothing you can do but wait. What is the refractory period and why does it happen? After an orgasm, both men and women experience what is known as the resolution stage of sex. The body starts to come out from the high from the carnal act, and things like pulse rate and hormone levels begin to return to normal. This is all necessary so you don't die from a heart attack or overexhaustion. Your body can't maintain the heightened physical levels during sex for long periods of time without negative side effects. Both sexes go through a refractory period, but women tend to come out of it much quicker than men. In fact, some women only need a few seconds of recovery time before they're ready to go again. Men, on the other hand, need much longer, which can be a bummer if your partner's ready for round two. But how long do males have to wait before they can have sex again? That all depends. Could be minutes, hours, or even days. Let's look at what causes the refractory period, and then we'll go into how you can shorten that time between sex sessions. Scientists don't fully understand what causes the refractory period or why it varies so much between men and women, but they do have some ideas. One leading theory is that there is a connection between the hormone prolactin and the time it takes to recover from having sex. In 2002, a 25-year-old man who did not experience a refractory period at all was studied. It was found that he did not secrete the hormone prolactin after climaxing as most men do. This may suggest that prolactin is responsible for turning the body's sexual drive off for a certain period of time following ejaculation, leading to the refractory period. However, due to the small sample size of the test, we still need to conduct much more research around the function of prolactin and its effect on the refractory period. This is especially true because women also secrete prolactin after having an orgasm and then are ready to go again only a few seconds later. There have been cases where men have had dry orgasms without experiencing a refractory period. This is when the male climaxes without ejaculating at all. The dopamine and pleasure hormones are still dumped into the body as if ejaculation had occurred, but no semen leaves the body. This may indicate that the release of semen at the conclusion of sex might play a role in signaling the body to go into the refractory period and not the orgasm itself. A final cause that could be behind the long length of the male refractory period may have to do with the peripheral nervous system. This is the part of the nervous system that does not include the brain and spinal cord. Researchers have found that the peripheral nervous system tends to be much more active following sex than normal. It's been suggested that compounds called prostaglandins are released after sex that affect the male's nerve responses. This in turn creates the refractory period, and in males, the prostaglandins may last longer than in females, which could account for a longer recovery time. Another compound called somatostatin is also released right after ejaculation and may affect the peripheral nervous system. The combination of somatostatin and prostaglandin and how they affect the nervous system of males could be the reason for the extended refractory periods when compared to females. Or maybe it's just something as simple as women are better at sex than men. At this point in time, we just need more research and data to definitively conclude why the refractory period occurs and its underlying causes. But it's almost certainly a combination of hormones and interactions within the physiology of the body that's causing the phenomenon. Even if we don't know the precise biological reason why refractory periods are so much longer in men than in women, we can identify some factors that affect this mysterious process, and some of them are pretty crazy. 
As would be expected, the more attracted you are to your sexual partner, the shorter your refractory period lasts. It'll probably not be a lot shorter, but a heightened libido and arousal level has been connected to shorter refractory times. Also, the healthier someone is, the more quickly they'll recover from a sex session and be able to go again. These seem like obvious factors that would affect the refractory period, but what is coming next to me shock you. The type of sexual experience plays a role in how long the refractory period lasts as well. For example, someone who is pleasuring themselves will on average have a shorter refractory period than if two people are copulating. In fact, people who achieve ejaculation by masturbation tend to have a much, much shorter refractory period than while having sex. Men who masturbate sometimes have a refractory period lasting only a few seconds. This brings us back to one of the reasons why the refractory period even occurs. We mentioned the hormone prolactin might play a role in causing the longer refractory period in males. Researchers found that the prolactin levels were 400% higher after ejaculation from sex than ejaculation from masturbation. So there seems to be some kind of connection between having sex with a partner and a lengthened refractory period. The refractory period in men does vary from person to person. It might take a few minutes, a few hours, or even a few days to recover and be ready to go again. Since everyone's body is different, it kind of just depends on who you are. But there are some factors that lengthen the time of the refractory period. The most consistent are age and health. Younger men tend to only need a few minutes of recovery. They may not be able to ejaculate right away, but after a 5 or 10 minute break, they might be able to get an erection again. Although other problems may arise, which we'll talk about later. Older men, on the other hand, will have a longer refractory period, which could last between 12 and 24 hours. It's even been reported that men in the later stages of life can need days to recover and reset their body before the next round of sex can begin. If you're having sex at this age, bravo to you, but also refractory periods probably aren't your biggest concern as much as staying healthy and keeping the heart strong enough to make it through each sexual encounter. You may be wondering if the refractory period can be shortened, and if not, your partner may be. Our understanding of the refractory period of the human body is tenuous at best. This means we're not entirely sure how to shorten it, but there are some methods that may work. Let's start off by saying there have been no drugs specifically approved for shortening the refractory period in males. However, it's generally reported that men who have higher testosterone levels have shorter refractory periods. This is one of the reasons why older gentlemen tend to need longer recovery times than men at earlier stages of life. Like erectile dysfunction, a refractory period may be helped by the same little blue pill. Some men claim using drugs like Viagra has helped shorten the refractory period so they can have more sex more frequently. However, in studies conducted around erectile dysfunction medication and its effects on the refractory period, researchers concluded there is no evidence that the pill shortens the refractory period. So men who claim otherwise may just be experiencing a placebo effect. Overall, medical professionals agree that better health normally leads to better sexual stamina. This means that taking care of your body and exercising frequently may shorten your refractory period. The more healthy you are, the quicker your body can recover, the faster you can get back to having sex, or at least that's the theory. Some people claim that doing pelvic floor muscle training, such as kegels, may also reduce refractory period length. There's no scientific proof for this, but it has been suggested that the stronger those pelvic muscles are, the better your sexual function will be, so it couldn't hurt to try. However, there may be more fun ways to reduce the length of the refractory period. Switching up how often you have sex could help reduce recovery times. You could try having sex less frequently to see if that makes a difference, or you could have more sex and see how that affects your body. For a good time, the second option is probably the way to go. It's also been suggested that you and your partner could try different positions to mix things up. This can cause different feelings and sensations, which may entice the body to respond differently during and after sex. Really, the only way to reduce the refractory time at this point is through trial and error. You should stay healthy and physically active, but also experiment with timing and sex positions to see if you can reduce the time your body needs to recover between sex sessions. Now we just want to clarify some things. Women do have refractory periods, they just don't seem to be nearly as long as men's. But there are definitely some effects on the female body during the refractory period that males don't experience. For example, during the female refractory period, the clitoris can become too sensitive to continue having sex. Females sometimes need to wait for the body to reset before engaging in sex again. Also, there's the psychological side of the refractory period that occurs in both males and females. Physically, females recover from sex much more quickly than males. However, both males and females can experience a psychological refractory period where they just don't want to have sex again. This is most commonly felt through the sensations of being tired or satisfied. 
The female genitalia will often stay lubricated even after achieving orgasm. This allows them to continue having sex after they reach completion or even if they're no longer aroused. However, just because their body can have sex doesn't necessarily mean they want to. The refractory period is much longer in men than in women. This most likely has to do with something in body chemistry and physiology. However, both males and females do experience a refractory period, so next time you're ready to go and your partner needs a moment, be patient. They might need a little longer to recover, but you can take that as a compliment. Sex is everywhere. It's in the news, in the YouTube videos you watch, and practically every television show or movie you've ever seen. But what happens if you never have sex? Would you explode? Would you die? The answer might surprise you. Having sex definitely provides physical and mental health benefits for the participants, so it goes without saying that if you never have sex, you miss out on some of these advantages. Then again, if you've never had sex, you wouldn't actually know what you're missing in terms of pleasurable sensations. But even if you don't know what you're missing, your body does. It's important to remember that everyone is unique and everyone's body will react in different ways. But let's look at some common physical and mental side effects of never having sex. First, we'll look at the physical ramifications to the body if someone never has sex. There are a lot of misconceptions about what will happen to your body from lack of sex, which we'll debunk later. But the truth may be even scarier. Men who have regular sex and ejaculate more frequently have a lower risk of prostate cancer. This means if you never have sex as a male, you're actually at a higher risk of getting prostate cancer. The reason for this is because humans evolved, like all living things on this planet, to be reproduction machines. Whether you like sex or not, your body's main purpose is to reproduce produce, because that's how all living things evolved. The body needs to release old sperm in order to create newer, more viable sperm. Just like with other equipment, if the male genitalia is not frequently used, there can be problems or a breakdown in the system. It's not yet clear what the precise cause of prostate cancer is, but studies suggest that men who have frequent sex or ejaculations tend to have a lower risk. So if a male never has sex, he should be at least masturbating. This will be a common theme here, because some of the benefits of sex can also be obtained from self-release but not all. Either way, if you're a male who never has sex, you should consider doing regular prostate checks. For females that never have sex, there are different repercussions to the body. Sex strengthens the pelvic floor muscles that support the bladder. If a female never has sex, they may find themselves with a weak bladder. This could lead to leakage or incontinence. Sex is a physical activity, and the muscles involved need a workout every now and then. If you never have sex, these muscles aren't exercised, which leads to them becoming weaker. Turns out that if females are not strengthening the muscles used during sex, it can lead to negative effects on other body systems. That being said, females can also achieve the benefits of sex from self-pleasure as well. It turns out that in humans, just simulating the act of sex can trick the body into providing many of the benefits associated with the act. Another negative effect women who never have sex may encounter is that the vagina may be drier than someone who is engaged in sexual activity. This is not necessarily a problem other than it can be uncomfortable. So if a female has never had sex and feels discomfort in her genitalia, it may be because of a lack of lubrication around the muscles and organs. Again, this problem can be solved by masturbating. At some point in their life, someone who has never had sex may want to engage in the activity. If this is the case, the lack of sex in previous years may hinder the carnal act. If someone has gone their whole life without having sex, it could take longer than expected for arousal to begin. This could happen because the body would be feeling all new sensations, and since they would be different than anything felt before, it could take a while for the necessary fluids to flow. This seems counterintuitive, since you would expect someone's body who has never had sex to be raring to go. However, the longer someone goes without ever having sex, the longer it takes for the body to prepare for the activity. Your body needs to create and dump hormones into the bloodstream and then increase the blood flow to areas of the body that have never or very infrequently been used. This can take a while, especially for someone who has never had sex before. Whether someone is male or female, never having intercourse can be connected to higher blood pressure. There are several studies that show people who have regular sex tend to have lower blood pressure. Therefore, for the opposite can also be true. Someone who has never had sex may have higher blood pressure than if they did have coitus. The most likely reason for this is because there is a correlation between having sex and the lowering of stress hormones in the body. If a person never has sex, those same stress hormones will be higher. Someone who has more stress tends to have higher blood pressure. This is a serious health concern a celibate person should be aware of. They should absolutely find 
other ways to lower the stress levels and blood pressure. Like we've said before, this can be done through masturbation, but there are other options as well, such as meditation. Again, our bodies evolved to be sex machines, therefore they expect to have a release every now and then. High blood pressure would definitely be a negative side effect of never having sex, but there is something else that sex might help your body with that you weren't even aware of. Having sex, or more specifically having orgasms, has been linked to benefits to someone's immune system. Psychologists Carl Charnetsky and Francis Brennan Jr. conducted a study where they took saliva samples from people who frequently had sex and those who did not, and found some surprising results. In the patients who were having sex, their saliva contained higher concentrations of immunoglobin A, which is an antibody used to fight off the common cold. Therefore, there may be health benefits to the immune system of someone who is having sex. If this is true, then someone who has never had sex may find themselves getting sick more frequently than others. The reason for this boost in the immune system may have more to do with the close proximity to another human during sex than the act itself. So unfortunately, this boost to your immune system may not be something you can get from masturbation since it's only a party of one. So it would seem that never having sex may have negative physical effects on the body, but what about the mental effects? Are the people who never have sex at risk of having higher mental health issues? Since everyone is different, there is no absolute definitive answer, but someone who has never had sex may be at a higher risk of certain negative mental health issues. As we said before, the act of having sex releases certain hormones that lower stress levels in the body. This can be achieved through masturbation as well, but another important mental health benefit of sex is the feeling associated with physical intimacy, something that cannot be obtained through self-pleasure. Someone who has never had sex before may develop what psychologists call skin hunger or touch starvation. This is when lack of close physical contact results in negative mental health issues. The intimacy during sex cannot be replicated even if someone spends a lot of time around other people. The physical contact and sensations during sex are sometimes necessary. If someone has never had sex, it could cause their body to react negatively to the lack of intimacy. It would not be surprising for someone who has never had sex to feel isolated or insecure. This could be caused by an imbalance in hormones in the body due to a lack of sexual contact. The change in chemical composition of the body from sex is not just because it feels good or pleasurable, but because it's something intimate and shared between individuals. If someone who has never had sex is feeling depressed or lonely even if they're surrounded by others, it could be because their brain is craving intimacy. In these cases, we only have evolution to blame yet again. Our DNA is selfish and wants to be passed on to the next generation. Therefore, almost all of us are programmed to want to have sex. One way our body tricks us into copulating is by rewarding us not just with pleasurable physical sensations, but with mental stimulation as well. The brain of someone who has never had sex could be starved for intimacy of it. This in turn could cause negative side effects to mental health. So really, for someone who has never had sex, their brain begins to rebel against them. When your brain is fighting you, it's going to be a bad time. However, as mentioned before, everyone is different. Some people actually don't need to have sex at all and are still healthy and happy. This can be because of a low sex drive or that the person is asexual. The human brain is a magnificent thing and can even overcome our biological urges in some people. In others, the brain may be programmed to just not crave sex, and for these individuals, never having sex most likely comes with no side effects. There are misconceptions based around what happens to someone who has never had sex. So let's break them down. Someone may have told you that if a female doesn't have sex, their vagina closes up. Not only is this untrue, but think of how many other complications that would cause for that person other than not being able to have intercourse. A female who has never had sex will most likely have a smaller opening to the vagina than females who are more sexually active, but there's absolutely zero chance the vagina will completely close up. Even females who have never had sex still produce sex hormones, which means that although there may be discomfort or negative side effects from not having sex, they are still able to do so at any point during their life. What it comes down to is that everybody's body is different. Some people may choose to never have sex and can still lead a long and happy life. They may have to find other ways to mitigate some of the negative side effects such as lack of intimacy, but it can be done. We know masturbation can produce many of the positive benefits of having sex. There are some risks to never having sex, such as a greater chance of prostate cancer in men and incontinence in women, but we live in a time where there are medical options to combat these negative side effects. What will happen to your body if you never have sex? It just depends on who you are. But for most of us, we'll feel discomfort, mostly in the genitalia, and we'll probably feel lonely or more stressed even if we are around other people. Sex is literally in our DNA, so although it may not be necessary, it could be hard to avoid.
It doesn't need to sleep. It doesn't need to eat. No matter where you go, it will follow. But what exactly is it? Theories abound on the true identity of it, and the writer and creator David Mitchell has been very reserved about offering any solid answers. However, we can glean some facts about it from various theories and observations of the creature's behavior in the film. It has no known origin, rather than being explained as the result of a curse levied upon an unknown individual an unknown amount of time ago. Given the fact that it still exists, and that a curse has to have an origin point, we can safely assume that it was created within the last few hundred years at maximum. Why? Because we know that it moves very slowly in pursuit of its prey, never exceeding at maximum a brisk walking speed. We're even told when Jay is introduced to the creature that it can only walk, but it's not dumb. With the average walking speed being 3 to 4 miles per hour, it's not very fast, which means the only way its continued survival can be explained is if the curse originated within the last few hundred years. That's because only recently in human history was long distance travel relatively common, increasing in ease speed and accessibility to the general population as we approach more modern times. If its curse originated in ancient times, before global travel was readily available to the general population, then it would have simply decimated all cursed individuals and ceased to exist, since the entire population that it would have spread to would have been confined to a small geographic area. As it continues to exist, however, this cannot be the case. At some point, a cursed individual put a significant enough distance between himself and it that he or she had the time to spread the curse widely enough that it continues to exist. When you factor in the fact that attitudes towards sex only became liberalized to the point that casual sex was socially acceptable in the last few decades, we have likely an origin for it in the last hundred or so years. Hyper-conservative attitudes towards sex in the preceding centuries and the lack of long-distance travel being accessible to the layperson means that it would have already ceased to exist were the curse's origin older than our estimated timeline. It would have already destroyed all afflicted by the curse, both by virtue of not being able to spread the curse fast enough and not being able to outrun it. So. What is it exactly? Physically speaking, we know that it's strong enough to throw a teenager a few meters, but not strong enough to tear down doors. Perhaps, however, it chooses not to tear down doors in order to add to the fear of its victim, which could give us a clue to its identity, and we'll discuss that later. We can posit this because it's clearly strong enough to physically mangle its victims once it does reach them, shattering bones and breaking necks. It also has a conceivably unlimited amount of physical stamina, though this might not be necessarily true. We can see from the film that the characters all live in the same city and rarely drive outside its borders, yet the characters can spend entire days without being attacked. We know that the film is set in Detroit, which takes up approximately 142 square miles of area. Even if the character encountered it on the exact opposite side of Detroit, then drove to the opposite end of suburban Detroit, at an average walking speed of 3.5 miles per hour, it could cover that distance in less than two days. There's no reason to believe that the characters were driving 142 miles between encounters, so more realistically, if it was truly relentless, it would have encountered our characters at a frequency of every half day to full day or so. Even if the characters are not living in Detroit, in order to avoid daily encounters with it, they would have to be moving over 84 miles a day, something they clearly do not do. So it must have some sort of rest period that we don't see on camera. Perhaps its physical stamina is not unlimited, or perhaps if it is a spiritual or demonic entity, then it must take time to reconstitute itself physically in our world. We also know that it feels pain, and that pain can be used as a deterrent. The single clue the film gives to this fact is that when it's hit by a chair while grabbing Having Jay's hair when the group flees to the lake, the chair strike causes it to drop Jay. Despite it being impossible that the chair hit caused significant enough structural damage to its body that it would have lost the ability to hold on to Jay. This means it feels pain, and it feels it enough to be surprised or shocked into loosening its hold. Whether this was intentional on the writer's behalf or simply lazy writing because the characters needed a way to escape from it is unknown. But we can only assume that what we see on screen is canon and thus it feels pain. Yet, while it may feel pain, it's also extremely resistant to physical harm. In one scene, a gunshot wound to the head only temporarily staggers it, while in the final pool confrontation it takes two gunshots to stop its pursuit. It's unknown if it could perhaps be defeated or slowed down significantly by things such as dismemberment, or perhaps total physical annihilation via explosion, acid, or similar effect. Which brings us to the next question, can it be killed? Its mortality is a question of its origin. We talked before about its inability to tear down doors despite being strong enough to break human bones with ease, and how not tearing down doors may actually be a choice on its part, simply to increase the terror felt by its victim. Busting down a regular residential wooden door takes similar effort to breaking a bone, though the broken leg seen from its first victim in the film would require considerably more force. This means that it likely chooses not to tear down doors, and instead to prolong the chase, which puts it firmly in the category of a demon. A spirit acts mindlessly, with no particular desire or enjoyment in causing pain or increasing fear. Spirits simply use the means at their disposal to achieve their objectives, such as using superhuman strength 
strength to quickly break down a door and kill their victim. A demon, however, feeds on fear, growing in power by sowing terror, and what's more, demons are intelligent actors, not mindless slaves such as a spirit. A demon forced to carry out the directives of a curse will do so, but has the intelligence to manipulate the way in which it executes that curse so as to seek enjoyment and empower itself. While a demon is our best guess as to its real identity, it's clear that it has intelligence and a motivation to cause fear, and isn't simply a mindless actor carrying out the terms of the curse it's bound to fulfill. We see evidence of this repeatedly, such as when it chooses to simply stare at Jay on the roof of her house as she drives away, or when it turns to look at Jay shortly before killing Greg. If it was truly mindless, it would carry out its tasks like an automaton, pursuing Jay instead of staring at her driving away. If it is a demon, then it can certainly be defeated, temporarily, when it takes physical form. These defeats will force the demon to reassemble its physical form over time, perhaps explaining its disappearance from the final chase scene at the pool. If it, however, is a spirit, well then, it shouldn't have been able to be shot in the head. But what is the nature of the curse, and who started it? Information is incredibly limited. We can glean some truths by observing the effects of the curse. First, the curse is passed on via sexual intercourse. The type and nature of intercourse is unclear. Is full-blown intercourse required, or would anything short of actual sex be enough to trigger the curse? We have no way of knowing, as in the film the characters are either shown or insinuated to have had full-on sex. Once you've been cursed, though, you're able to see it, despite it being invisible to everyone around it who doesn't have the curse. Interestingly enough, it can still physically interact and be interacted with by individuals who can't see it. Multiple times, it's attacked by characters who don't have the curse, and it's readily affected by physical obstacles in pursuit of its victims. This gives us one very strong clue as to the nature of the curse. It only takes physical form when near its victims. How can we know this? Well, like we said seconds ago, it can be interacted with by individuals who are not cursed, and it can be blocked by physical obstacles. If it was still invisible, but still physical to the rest of the world, then it would be continuously creating physical interactions with its environment, making it incredibly unlikely that it wouldn't have been discovered and well documented by now. Think about it navigating a busy street. By now, hundreds of videos of individuals being randomly shoved out of the way would have saturated the internet, not to mention accidental interactions like being splashed with water, paint, or even being accidentally covered in fabric such as one character purposefully does in the film. If it was physical all the time, a moving spot where rain is being physically deflected would have been very well documented by now. The only explanation for its continued secrecy is the fact that it only takes physical form when near its victim. This is only strengthened by David Mitchell's own comments, stating that no matter where you go, like space, it will always follow. This begs the question of if it truly follows its victims at all and simply chooses when to appear to them. While we have no clue as to who began the curse, we know that sexual trauma is heavily implied throughout the film, as is shame and potentially incest. The main characters that we see killed by it all see the creature in the form of a parent at one point or another, with it appearing as Jay's father in the pool scene when she remarks that she doesn't want to tell her friends what it looks like when they ask. It also appears as Hugh's mother when we're first introduced to the creature and as Greg's mother when it kills him. Whoever created the curse may have been the victim of abuses at home, and the curse may even be a form of revenge inflicted upon their abuser. So what's the best picture we can paint of its identity? First, it's likely a demon, since it clearly takes the time to inflict fear on its victims rather than mindlessly stalk them and accomplish the task of killing them. If not a demon, it's still an intelligent entity of some sort, possibly bound to the curse against its will but probably enjoying the work anyway. Second, it only appears physically when near its victims. Because it can be interacted with by non-cursed people, its existence would have been well documented by now if it was always physically present in our world. Thanks to the writer's comments, we know that you cannot escape it even if you were to flee to space, meaning that it has the means to cross distances impossible to physically cross without a rocket. This implies strongly that it is not always physically present in the real world, and can traverse three-dimensional space at will. Third, the curse is spread via sexual intercourse, with it targeting the latest victim and then working its way down the chain. This means that the curse is relatively recent in human history, as only recently did people have the means to escape it by traveling long distances and having sex with multiple people. Otherwise, it would have killed all bearers of the curse by now and thus broken it. It can be harmed, feels pain, and temporarily stopped by physical means. However, the writer implies that it may not be able to ever be fully killed, but leaves it open to interpretation. Whoever created the curse was likely the victim of abuse and likely a form of parental figure. These are our best guesses to its identity, but the writer of the film himself makes it clear that what it is has always been up to interpretation. For him, it might represent our own mortality and how experiences like sex can briefly distract us from our own inevitable end. Sex is fun. We know this because it's something most of us look forward to doing. There are proven health benefits from having sex, but can too much sex cause you to die? How much is too much? The answer to these questions might just save your life. 
Too much of a good thing can be bad for you. This includes sex. There are some things to keep in mind when being intimate with your partner. Obviously, you should always communicate clearly, and sex should be something both parties enjoy. If you don't know if your partner is enjoying sex as much as you are, then ask. If you don't know what your partner likes or dislikes, ask. If you don't know exactly what you are doing during sex, ask. It's okay to not know something about your sexual partner, but communicating has been shown to increase the pleasure for both participants. That being said, if you and your partner enjoy having sex all of the time, what are the downsides? And how much sex can you have before it becomes life-threatening? First, let's start with the negative side effects. Sex has many benefits, but can be painful sometimes. This is especially true when two people have a lot of sex in a short amount of time. Sex takes a lot of energy, and most of the time causes an increase in heart rate, muscle activity, and sweating. Therefore, you can kind of think of sex as a really fun workout. Just like when you're working out at a gym, you need to stay hydrated and not overextend yourself. Otherwise, you could pull a muscle. In extreme circumstances, you might get a really bad cramp or a charley horse, which can be incredibly uncomfortable even during the pleasures of sex. When you sweat a lot, your body loses water and nutrients. Every time you have sex, you probably break a sweat, which means you should be hydrating before and after. When you sweat, the fluids lost need to be replaced. If they're not, your body could become dehydrated. It would be incredibly difficult to dehydrate yourself to death solely from having sex. However, if you tried really hard, you could probably do it. Besides overall dehydration, there could be dryness of specific areas of the body that are frequently used when having sex. In particular, this thing can happen to the vagina. Both men and women can and should get pleasure from sex. However, the female genitalia can get dry from prolonged and frequent friction during intercourse. When this happens, micro tears can occur in the vagina, resulting in discomfort and, if not properly treated, serious pain. Other painful side effects can occur if the female can't replace the fluids that serve as natural lubricants due to dehydration. This is not uncommon after long bouts of sex for females to have chafing, irritation, or rashes to develop on and around the vagina. If you're engaging in a lot of sexual activity, it may be good to use a lubricant to ensure that the pleasure continues for everyone. On the male side of things, ejaculation can begin to take its toll on the male body if it happens over and over again. Having a lot of sex over the course of a weekend could cause sore testes. Overexertion of any body part, including genitalia, can cause discomfort. However, these things will not kill you. If you're going to be having lots of sex in a short amount of time, just make sure to take rest breaks, stay hydrated, and use a lubricant. A lot of lubricant. Another negative side effect of having too much sex could be a UTI. UTI stands for urinary tract infection. At a very basic level, a UTI is when bacteria that's not supposed to be in the urinary tract gets into it and starts multiplying. This can happen in the urethra, bladder, or in more serious cases, the kidneys. UTIs normally are just extremely uncomfortable, but in severe cases, they can be dangerous. That's why if you have a UTI, you should go to the doctor and get antibiotics to kill the infection. UTIs can occur as a result of sex if you get too dehydrated, so this is another reason to drink lots of fluids if you plan on having a lot of sex. However, there is something else to keep in mind to reduce the risks of getting a UTI or other infections. As fluids from the male or the female enter the vagina, it can cause the natural pH levels to become unbalanced. This can also lead to infections or discomfort. Imbalance of pH levels can also occur in the male urethra when there are multiple ejaculations over a short period of time. In order to reduce these risks, both males and females should go to the bathroom following sex. This flushes the urinary system and helps remove fluids that have entered these areas during intercourse. It's important to note that it does not matter your sexual preference, whether you're straight, gay, polyamorous, or anything else. If you're having lots and lots of sex, you're susceptible to all of the discomforts that can become associated with such a lifestyle. Again, a UTI and unbalanced pH most likely won't kill you. However, it's not completely impossible that you could die from a really bad infection or extreme dehydration, but this probably isn't your biggest concern in terms of what could kill you from having too much sex. You and your partner will definitely want to take care of your bodies to reduce discomfort and have a pleasurable experience, but you probably don't have to worry about dying from sex quite yet. Research around deaths during sex has led to some interesting findings. One surprising statistic has come up again and again in different research studies. A very high percentage of men who die during sex are engaging in adulterous behavior. In other words, men who are engaging in extramarital sexual activity naturally have a higher death rate during sex than men who are faithful in having sex with only their spouse. Now, This is not because the male's partner walks in on him having sex with someone else and murders him. Instead, it has to do with other physical conditions that we'll discuss later. But the fact remains, men who died during sex were more often than not cheating on their significant other. In some studies, the number of cheaters in sex-related deaths could be as high as 82-93% to 93 of the total cases. 
and these numbers are consistent around the world, suggesting that being an adulterer anywhere comes with an increased risk of dying during sex. In a study in Japan that looked at 34 deaths during sex, 80% of them were men who died while having sex outside of their marriage. In Korea, a research study in 2006 found that 93% of cases involved adultery. Another study in 2006 at Goethe University Frankfurt in Germany recorded that out of 68 men who died during sex, 10 of them died with their mistress and 39 died while having sex with a prostitute. This means that almost 75% of the total number of sex-related deaths in the study were adulterers. So why is having a lot of sex outside of your relationship more dangerous than with your partner? It seems very unlikely that the high percentages of sex-related deaths by adulterers across different parts of the world are just random coincidences. In these adulterous relationships, the lover might be much younger than the adulterer. This may not be surprising, as men who engage in sexual activity outside of marriage or a relationship tend to be older and their sexual preferences probably aren't aligned to their age group. As mentioned before, sex can be taxing on the body. A lot of calories are burnt and a lot of fluids are lost, and it can be comparable to working out. So if one of the participants is severely out of shape or is older, this can increase the odds of death during sex. In terms of adulterers, something else might play a role in the high sex-related death rates. It may not be the physical toll the act of sex is taking on the body, but the mental toll. A study from the University of Florence in 2011 found something very interesting in the 1,700 people that participated in their study. People who were having sex outside of their marriage or relationship had almost twice the amount of cardiovascular disease as those who were monogamous and faithful. The conclusion of the study was that deceiving your partner sexually could lead to a sense of guilt. This psychological burden could increase stress levels and may be connected to a higher risk of cardiovascular complications. Up to this point, it would seem that the safest way to have lots of sex is to make sure to take care of your body, stay hydrated, and don't cheat on your partner. So what actually causes death of people during sex, and how much sex puts you at risk of dying? The most common reason that someone dies during sex is because of a heart attack. This is not surprising because of the sudden and increased physical activity that occurs during sex. If you go from a state of relaxation to having sex, your body needs to exert a lot of energy. In order for you to maintain a high amount of energy, your heart needs to pump blood quickly around the body. If your heart can't handle the strenuous activity, it could lead to a heart attack. Can too much sex kill you? Yes, it can but only under very specific conditions. Studies found that people are 2.7 times more likely to have a heart attack during or immediately following sex than when they are not engaged in strenuous activity. How do you protect yourself from a heart attack-induced death during sex? You need to take care of your body and exercise regularly. Death during sex usually occurs in people who are overweight, older, or do not exercise. This is because having sex is taxing when done right, and it takes a lot of energy. Just like with other forms of exercising, you're more likely to get injured if you try to do too much too fast. If you're planning on having a lot of sex and you've not exercised in a very long time, you should begin exercising immediately. Sex is not always planned, so if you're having surprise sex and do not live the healthiest lifestyle, make sure to start slow, drink lots of fluids, and don't overexert on the first go. If you do find yourself planning to have lots of sex, there are risks involved if you're not in relatively good health. Experts recommend that people who do not live the healthiest lifestyle and want to improve should begin an exercise program slowly and gradually and increase intensity over time. The same advice goes for people who do not have a lot of sex and want to start having more. Start slow and work your way up to avoid cardiac arrest during sex. Can too much sex kill you? Yes, it can, but most likely it won't unless you're reaching an older age or already have serious health issues. If you're in these categories, you should always exercise more to decrease your chances of a heart attack during sex. Experts also warn that it is possible to have too much sex. Normally, when two people do this, it is to avoid conflict or having to do things that they do not like to do, like cleaning the house or getting work done. If sex is getting in the way of your other responsibilities in life, maybe dial it back a notch. If you're having lots of sex and have no problems with getting everything done, good for you. Just remember that death via heart attack from too much sex can occur. So keep up the healthy lifestyle, always stay hydrated, and don't be afraid to take a break once in a while. Picture a guy from the US who's decided it's time to spread his wings and get out of the town he's pretty much never left. He heads to some distant land he knows absolutely nothing about, and from the moment he gets there, he's somehow incredibly popular. No sooner than he's learned how to order a bottle of beer in the local language, he's hooked up with someone. 
But as some of you well-traveled viewers might know, what happens in the bedroom in the United States might not happen everywhere. This guy soon finds himself completely out of his depth and wondering what he's gotten himself into. Make sure you don't make the same mistake by watching this to find out some of the most confounding sexual practices you've ever heard of in your life. Let's start in Indonesia, where there's a pilgrimage people take to a place called Mount Kamukas, aka Sex Mountain. Every year, folks from all across Indonesia head to this part of central Java for, you guessed it, sex. But it's more than just that, it's sex with a complete stranger. As the story goes, a long time ago a prince eloped from his town with a woman and tried to have a fun time there. They didn't quite finish the job and were chased away by soldiers and later killed. A kind of ritual has since emerged, which involves going there and meeting a stranger. Only this time they do what the prince and his lover couldn't and finish the job. And that's not all, they must continue to meet up and do so seven more times throughout the year. If they end up fulfilling the quota, they'll then be blessed with good fortune, which we're sure is the only reason that men and women flock there, married or not, to hook up with a stranger. If you're thinking, no way that's a real thing, think again. In 2014, the governor of the province of central Java laid down restrictions on what happens there. He banned the practice, saying it was not moral and there was a risk of contracting various diseases. He also said it made Indonesia look bad in the eyes of other countries. We'll let you decide if he was right about that last part. Still, Indonesian News reports in 2017 said the stalls and huts erected for the deed had reopened and people were getting it on for good luck once again. You see, the business had been booming there before it was all closed down. Many, many people enjoyed the freedom of the ritual and in turn, that provided lots of business for locals at Sex Mountain. When the ritual was banned, they lost their means of making money. The entry fee alone was around 50 cents, which doesn't sound like much, but on good nights there were about 8,000 pilgrims. In the past, when all huts and stalls weren't around, the people just did it behind trees, so you could call the enterprising locals a good thing for everyone. They even opened karaoke stalls to perhaps get people in the mood. You might wonder if the fortune actually does shine down on the pilgrims after their year of hooking up is over. Well, one woman who'd partake in told Australian News, Praise be to God, after coming here even though I have a few debts, my business is making a bit of a profit. Next up is a nomadic tribe in West Africa called the Wadabi. They don't have a written language themselves, but this word has been translated as people of the taboo. What's taboo in many parts of the world is having more than one marriage partner, which is known as polygamy. This tribe doesn't mind at all though, in fact, they embrace it. Every year, there's something called the Gariwul Festival, and during the big party that happens, the guys get dressed up to the nines to show their beauty. In fact, this tribe might just think it has the most beautiful men in the world. These people are also what you might call especially liberated, having no qualms about the very natural things that often makes Westerners blush. The men, with painted faces and feathers on their head, dance and look wonderful for the onlooking women in the tribe. It's said they take a kind of drink that helps them to dance for hours on end and also provides a hypnotic effect. It's like a very colorful beauty contest because then all the women will choose the most attractive men. If the women are partnered with someone already, no problem, they can put themselves forward as someone who wants to steal another man as a new husband. If they don't want to go all out and steal a guy, they can just elect to sleep with him. If the guy walks past her, she just needs to brush him on the shoulder and they will be together. It totally doesn't matter about the previous partner. The guys don't get much say in the matter though. There are some rules, however. Usually when a woman is old enough, an arranged marriage will take place. Once she becomes pregnant, she goes to live with her mom and can't see the husband. After some time, she can go back to him, but she might just decide during the festival to sleep with another guy or steal one. One tribesman told National Geographic, we get to go to the Jirwa for pleasure. I get a woman, then fine, it's a bonus. When a guy is incredibly hot, he's called Keijo Naado, hurting man, because he's so gorgeous it hurts to look at him. And just to set things straight, you have the word polygamy, which means marriage between more than two people. Then you have polygyny, which is when a man has more than one wife. And then there's polyandry, when a woman has more than one husband. It's not all that common, but it happens in various parts of the world. It's somewhat different from having a mistress, though. In Thailand, a man may often take what the Thais call Mia Noi, which literally means small wife, often called a second wife by Westerners. It's not actually legal in Thai law, but you have a documented marriage and you also have an undocumented marriage, in which a wedding ceremony still happens, but nothing is officially signed. In the past, when women have had fewer opportunities, this was widespread, but not so much now. In 2021, a video went viral in Thailand that features a man secretly marrying another wife. The guy in question, a cop, got the shock of his life when his real wife's mother-in-law walked into the ceremony and gave him a hard smack across the head. The attending monks were less than impressed, but despite the chaos, the ceremony went ahead. His real wife, who later showed news cameras their marriage certificate, was understandably angry, seeing as they'd been together 15 years and had two kids. 
Believe it or not, in the past, Thai women's magazines would say tolerating such a thing was the mark of a good wife. Maybe a small wife might be too much, but many Thai women have turned a blind eye to a man for having what you might call a bit on the side. That's what Thais call a gick. To understand this, you have to understand what some Thais now think of as outdated traditional values. These old values held that there was something called Kula Satri, which meant an ideal woman. She was demure, quiet, and certainly wasn't outwardly sexual. She wasn't even meant to have sexual thoughts. Meanwhile, male masculinity was defined by something called Chai Chatri. Under this, men were supposed to have irrepressible, uncontrollable sexual desires that could never be limited to their one spouse. It doesn't seem fair to most of us and wouldn't be seen as fair by most modern Thais either, but it still happens. Quite a lot. This is evident in a Durex poll that had Thais top of the infidelity ratings and before you ask. This has nothing to do with Thailand's notorious red light districts, which only actually make up a few streets in the entire country. It's actually these old cultural values that pervade most of the nation and lead to a culture of infidelity. Not to say women will tolerate cheating these days, or at least the majority of women won't. That's perhaps reflected in the fact that Thailand is arguably the leader in penis reattachment surgery. This has led to the international media asking why Thailand has an epidemic of penile amputations. There's even an old saying men sometimes say to other men, about which goes, I better get home or the ducks will have something to eat. The men are often hypocrites too, given that many men have a zero tolerance when their ideal woman cheats. It can often and does regularly lead to him killing her. You might wonder why the second wives marry the guy. It's often down to financial security or just the security of keeping him. The first wife might not want to break up with the guy, either because women divorcing men is frowned upon in traditional settings, or because she has limited opportunities in life to take care of the family he'll leave behind. The woman whose mother whacked the cheating husband was well aware he had a gick, but she turned a blind eye to it. She told reporters, I initially did not think that my husband would wed. Before the wedding, he was still staying at home with me and he told me he would be going out to work a night shift at his station. In some cultures, having more than one spouse is not just accepted, it's normal. Academic studies, for instance, have shown that in parts of India, China, and Nepal, a woman might have more than one husband. One such paper published in 2019 was titled Marital Satisfaction and Well-Being Among Fraternal Polyandrous and Monogamous Tribal People of Kinar. Fraternal polyandry is when one woman is married to two or more brothers, and Kinar is a district in northern India. The paper concluded this after spending time with some of these families. The result, based on qualitative research, revealed that polyandrous couples' physical health, economical and psychological well-being is better and they feel positive toward life. But why is that? The paper said those families felt secure together and they had financial security. It said a woman in those tribes with only one husband felt less financially secure than a woman who had married two or more brothers. The brothers also said they felt more secure. The Tota tribe of South India have also practiced these kind of marriages, but that may have now stopped. Still, it was explained that when a child is born to one of the brothers, he would hand the wife a bow and arrow and become the father of the child. If another child was born to another brother, he would do the same. In certain regions of India, Nepal, and Tibet, various practices of polygamy happened throughout history, although it's not common now. In a northern part of India called Jansar Bawar, in some places a woman would marry the eldest son and then she immediately became the wife of all his younger brothers. It got tricky though, since the brothers could have more than one wife if their older brother was much older and the age difference was vast between his brothers and the wife. In that case, a brother could find his own new wife. If all the brothers stayed together with the one wife, none of them had any kind of exclusive right to her. All brothers were seen as equal and the kids looked on them as one father. In some countries in the recent past, such as parts of Tibet, the eldest brother would be seen as the main husband. A study published in 2008 said among the villages of Shigaz and Kamdo in Tibet, it was found that 20-50% to 50 of families were made up of a wife and two husbands. In some more remote areas, the researchers said 90% of the families were polyandric. To understand why, just imagine how difficult life is in some of those unforgiving mountainous areas. Weird to us maybe, but arguably an act of survival for others. Laws in Tibet have long since made it illegal, but the marriage will sometimes be documented between the wife and just the eldest brother. In most countries, a man's member is kept locked firmly behind closed doors, where it's barely noticeable unless he's wearing his favorite pair of tight speedos. In some of the more remote parts of New Guinea, though, that's not always the case. There, the penis can have its own clothing accessory. This is called a koteka, which looks something like a gourd and covers the penis while being strapped to the waist. It can be long and thin or short and wide and can point in any direction that the wearer chooses. Obviously, when a man is working, a smaller koteka would be preferable. But if they're worn as a way of attracting a female, though, it's still up for debate. 
it might be only worn as a way of covering up as well as a way of looking good. Still, you have to wonder if some women favor a bigger koteka. The Sambia people of Papua New Guinea are heavily focused on what you might refer to as the warrior culture. When the boys are very young, usually around the age of seven, they're taken away from their mothers. In some ways, this is to toughen them up, and there are some comparisons to the training known as paides in the ancient Sparta. But with the Sambia, it's because the boys need to be detached from what's believed to be the contaminated blood of the mother. It's said that in each woman there's something called Tingu, which has the power to manipulate men. When the boy gets a little older, he might be around younger women, who also have Tingu in their blood. Since her Tingu gets stronger during her menstrual period, during that time a woman is kept away from males completely. Ok, so if women have this sorcery that they can use to manipulate men, how do couples ever get together? Well, when the boys are old enough, they are taught how to safely have sex without being trapped by a woman's Tingu. One way is to kind of disassociate himself from her and not get too heated in the act of sex. He should also try to prevent her from enjoying herself too much, lest she make him become sick and he possibly die. Once copulation is over, he goes through a bloodletting ceremony which is supposed to decontaminate him of her Tingu. This happens until she gets pregnant, and then after she has the child, he can become a fully fledged warrior. In the 1990s, people who visited these very remote tribes said times were apparently changing though. Supposedly something called love marriage was occurring from time to time, and in those marriages they didn't include all the fear and ceremony we've just described. In a 2006 book, the writer called this shift nothing less than revolutionary. While many of us take kissing for granted, this romantic, full-on, juices shared lips bitten kind of affair is utterly disgusting to people in some cultures. Researchers at the University of Nevada explained that when the Mehnaku of Brazil were asked about kissing, the general reply was that it was gross, with one asking why would you want to share your dinner with someone? Fair point, and let's be honest, no one wants to see anyone devouring each other's tonsils on the subway. In another paper, researchers found in some other cultures that there was no kissing at all. The Aka Pygmies didn't do it, and when questioned about sex, they said it was basically to make a child and nothing more. One person referred to sex as a night's work. According to the website This Is Africa, the Tonga tribe in Mozambique think much the same way, saying kissing is unhygienic and when they see Westerners do it they just think about someone eating dirt. And the last but certainly not least strange romantic custom comes from Iran. There they have something known as Saihohu, which means a man and a woman can have a temporary marriage, explore each other's bodies, and if after some amount of time they decide they're not right for one another, they can annul the marriage with ease. You might ask why someone would do this, and doesn't it sound a lot like short marriages in the US? Well for one thing, this marriage might only last for an hour, or perhaps a day, or maybe even a few days, which even in the US would be very unusual. You see, in Iran, just getting it on with someone you aren't married to is considered sinful and also illegal. That's one reason why men meet women online and then they head to the city, get a temporary marriage, book a hotel room, do what they have to do, then get divorced. As human rights advocates have pointed out, since not being a virgin before marriage is also considered sinful, this can have negative effects on women in the long run. It's also been called a way of having legal prostitution. The Iranian cyber police have said some websites will even help with a match and then do all the paperwork for the marriage. They can even book someone a hotel. It's like Tinder, Airbnb, and a priest all in the same app. Sayahu is supposed to provide a way for a woman to keep her chastity since she is technically married when she has sex, but she still becomes stigmatized after. This is what one young Iranian man had to say about the practice. If I temporarily marry a young woman for three years and then divorce her, would anyone be willing to marry her? It would be impossible that any man would want to have a family with this woman. Still, some Iranian women have happily made use of the law. One woman told the New York Times about her relationship. We went out a lot together and I didn't want to get into trouble. We wanted to have documents so that if we were stopped on the street we could prove that we weren't doing anything illegal. She and her husband renewed their marriage after six months and then they did it again. We don't know how things ended though. A British Canadian woman in 2015 talked to The Guardian about her dating experience in Iran. She said she was hounded by police and others while out in public with a man, asking how they knew each other and what they were up to. She said in public I had to face the opposite direction and pretend to read. She got a temporary marriage and said it actually allowed her and her lover to live a normal life. It was like a bubble. We were in love and no one bothered us. It was beautiful, she said. A month later and she was on the plane out of there. But there's a happy ending. It took some time but he eventually moved to the UK and they were remarried in London, this time for longer than a day. For some it's all they can think about. Sex. But one question many people have is why? Why is sex such an important desire for many people? Why do we actually have sex? 
Sure, there is an obvious answer. It's necessary for procreation. Everyone knows that when a mommy and a daddy love each other very much, well, you know the rest. But for all sexually dimorphic creatures in the animal kingdom, having sex is the primary way to expand the population. Sure, there are some exceptions. Some sea creatures reproduce in non-contact ways, with the male fertilizing eggs after a female lays them. And human reproductive science has found ways around medical difficulties in conceiving, using technologies like in vitro fertilization to make babies possible for people without doing it the old-fashioned way. But for the most part, if people want to make a baby, or in the case of rabbits, lots of babies, they'd better get busy. For humans, having a baby is a pretty involved thing. Nine months of gestation and only one offspring at a time in the vast majority of cases. This is similar for many larger mammals, but for smaller mammals and other types of animals, it's common to have a lot more babies and much quicker. So it's not a surprise that humans take picking a partner for having a baby more seriously. It's a pretty big investment. But there are plenty of other reasons that motivate people to have sex. For one thing, we might be physically wired to have the desire for sex. Our brain patterns are formed from countless generations of evolution, and we're born with certain instincts that lead us to natural behaviors. One of those behaviors is sex, and that influences a lot of other decisions we make. It's not hard to see why our brains are hardwired for this purpose. Keeping the species going is the ultimate natural instinct, and while there is no shortage of population now, it was a much bigger priority in ages past, when life expectancy was shorter and nature was filled with many more threats. And more offspring means more genetic variety in the population. But humans are complicated creatures, and there are many different things that motivate us. For one thing, sex feels really good. This is called body-centered sex, and it's the most basic reason that drives sexual attraction, and sometimes sexual addiction. Even without being concerned for the emotions of a partner, the feeling of sexual stimulation can be a powerful driving force. This triggers an effect called an orgasm that can be a powerful rush of pleasure and feel-good chemicals. This is why many people enjoy self-stimulation. It's an easy way to get this pleasure high without having to deal with the complex emotions of sexual relations. For many people, though, those complex emotions are still the main selling point. Sex is one of the most powerful connections someone can have with their partner, and having sex is an expression of trust and unity. Whether it's after a long relationship or after a whirlwind courtship, deciding to have sex with someone is often seen as a major step and a decision to commit to them. Before, during, and after the act, there's a feeling of becoming one and making a decision that'll set the tone for the rest of your time together. Some choose to wait until after marriage or engagement to make this step, but others find their own meaningful moment to take the jump, and that feeling can continue well after the first time. For those in a permanent or recurring relationship, having sex with someone they trust can be a stress reliever. If they've had a hard day at work and are worried about something, they might crave affection and close contact with their partner. Initiating sex might be a way to push the unpleasantness of the day away and instead focus on something familiar and calming. While the actual act of sex is enjoyable as always, these situations are often almost as much about the closeness with a partner. Of course, sometimes the heat cools, but the love doesn't. Sometimes, especially in long-term relationships, sex can be a matter of duty and familiarity. It's common for older couples, parents, and very busy two-career couples set aside regular time to have sex, often one day a week, but sometimes more infrequently. This is something to look forward to, but it's also a different kind of commitment. It's a way to reconnect and remind each other of how they feel about each other, even if it's not as often as it used to be. But what about those who haven't experienced it before? One of the most powerful motivators for having sex is, for some people, not having had it before. We've all seen the teen comedies where the kids scheme to lose their virginity, or in one case where a certain 40-year-old virgin does. This is often driven by the curiosity and other social factors. All they know is that sex is the greatest thing around and everyone's doing it but them. It's more about getting a prize and answering those questions than anything else. Oftentimes, that first time doesn't live up to the hype and can be confusing and awkward. But what would you expect? When's the last time you did something perfectly on the first try? But there are some less savory reasons that people might have sex. Tied into curiosity, one reason many people want to have sex for the first time is for social status. After all, if all the cool kids are talking about having sex, the nerds are going to want to prove they can do it too. Some might try to lie and join in, but what might be more embarrassing than getting caught in a lie about this? So instead, those looking to join the cool kids just seek out every opportunity to have their first time, whether it's going to be a time to remember or a time they wish they could forget. Some reasons for having sex can be downright cruel. Jealousy has been a thing since the early days, and people have gone to extreme lengths over it ever since the first caveman clubbed his neighbor over the head to take his cave. But some people use sex to try to create jealousy. Say a man has a crush on a woman, but she's not interested. 
Maybe he finds another woman to have a relationship with and tries to flaunt it around his real obsession to make her jealous. The sex might be enjoyable, but he's never really plugged into it or enjoying being with the woman he's with. It's all about ulterior motives. And some people use sex for cruel intentions. Having sex with someone is considered a sacred bond of trust by many people, and that makes it all the more shocking when someone uses it for revenge. We've all seen this happen on soap operas, usually ending with a dramatic slap to the face. Maybe someone has a fight with a teammate on the football team, so they decide to make him angry by putting the moves on his sister. Or maybe after a nasty breakup, a girl decides to make her ex-boyfriend sorry by sleeping with his best friend. Whatever the motivation, the odds are pretty strong that the sex won't lead to a healthy relationship in these cases. Of course, sometimes a healthy relationship isn't the goal. For some people, sex is just a stepping stone to another kind of success. It's a door into a relationship with someone who has something they want. This is common when someone from a lower socioeconomic class wants to climb the ladder. If they wind up marrying the boss's daughter, they might be in for a plum position at the company. Sometimes this can be combined with a genuine attraction and turn into a healthy relationship, but more likely it'll wind up in a televised divorce proceeding on reality TV. Of course, for some people, the sex is truly all that matters. Sex addiction is when the sex drive or libido goes haywire and consumes a person's life. This is when the how, who, and why of sex doesn't really matter. Only the act does. People who struggle with sex addiction may just tire of their partner, but it often gets out of control and they wind up patronizing prostitutes or getting into casual sexual encounters that potentially expose them to sexually transmitted diseases. When sex addiction gets bad enough, it can ruin relationships and jobs. The good news is, no matter why you're having sex, your body has reasons to celebrate. Did you know that having sex is actually exercise? Maybe this shouldn't be a surprise given how good it feels to lie down in bed and relax after a vigorous outing with your partner. It feels great, but you're exhausted, and there's a reason for that. Studies show that having sex raises your heart rate around the same level as a quick walk or riding your bike at a regular pace. This means that regular sex could play a role in keeping your body healthy, without the cost of a gym membership. And there are other possible health benefits for why your body craves sex. Having an orgasm creates a surge of hormones in your brain, particularly endorphins and oxytocin. These reduce pain and make it easier to relax, and that means it's a lot easier to fall asleep, especially if you're struggling with chronic pain or have a nagging headache. While this works in both men and women, studies show the effect is more dramatic in men. This means that having sex could be the key to a good night's sleep. But women have their own unique advantage. Studies show that women who have sex several times a week are less likely to develop heart disease compared to women who only have sex once a month or less. Why this is the case isn't clear. Some speculate that healthy women might just be more likely to have sex, but having sex is also heart-healthy exercise. So even if it's correlation rather than a cause, the heart knows what it wants might have more than one meaning. And having sex regularly might even impact the brain. Studies done on people over 50 who had regular sex showed that they have an improved ability to remember number patterns and better math skills. While this effect was more significant in men, it was true in both genders, and indicated that sex might help to keep the brain fresh. Is sex helping to generate new brain cells? It's known that it's as much a mental activity as it is a physical one, and this seems to indicate that there could be long-term benefits for memory and mental skills. There's even evidence that sex might help keep you alive longer. One study on married women showed a minor link between having sex more often and living longer. While there's no way to prove this is a cause, there are many possible explanations. One might be that having regular sex is an indication that the marriage is healthy, active, and passionate which could reduce stress and improve mental health. Another possibility could be that more healthy people are simply more likely to have sex. But the odds are this study made a lot of people go, hey, couldn't hurt. One thing's for sure, our bodies seem wired to want sex in more ways than one. It's been shown in studies that adults in committed relationships report less incidences of depression or mental health issues if they're having regular sex. This connection with their partner and the regular release of endorphins seems to have a positive effect on mental health. But this only works when a person has someone they trust to share that bond with. The stress of searching out unfamiliar partners might undo that benefit and actually add more stress. One thing seems clear. The reasons people have sex are a complex mix of physical, mental, and emotional issues combined with a hardwired instinct to seek opportunities to continue the species. I bet those rabbits in the meadows have less on their mind. Addiction. It's when something that started as normal use becomes a compulsion that slowly consumes your life, with the desire to get more occupying your every waking thought. Most addictions are to a substance, with the most common being nicotine, alcohol, and various drugs. The common treatment is to go cold turkey with a support system that keeps you from relapsing. But what happens when your addiction is to a basic biological imperative? 
That's sex addiction, and it's surprisingly common. A compulsion to have sex is nothing new. Everyone's familiar with the sex drive, also known as the libido. A combination of biological, psychological, and social factors, the sex drive is driven by a combination of neurotransmitters and hormones including dopamine and either testosterone or estrogen. Production of these hormones varies in different people, and some people may have a much higher sex drive than others. So, what sets sex addiction apart from a high sex drive? Well, that depends on who you ask. Scientists differ on whether seeking sex compulsively actually qualifies as an addiction, and it's not a clinical diagnosis in the DSM yet. However, other mental health experts have observed a surprising number of people who have trouble controlling intense and frequent sexual desires that lead to self-destructive behavior. The team behind the International Classification of Diseases did create their own category for it, officially titled Compulsive Sexual Behavior. So, how many people are battling sex addiction? Well, that depends on how you define it. If you consider everyone who's dealing with sex-related issues, that number could be as high as 16% of people. But if you look at more severe symptoms and try to pinpoint a definition of sex addiction, it's closer to between 3 and 6%. That's still a lot of people who haven't had a name for their condition until recently. And one thing stands out in many studies of sex addiction, men are almost twice as likely to develop this addiction as women. So, what causes sex addiction? Is it a purely psychological condition, or is there something deeper at work? Scientists have looked at many possible causes. Psychologists have observed that those who display symptoms of sex addiction often begin their sex lives at an early age, and many have experienced serious trauma as a kid. That leads to many to believe that it's an unhealthy coping mechanism for people who never had the opportunity to develop their sex drive at an older age, and getting to the root of the trauma and addressing it may be the best treatment approach. Others argue it may be a symptom of borderline personality disorder, which many people with a tendency toward promiscuity are diagnosed with. Others argue that it might be an imbalance in natural hormones and neurotransmitters causing the addiction. Those taking medications that affect their dopamine production have been observed to develop a syndrome that can result in compulsive sexual activity or gambling. So, how to research this condition beyond talking to people who experience it? Time to call on the researcher's most reliable tool, rats. Compulsive sexual behavior isn't exclusive to humans, as anyone who's seen a bunch of wild rabbits would know. Scientists studying rats that display compulsive sexual behavior have observed that this behavior is driven by the same mechanisms in the brain that affect drug addiction. This is the clearest proof yet that sex addiction is a genuine addiction, but it's complicated by the fact that sexual addiction is not an outside stimulant. It's a natural instinct that acts as a positive reinforcer. Naturally perceived by the brain as a reward, it triggers the instinct to seek it and the brain responds accordingly. Finding the line between the natural desire for sexual activity and the emergence of an addiction is one of the biggest challenges facing researchers. And that's one of the challenges facing sex addiction sufferers too. Where does the line change between a desire and an addiction? As more sex addiction sufferers come forward, a portrait is emerging of people whose desire for sex takes over every single part of their life. Most sex addicts don't have any physical symptoms, so there's no withdrawal period due to the lack of chemical addiction. The symptoms are mostly emotional, and many report that their fixation on sex makes it impossible to concentrate on anything else. They're thinking about sex when they go to work or school, when they're driving, even when they're trying to fall asleep at night. When not having sex, they report feeling empty. That leads them to seek out or stay in relationships that may be far from healthy. Being in a relationship for a sex addict is tricky in its own right. The best bet for a sex addict to have a healthy relationship would probably be to find someone else with a very high sex drive so they can keep each other satisfied, but that's treating the symptoms, not the addiction. It's very easy for that relationship to go off the rails as soon as they're separated, because sex addiction is an insatiable beast. When an addict's first choice for sex isn't around, they might quickly slip into bad habits. That can include having an affair or seeking out a sex worker, either of which could not only destroy their relationship, but leave them and their partner vulnerable to sexually transmitted disease. Making it trickier, sex addiction is a disorder, but it may be one of many. People have come forward with addictions to many different types of sex, some driven by the digital world we live in. Some people have become addicted to masturbation, becoming obsessed with pleasuring themselves even in inappropriate situations. A prominent journalist was recently caught masturbating on a Zoom chat. He claimed he thought it was off, but that didn't save his job. Others report an addiction to pornography, which is easier to get than ever thanks to the internet, although it does carry the risk of a very different kind of virus. Others have a compulsion to expose themselves in 
public or spy on others, which can lead to serious legal trouble. These are all related to sex addiction, and people can have one or more, which can often mingle with other addictions. Treatment and support are available now, but it wasn't always that way. As sex addiction becomes more recognized as a disorder, many sex addicts are coming forward with their stories of just how far they would go to satisfy their urges. Many are just starting to dig out from all the relationship, professional, and legal trouble their addiction caused them and are sharing their stories in anonymous forums. One man was so fixated on sex that he would patronize online hookup sites for anonymous sex. This obsession became so strong that he eventually started skipping out on his job in the middle of the day to meet up with partners. This continued until he got caught up in his latest hookup and missed an important meeting. A quick dismissal from his job soon followed as he hit rock bottom. Other sex addicts use their addiction to cover up for other stressors in life. A successful businessman's marriage was already in trouble when he started giving in to his compulsion to hire prostitutes. It didn't take long for his wife to figure out a lot of money was going missing, and she demanded he stop. So he promised he would, but he actually started opening new accounts, hiding his money, and getting deeper and deeper into the world of compulsive sex. And that's only the start of the trouble sex addicts can find themselves in without treatment. Addictive behaviors often go together, and people who are susceptible to one are vulnerable to others. One woman had a stable relationship with her husband until he wanted their active sex life to involve drugs. At first she agreed, but his drug use grew out of control and put them both in danger. She pulled away, but he got sucked deeper and deeper into his addiction and concealed his addictions from her. Another man was used to drinking pretty heavily as part of his social scene. He liked to ask random women for selfies and use them as his personal connection for pleasuring himself. He built a massive collection thanks to lowering his own inhibitions by drinking heavily and didn't realize how out of control he had become until his daughter discovered his secret collection and was horrified. Other sex addicts find themselves hitting even lower rock bottoms as they get arrested for soliciting sex workers or having public sex. Others contract sexually transmitted diseases that they then spread quickly as they move through sexual partners. The good news is, there's more help now than ever before. So what's the best treatment for those struggling with sex addiction? Many sex addicts seek counseling. But the counseling field is still split on whether sex addiction is a real diagnosis. The official regulatory bodies for sex and relationship therapy haven't accepted sex addiction as its own disorder, so the job of counseling those with sex addiction usually falls to experts of another sort, addiction specialists. While these counselors may not have much experience with sex addiction, they've counseled countless other people on how to handle addictions that are consuming their lives. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is common for treating other addictions, has been used to help sex addicts learn coping methods and behaviors to control their urges and keep them from disrupting their lives. But there's another key element often missing from treatment, support. Ever since Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in 1935 by Bill Wilson and Bob Smith, anonymous groups where addicts can share their stories and offer support to those struggling have been a cornerstone of addiction counseling. The programs have since expanded to groups supporting those struggling with addiction to narcotics, gambling, and overeating, as well as groups for family members supporting their loved ones with addiction. Multiple groups dedicated to helping sex addicts have emerged, including an online forum named NoFap and several in-person support groups. But there's just one problem. Not all of them agree on what the best approach is. Sex addiction is a newly diagnosed disorder and there's been relatively little research done in it compared to other addictions. That means different groups interpret the best way to help addicts differently. The most famous group, Sexaholics Anonymous, has a strict definition of sexual sobriety and helps those who want to go cold turkey on casual sex, pornography, and masturbation. Others, like Smart Recovery and Sex Addicts Anonymous, have a more flexible definition and help their members find a balance that gets their addiction under control. Many people who don't have any of these groups in their area attend Alcoholics Anonymous meetings without sharing why they're there and try to apply the 12 steps to their own addiction. But what about those who are struggling to get their addiction under control? Getting a major compulsion to a manageable level can be a long process, so many counselors are taking another step to protect their patients as they recover. Because many sex addicts engage in risky sex with people they don't know, some take pre-exposure prophylaxis during the early stages of recovery. This drug, covered by most insurance plans, is a preventative measure that helps to prevent HIV infections. It's favored by people who aren't ready to go cold turkey on their sex habits, but 
but want to avoid infection while they work toward recovery. Is society ready to address the topic of sex addiction like they do other addictions? Indications are mixed. Sex addiction first became known as a term in the 70s as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous tried to apply their 12-step program to those struggling with compulsive infidelity. But many people still argue over the classification of the disorder. Some worry about the risks of classifying sexual activity as a disorder and argue that it could be used to stigmatize people with healthy, active sex drives. Others argue that it's not an addiction at all but rather a form of compulsive behavior and should be treated differently. But even as the controversy persists, the disorder becomes more well known. Movies like Shame, Diary of a Sex Addict, and Don John help to raise awareness and give people compassion for those troubled by the disorder. The number of support groups is growing, and those seeking help for sex addiction are finding more people who have battled the disorder to welcome them as they start their own fight. Imagine doing something boring, like riding the subway or typing away at an expense report, and suddenly your body sends you a very clear message. You need to have sex. Not like a sex fantasy about someone you're attracted to. Rather, you get an intense feeling in your genitals that can only be relieved by sex. You try to ignore it, but it's not going away. And it doesn't care how inappropriate it is for the moment. For a small number of women, this unfortunate situation is reality, and it's one of the rarest and newest sexual disorders out there. Titled Persistent Genital Arousal Disorder, it's not just a one-time thing that makes itself known at an awkward time. This disorder causes sudden and persistent genital arousal without any current sexual stimulation or desire. This unknown disorder was at first mistaken for hypersexuality by puzzled doctors who assumed that this was normal sexual desire gone out of control. But examining a few people who suffered from this condition indicated that it was completely separate from sexual desire. This has led researchers to wonder if the name is appropriate. After all, the women aren't aroused, they're being troubled by a nerve reaction in their genitals that's giving them sensations they don't want. One thing is for sure, the women experiencing this condition all report the symptoms are extreme. When describing the symptoms of the disorder, arousal is the furthest thing from the minds of the sufferers. They feel intense pressure and irritation in their genital area, which can lead to contractions or vaginal congestion. Sometimes spontaneous orgasms can happen, but not in all cases. Sufferers sometimes try to relieve the pressure by masturbating and triggering an orgasm, but this only lasts a short time, if that. Many sufferers report having to have multiple orgasms in a short time to experience any relief, not something that's feasible when it occurs in the middle of a workday. So what causes this bizarre disorder? There are so few cases of persistent genital arousal disorder that no definite cause has been determined yet. Studies indicate that it may be exacerbated by stress, but that's probably not the source of the problem. Originally, doctors assumed it was psychologically based, but attempts to treat the condition through counseling didn't show results. Now it's believed the causes might be neurological or vascular, with conditions like Tarlov cysts or arterial malformations in the pelvic region pressing on a nerve that causes this unusual condition. So what's the solution? The women suffering from the condition are desperate for a cure. Treatments have varied, and so has the success rate. Most early cases were treated with a combination of psychotherapy and pelvic exercises, and while the therapy may or may not have been useful, some women report relief from the exercises. In cases where a physical cause can be determined, some minor surgeries have relieved the condition by removing the pressure, but the disorder isn't fully understood yet, and no one's quite sure why a medicine called varenicline, normally used to treat nicotine addiction, relieved one woman's symptoms. But mainly women suffering from the condition have a bigger problem, getting anyone to take them seriously. When Jeannie Allen came down with the syndrome in her mid-40s, she was one of the first people ever diagnosed, and she immediately found out that her condition would make her the subject of mockery. One of the first doctors she talked to even commented that she must be every man's dream, to which she snapped back that he should try to imagine what it would be like to have an orgasm every minute of the day. She was so frustrated that she eventually went public under the pen name Jean Lund and became one of the first people to ever share exactly what it was like to live with this condition long term. She described it as taking the joy out of life and leaving her unable to concentrate on anything else. Another woman, a 40-year-old flower vendor who became the subject of an early clinical study, reported that the episodes happened spontaneously with no trigger and left her exhausted and unable to plan her day effectively. She had previously had an attack of the condition seven years before and found relief after a surgery that removed a ruptured ovary, but now it was back and the doctors were as clueless as she was. They tried the medicine carbamazepine, an anticonvulsant on her, and she stopped after a month due to a lack of improvement. 
However, in her case, supportive therapy sessions seemed to do the trick as they reduced the frequency of symptoms and she was eventually able to resume a normal life. Causes might vary, but one medical condition repeats as likely cause of the condition. What is a Tarlov cyst? The human body is sensitive with a lot of little areas that can go awry and even the smallest problem can have unexpected consequences. The Tarlov cysts are tiny cysts in the spinal canal near the base of the spinal cord and are known for their walls filled with nerve fibers. First discovered by Isidore Tarlov in 1938, he at first assumed them not to cause any adverse symptoms. However, future investigations indicated they can cause pain, spasticity and muscle weakness, headaches and bladder dysfunction among other symptoms. They can wreak havoc on the nervous system and create unpredictable symptoms, including genital dysfunction as they happen to be right by the nerves that affect the genitals. When Professor Barry Komasaruk, one of the first researchers investigating persistent genital arousal syndrome, looked at the MRIs of sufferers, he was shocked to discover that two-thirds of them had Tarlov cysts. So there may finally be hope for the women being driven crazy by this strange disorder. Eleven women with the disorder had their Tarlov cysts operated on by Dr. Feigenbaum, a spinal neurosurgeon who had been studying the disorder. They became part of a case study on the disorder, and when they were interviewed after their recovery, eight of the eleven said their symptoms had gone away. The remaining three reported significant relief from before surgery, and this was the best evidence yet that sacral nerve compression was the root cause of the disorder. But not all cases of the disorder have the cysts, and not all people who improve have the surgery. And for Jeannie Allen, these advances weren't much help. She never had a Tarlov cyst, and doctors were at a loss for how to treat her. She eventually quit her job to dedicate herself to advocating for more research and support for women with her condition. Despite the growing awareness, it's still a very rare disorder. While it's believed hundreds of women may suffer from the condition, case studies have only looked at a population of under 30 women. How is the growing awareness of this disorder helping these women? For the first time, women suffering from this strange disorder have a source for help other than doctors who may not fully understand it. They can find fellow sufferers online to learn how they've been coping. This allows them to try various solutions including exercise, meditation, and medication that may or may not be helpful. While many find surgery as a solution, local anesthetic hasn't been successful in preventing the disorder. While the intense feeling is concentrated in one specific area, it doesn't originate there. It's generated in the nervous system, and any solution has to go deeper than skin deep. Persistent genital arousal disorder only affects those with a certain set of equipment, so those with the other set have to be breathing a sigh of relief, right? Not exactly. There's a similar condition that affects men, and it may be even more challenging and uncomfortable. It's called priapism, and it causes similar persistent arousal of the genitals that manifests as a prolonged, uncomfortable erection that persists even in the absence of any stimulation. Most men remember that awkward moment when you really can't stand up because the bulge in your pants has decided to make itself known, but this is an extended erection that can make it difficult to walk, urinate, or concentrate. Like persistent genital arousal disorder, it can be caused by a number of things including sickle cell disease, nerve damage, drug use, or trauma to the penis, another reason to be wary of getting kicked in the genitals. So is there any good news for those suffering from this uncomfortable condition? Well, priapism is more common than persistent genital arousal disorder, and doctors know a lot more about how to treat it. Unfortunately, it also carries more health risks. An erection that lasts too long can cause serious damage, as many ads for erectile dysfunction medication have warned. As most cases of priapism are caused by the inability of the penis to drain blood properly, the most common treatment is to numb the area and drain it with a minimally invasive procedure. If blood drainage isn't a problem, treating it can be as easy as a cold compress. But in a worst-case scenario, surgery may be performed, and the clock is ticking. Permanent damage can begin after only four hours. It's an embarrassing but not uncommon medical problem. It's estimated that it may occur in as many as 1 in 20,000 men a year. These have got to be some of the strangest sexual disorders to encounter, right? Not quite. Doctors have encountered some genuinely bizarre sexual disorders, some of which they don't have a real answer for yet. One of the most troubling sexual disorders is retrograde ejaculation, which has terrified quite a few couples. In this disorder, everything goes perfectly normally until it's time for the guy to ejaculate. It feels like everything went fine, but nothing's come out. This is a rare disorder caused by a malfunctioning valve between the urethra and the bladder where the semen doesn't travel down the escape hatch and instead shoots backwards into the bladder, 
It can make it difficult to conceive, but doesn't really have any serious health risks. The usual culprit? A side effect from medication. There are a few other things better than post-sex bliss, right? Not for the people with the next condition. Post-orgasmic illness syndrome is another condition that's puzzled doctors. For those few men suffering from it, whenever they ejaculate, they immediately come down with a series of flu-like symptoms. That pleasant feeling of an orgasm is immediately replaced by a feverish feeling, a runny nose, and the intense need to lie down. Not exactly a happy ending, and the cause might be even more bizarre. According to Dr. Marcel Waldinger, one of the few doctors to study this condition, the men might be allergic to their own semen. This has led doctors to experiment with a cure by injecting these men with a diluted solution made from their own sperm. Most of these conditions only manifest during or after sex, but this next one might be painfully obvious much earlier. Phimosis is a malformation of the foreskin surrounding the penis that makes it too tight, essentially forming a band around the tip that can make sex or any other pressure on the penis extremely painful. The disorder exists from birth but only becomes obvious when someone tries to have sex or masturbate. The good news is this disorder isn't nearly as mysterious as others. It's a simple skin problem and can be corrected by a circumcision procedure that's slightly more extensive than average, removing all the foreskin instead of only a part. The biggest challenge for the sufferers? Going to the doctor and admitting this embarrassing problem. The next disorder might sound less terrifying than the others, but it can make for some awkward conversations. Due to a problem during the development of a fetus, it's possible for male children to be born with two penises called diphalia. This is a rare condition that's most surprising for the fact that in some cases both penises function for both urination and ejaculation. One is usually smaller than the other, but that's the only distinction. The disorder can also manifest as a part of larger developmental abnormalities that require surgical intervention, and each case is handled independently as doctors figure out an approach that will lead to the most normal life for the affected child. It's rare for adults with diphalia who have not had the condition treated to be found, so unpleasant surprises in the bedroom are unlikely. With many sexual disorders like persistent genital arousal disorder, doctors are often unsure of whether the cause is physical, psychological, or due to side effects from an exterior stimulus. That's why those suffering from these rare disorders often find that their fellow sufferers are the best source of information as everyone tries to puzzle out these weird quirks of human sexuality. You wake up to the sound of shouting and screaming. Your girlfriend is pushing you out of the bed demanding that you leave or at least sleep on the sofa. What's going on? You were fast asleep minding your own business. Is she tripping or something? Hearing her voice go into high-pitched mode as she hurls accusations your way, your automatic reaction is to get defensive. Still, you try to stay calm and defend yourself. This has happened before and you know how it ended last time. After a few moments, you take in what she's actually saying. She's claiming you were aggressively thrusting and trying to get fresh with her while she was asleep. Nonsense! You were asleep too. Maybe she was just dreaming. But she seems so convinced that you don't dare suggest it. What's going on? Sexsomnia is a rare disorder that causes some unusual sleeping habits. Whereas insomniacs have trouble sleeping, sexsomniacs engage in sexual acts while asleep. This is different from having a wet dream or an orgasmic experience during your slumber because the person engages in full-on sexual acts like masturbation or intercourse. When they wake up, they have no idea what just happened. Imagine you could lose your virginity and not even realize. Madness. It's also possible to combine this sleep sex with sleep talking and sleep walking, so you could have the full shebang with some freaky outdoor sex outside and dirty talk. Madness. Having sex in your sleep might sound harmless or even pleasurable, but it can lead to some dire consequences. But first, let's look at the science behind this sexy phenomenon. Sexsomnia is a type of parasomnia, a term that encompasses all kinds of abnormal activities that can happen while we're asleep. Sleepwalking and sleep talking are the most common and well known, but it turns out we can get up to all kinds of weird stuff. Sleep related eating disorders make people binge eat while asleep. Confusional arousals aren't the weird stuff you're into that you shouldn't tell others about. They're also known as sleep drunkenness because they make us function at lower brain capacity and talk rubbish. And REM sleep behavior disorders see people fighting imaginary intruders or running away from non-existent monsters. Different types of parasomnia take place at different points in the sleep cycle. 
When we first nod off, we go into a light sleep for a few minutes, then we enter the second stage of sleep, which is also pretty light and ideal for brief naps. In the third and fourth stages, we finally enter deep sleep, a restorative state that helps us boost our immune system, energy, and repair our body tissue. Afterward, we go into rapid eye movement or REM sleep for around 90 minutes. At this point, the brain becomes more active and we consolidate our memories. It's also the part of sleep where we dream. Most cases of sexsomnia take place during non-rapid eye movement or NREM during stages 3 and 4. Since these are the deepest stages of the sleep cycle and don't involve dreams, the mind can go a little crazy. The parts of the brain that control vision, movement, and emotion remain awake during NREM sleep, but the parts controlling memory, decision-making, and rationality are asleep. Yep, sounds like a recipe for disaster. Most types of parasomnia occur during NREM sleep, including sleepwalking and sleep talking, but there are also a few disorders that can happen during REM sleep. A key example is sleep paralysis, waking up paralyzed while partially emerged in a dream state, which is why it's so terrifying. Because sexomnia occurs during deep sleep and we don't remember it when we wake up, it's difficult to diagnose yourself. Symptoms include heavy breathing, sweating, masturbating, pelvic thrusting, spontaneous orgasm, fondling, an elevated heart rate, and blank stares. To me, that just sounds like the normal state of a hormone-filled teenager, but there you go. Although we have a vague understanding of sexomnia now, it's still murky on the details. What causes it? How often does it happen? We're still not sure. Naturally, it's pretty challenging for scientists to investigate sexomnia. You can't just repeatedly make two people fall asleep together in a laboratory, hoping that eventually they'll have sex while sleeping. Then repeat it with a hundred other couples because you need a bigger sample size to reach any conclusion. We'll probably be in the dark about this one for a long time. However, there are some theories. Some researchers think the causes of sexomnia could be exhaustion, alcohol, drugs, anxiety, or poor sleeping conditions, and sharing a bed with someone, although it's hard to ignore that one altogether. So, we can only assume that attempting to cope with the extreme stress by taking drugs, partying until the early hours, and getting into bed with your friend who has an uncomfortable mattress is a terrible idea and not a healthy coping mechanism. You learn something new every day. Even though it's notoriously difficult to research sexomnia, a few cases have been found, and I'll tell you now, it doesn't end well. The first case of sexomnia was reported as recently as 1986. That could be because humans are getting progressively hornier over time, but most likely it's just because nobody thought it was worthwhile to report before then. I mean, what person in their right mind would ring up their doctor after they masturbated in their sleep? You'd just shrug it off and go about your day, wouldn't you? Even now, only 194 cases have ever been reported, and there's very little information available about most of them. But in 2017, one man in the UK was successfully diagnosed after ending up in hot water with both his current and his ex-girlfriend. We don't know his actual name, so let's call him Bob. First, Bob crashed at his ex-girlfriend's house one night. It's not a good idea at the best of times, but in fairness to him, they had a kid together. What could go wrong, right? Turns out, a lot can go wrong. Bob woke up to find his ex screaming at him, accusing him of rape. He was confused and alarmed, believing he'd done nothing of the sorts, but decided it was best to leave promptly and let her calm down. It was probably a bad call to not talk it out and investigate further, because the incident ended with him being accused of rape and convicted as guilty by the jury. Still, Bob didn't understand what had happened and believed he was innocent. Then a similar pattern happened with his next girlfriend. The first night they slept in the same bed, she was annoyed to find him fondling her and thrusting in the middle of the night, but brushed it off and said nothing. Then another night, after a boozy party she was woken up in the middle of the night, she shouted at Bob angrily, angry that he'd wake her up and have such little respect for her boundaries. It was so out of character too, he was usually so gentle and thoughtful. Much to her surprise, Bob seemed taken aback, confused, and denied anything had happened. Was he an evil gaslighting genius, or was there something even stranger going on here? Bob saw a doctor who pointed out the rare disease of sexomnia. Suddenly everything made sense. He wasn't a forgetful sexual predator, he'd literally been sleeping throughout all the incidents. To verify it really was sexomnia, the doctor referred him to a sleep clinic in London where he could be monitored. The researchers put electrodes to his scalp as he slept to monitor his brain activity and found some surprising results. During the incidents, Bob was effectively both awake and asleep at the same time. The sleep cycle of regular people was out the window. There were both the slow brain waves associated with deep sleep and the fast rhythms and brain waves associated with being awake. They diagnosed him with sexomnia. 
Another man from Scotland was cleared of rape charges after doctors diagnosed him with sexomnia, but it's still a legal gray area for now. As the Hollywood cliche goes, poised coital, some of us sit back against the headboard, proud of our accomplishment at gratifying our lover, spouse, or one night stand, and then light up a cigarette. How was it for you? Good enough, you surmise, as you take a well-earned drag? Or are you the kind of person to roll over in an instant, perhaps leaving your bedfellow exasperated and hardly ready to catch some Z's? Or perhaps you spare just a moment reposing, and then compose yourself and start again? Do you cuddle up? Have a chat? Talk about deep things? Or even request a favor of your lover? According to research, these are all common. But what happens to our bodies during and after sex? That's what we'll find out today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, what happens to your body while you are having sex? Today we'll talk about what happens to both men and women having heterosexual sex, and when we say sex, we mean intercourse, lovemaking, copulation, fornication, or as the Brits say, having it off. So, let's start with the man. What happens to him? At some point during sex, men reach a point of no return. This is sometimes called ejaculatory inevitability. Pulse rate and blood pressure rise, the sperm leaves him, and his penis has contractions. Now he can return to resting and let his body calm down, which apparently happens faster for men than women. The penis becomes flaccid, and most men will have to wait some time before they can go at it again, but it all depends on age, fitness, and of course the urge to return to the hearth of passion. Some guys at this point will just want to go to sleep. Is this plain rude, or is it a biological necessity? Well, listen up disgruntled women, science says it's natural for men to want to sleep, and for various reasons. Notwithstanding the obvious, in that it's often nighttime and tiredness might be normal, another reason is because upon reaching orgasm, men release lots of pent up anxiety. So do women, and they might feel tired too, but it seems men sleep more after sex according to research. Another thing is brain chemistry. All these chemicals spill out in the brain when men ejaculate, including serotonin, oxytocin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, and nitric oxide. Some of these chemicals are related to de-stressing and the readiness to sleep. This can lead to that feeling of, phew, and then men want to relax just as they would after any strenuous exercise. It's kind of like getting a hit of morphine, and apparently that hit is much stronger when having sex than when masturbating. One doctor puts it like this when talking about the release of chemicals. They give you a very relaxed feeling, slow down your brainwaves and cerebral functioning, and make you feel pleasantly tired. But it's thought the hormone that is released called prolactin is the main reason men want to sleep. It gives you satisfaction, and the less of it you have, the more likely you will go for round two quicker. Really satisfied men may just turn over and start to snore. Another thing is, is that he might want to go for a pee. The reason? It's chemicals again. Oxytocin and prolactin affect the kidneys, and this makes him run off to the bathroom. Some experts also think it's to clean the urethra from bacteria, a kind of natural need. It might also just be because he's been holding it in during all that messing around. He then finds the pee won't come out. That is normal, because for the sperm to come out, your internal sphincter muscle clamps, and this is to close the bladder. This is to stop the semen from entering the bladder. In a recent article in Cosmopolitan magazine, it was suggested that men who want to cuddle are keepers, but it also says that men who don't might just be succumbing to their own body's demands. You might find that your penis feels a bit sore, but this is just normal after all that contracting. Don't worry, it shouldn't last long. And don't be shocked if your testicles have shrunk, because this is normal too. A doctor talking to Men's Health magazine explained it like this. When you ejaculate, the cremister muscle contracts and brings your testicles up closer to your body, giving you the perception that they're smaller. Lastly, you may get a cramp in the toe. Apparently this happens a lot, but it's just because orgasm causes stimulation in the nerves, especially S1 in the spinal column, and that nerve affects the toes. If you look at some research, it also says some men's moods change dramatically after sex, but given the release of all that tension, and all those chemicals flooding out, that's not so surprising. Some men have reported feeling emotionally handicapped after a great orgasm, and that's thought to be because huge amounts of dopamine were released. It's like coming down from a drug that makes you feel happy or ecstatic. In women, the feelings can be similar, as we shall see. So, what about postcoital women? Well, women may not always orgasm. According to an article in Psychology Today, which cited a number of studies, around half of women will regularly orgasm during intercourse, about 20% of women rarely orgasm, 20% consistently orgasm, and 5% never orgasm. When they do, it's different from a man's one great push to the sun, as women have what has been called rapid rhythmic contractions. This can be quite the event, and some women certainly show this in their face, sometimes looking like they've had an ecstatic experience. 
These shockwaves go through her genitals, her anus, her uterus, and her pelvis, and she too will have a magnificent rush of chemicals flooding through her brain. She may experience female ejaculation, which is when a milky liquid will come out of her urethra. Don't worry women, there's nothing wrong with this. But what about when a lot of liquid comes out? A neurophysiologist from Rutgers University in Newark says it's not the same milky stuff if it comes out in large amounts. In that case, she says, it is urine diluted with substances from the female prostate. Scientists are still not clear as to why some women do this and others don't, but it's certainly not harmful. So, why are women often up for a chat about tomorrow's activities or the meaning of life while some men are already halfway to La La Land? According to a study in the Netherlands undertaken in 2005, women are more focused than men during sex, their minds completely set to the task of reaching orgasm. This is because their amygdala and hippocampus, which regulate feelings, kind of turns off. They are at one with sex, well, at least if they are fully immersed in it. Once we've come, we return to our bodies, our consciousness recalibrates, and our emotional intelligence returns, said an article in Bustle about this phenomenon. But after sex, they switch back. And it's then they get that lovely hit of oxytocin, sometimes called the cuddle chemical. One study found that people with high levels of testosterone release less of this after sex, and men generally have high levels. Some women do too, of course, just not as much. So men, next time you turn over, blame your lack of oxytocin. And women may not experience a refractory period at all. This is the downtime men need to get ready to do it again. Note, teenagers may not need much downtime, but then again, sex doesn't always last that long for these hyper-carnal kids. Women are multi-orgasmic and they usually could just start again. But be careful there women, because sex can be more painful for you than it can be for men. Women might cramp up in the uterus, and this is due to the cuddle drug, oxytocin. Let's now call that the double-edged sword chemical. There might also be some burning because of the vaginal tissues getting dry, but lubrication can help. The stinging doesn't mean there is a problem, but obviously if it persists longer than a day or two, it might be something else. And if men see shrinkage, then women see the opposite, in their breasts at least, Many women's breasts get bigger after sex, and in some women, by as much as 25%. According to Women's Health magazine, just how swollen the breasts become differs from woman to woman. The same article also said a woman's clitoris will become very small at point of orgasm, almost disappearing. At the same time, women's nipples may become more sensitive, but this is very natural. Other reports say some women become giddy after sex, and others feel great confidence, seeing their bodies as much more attractive than before. Most reports we can find state that while some women may experience a slump after the sex, it's the men that really suffer from depression, sometimes a week long. But as the saying goes, what goes up must come down, and most of the time, it's worth the ride. It was late in the spring of 1933 when a gang of masked men burst into a wealthy judge's Kansas City house, brandishing a sawed-off shotgun. The judge wasn't home, but it wasn't him the men were after, it was his daughter. At the time, she was upstairs in the bathtub, lathered in bubbles. Get out of the bath and get dressed, you're coming with us, said the men. They explained to her that she was going to be held ransom. She asked for how much, and one of the men replied $60,000. Her actual response to that was, I'm worth more than that. Subsequently, she was taken to a house and chained up in the basement. The gang would eventually get $30,000. Hey, it was better than nothing. The woman was released, but get this, she later let it be known that she supported the men that had imprisoned her. So what's going on? How can someone be pushed around, chained up, held for days like that, then admit that she was fond of those guys? They got caught in the end, of course, but even during the trial, the woman stuck up for them. Her name was Mary McElroy, and she was 25 when she was put through this ordeal. The kidnappers all received harsh sentences, and the gang leader was sentenced to be hanged but that eventually was commuted to a life sentence. When young Mary heard about the hanging sentence, she wrote to the governor saying, his sentence has hung as heavily over me as over him. Through punishing a guilty man, his victim will be made to suffer equally. It seemed she really took pity on this guy. In fact, throughout the gang's imprisonment, she would visit them and take them flowers as well as other gifts. If it sounds to you like something was not quite right with Mary, then you are on the right path. Something was very wrong with her. She was mentally unsound. For several years after her kidnapping, she displayed strange behavior and had multiple nervous breakdowns. She got addicted to opiates and lived with her father, seldom communicating with the outside world. World. When he bit the dust, she became a recluse, but she would never relinquish her fondness for her captors. Mary was experiencing something that had been called Stockholm Syndrome, although at the time there really wasn't a word for it. This is what we mean when we say doctors were perplexed at her behavior. Such a condition wasn't common at all. The term actually came about after something that happened in, you guessed it, Stockholm in Sweden. 
This is an absolutely crazy story in itself, so we think you deserve to hear the details. The opening scene goes something like this. A Swedish man with a very colorful rap sheet named Jan Erik struts into a bank in the capital city. He isn't there to talk about a loan for a new meatball business, though. He's going to rob the place. He pulls out a gun and demands the tellers open the drawers and hand him the cash. He isn't particularly a bright guy and hasn't planned this robbery very well, but in his defense he at least had painted his face black and donned a wig and sunglasses. You can only imagine how that looked to the folks in the bank. To make matters even more weird, he then pulled something else out, and it wasn't another weapon, it was a transistor radio. He placed that carefully on the counter, and then he turned it on to Swedish Radio P3. Ok, now he had music. What next? Well, unlucky for him, within no time at all, the cops were on the scene. While he was fiddling about with his radio and trying to find the right channel, someone had hit the alarm button. The cop entered the bank, which today might seem kind of brave. Drop your weapon! shouted the policeman, and naturally the robber's response was to shoot him. Another cop had entered the bank by this time, and then Jan Eric did something else not written in the manual, Life of Crime Part 1 Bank Robbing for Beginners. He told the cop to sit on a chair and ordered him to sing a song, any song. The cop thought for a while and then started doing a rendition of Elvis Presley's Lonesome Cowboy. After this, he let the cops outside know what he wanted, and if his demands weren't met, his hostages in the bank would get it. No doubt he was taken seriously, he was, after all, a loon. He asked for 3 million kroner in cash, and half of it in Swedish money and the rest in foreign currency. He also wanted a fast car with a full tank of gas, two pistols, and a free road for himself. He then demanded his friend be let out of prison to join him, and he also said he would like two hostages on the road with him. This friend by the way was a safe cracker, so perhaps we were a little harsh saying Jan Eric was a few fries short of a happy meal. His friend did end up in the bank with him, but he had promised the Swedish government to act as a negotiator. We won't go into every detail, but the negotiation went on as the world watched on their TV screens. The hostages would later say Jan Eric walked around at times singing Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly. That was perhaps not the best song to hear while you're being held captive by a man holding a gun. While this story sounds amusing, violence was used at times, but on other occasions the hostage takers were apparently pretty friendly. The ordeal went on for six days, so the hostages and their captors got to know each other fairly well. They barricaded the hostages in a vault, so we might say it was cozy. Nonetheless, we We've seen a photo of the hostages in the bank vault and it doesn't exactly look like they're having a fabulous time. Later, it was discovered that the men had told the hostages they were going to get shot, but strangely they didn't seem to mind. To understand Stockholm Syndrome, you need to know what one of the hostages later said to the New Yorker in an interview. He said this of his abductor, When he treated us well, we could think of him as an emergency god. Another hostage later explained how she thanked her abductor when he told her he wouldn't kill her, but uh, just shoot her in the leg. He was a compassionate god, you see. The police finally got on top of the situation and the men said they would give up their hostages. But when it was time to go, the two abductors and those hostages embraced and kissed and shook hands. One of the female hostages told the cops, don't hurt them. This sounds like a jolly old time for the hostages the way we've told it, but at the time their lives were certainly in danger. They had guns to their head, some of them had been pushed around, one woman had a rope tied around her neck. Was this just another one of those days when a bank happens to be full of masochists? No is the answer to that if you need telling. It wasn't only the cops and the public that thought the captives adoring their captors was perhaps a little strange. Some of the captives knew themselves that they were acting weird. One of them, after her ordeal, even went to see a psychiatrist and she reportedly said to him, is there something wrong with me? Why don't I hate them? They didn't feel indebted to the cops for saving them. They felt indebted to the good guys that hadn't blown off their heads. They wouldn't let anyone say a bad word that might taint their captor's sparkling image and diminish their outstanding generosity. Some of the hostages even went to visit the guys in prison. The world of psychiatry heard about this strange phenomenon and wanted to understand it. They decided to call it Stockholm Syndrome. By the way, Jan Eric moved to Thailand after his release and wrote a book by the same name. So, Stockholm Syndrome, in short, means sympathizing with a captor or in some cases, being close to your captor. Before we go into detail about why it might happen, we'll present to you another case. This one is more controversial for reasons you'll see. In Austria in 1988, a 10-year-old girl was kidnapped and thrown into a van. She was then held captive in a dark room under a garage for eight years. Her captor might at times be nice, but then he would just change and become abusive. The girl at the start of her ordeal was never allowed to leave the room, a room that had no windows and was soundproof. It was like a living hell. She was a tortured bird in a concrete cage. While she later said she despaired at times, she also said being held like a prisoner had its benefits. She said of her experience, 
I spared myself many things. I did not start smoking or drinking, and I did not hang out in bad company. She got a TV and books, but she wasn't exactly spoiled for food. The girl later said that she was so thin and weak she could hardly move, and then at times the guy would beat her up so badly she sustained injuries that made it hard to stand up. Later on, her captor would let her out and take the girl, now a teenager, on trips. She never tried to escape, although she said sometimes she thought about it. When she was 18, she finally escaped. She told the authorities who she was, and she Shocked, looking at this girl who had hardly grown in height while in captivity and was emaciated, they took her in. The hunt was on for the captor, but he decided that life was short and jumped in front of a speeding train. What did that girl say about her ordeal? The beatings, the starvation, the confinement, the mental torture? She said, I feel more and more sorry for him, he's a poor soul. That was before she knew he'd killed himself. I mourn for him, she said in another interview after she found out. She got a lot of hate mail from the public for saying stuff like that. She said while she was imprisoned, she had to delude herself as a way to cope. She had to somehow create a world which was not a constant horror. She told The Guardian in 2010, in situations when I was being bathed, I picture myself being at a spa. When he gave me something to eat, I imagined him as a gentleman, that he was doing all this for me to be gentlemanly, serving me. She was well aware when she became a teenager that he was crazy and her situation was terrible, and she did try to take her life at least one time. But she also kind of understood her captor. Just before her escape, she told him, I really am grateful to you for not killing me. And for taking such good care of me. That is very nice of you, but you can't force me to stay with you. I'm my own person with my own needs. This situation must come to an end, and end it did. So, one part of Stockholm Syndrome might be adapting to your situation, and in fact, the girl we just talked about has denied being mentally ill, and said in a way she just made the best out of a bad situation. She said this to the BBC, If you spend a great deal of time with a person, it's about empathy, communication. Looking for a normality within the framework of a crime is not a syndrome, it's a survival strategy. In the case of the hostages at the bank, their lives were in the hands of their captors, so psychologists say they developed powerful feelings for these guys. Those men were the ones who were going to let them live, and so they were kind of gods to them. And they did let them live, so hey, they were benevolent gods in the end. Anyone in captivity for a while might at some point show gratitude toward their captors for even the smallest acts of kindness. After a longer period of time, the captive person becomes reliant on the captor for everything, and so they might become like a child to that person. One psychologist wrote, they experience a type of infantilization, where, like a child, they are unable to eat, speak, or go to the toilet without permission. There have been studies when the captive person was told that life without their captor is dangerous and they believed it, to the extent of not trying to even run away when they had the chance. So first a person might feel utter terror, but as a survival mechanism they might even begin to empathize with the person who has them locked up. It's a coping mechanism, and somewhere in the mind a switch might get flicked and the person might start liking their captor. It's the only way to get through it. They submit to their god, and when that god doesn't exhibit its wrath, this becomes an act of kindness. This submission, importantly, isn't a conscious choice in that the victim doesn't think, hmm, I better be nice to this dude. They actually just become nice to him. In some cases, they might even help their captor evade the authorities. The FBI once said that 8% of kidnapping victims had shown signs of Stockholm Syndrome. There is so much gray area, though, because every situation is unique. Like the girl we talked about, some victims will tell you that they're not suffering from anything. Stockholm Syndrome is not actually recognized as a mental illness or as an official psychiatric diagnosis, but it's a term used to describe what victims might be experiencing. You wouldn't say, he's got Stockholm Syndrome, but you might know he's experiencing something like Stockholm Syndrome. At least now you all know something else that came from Sweden besides IKEA and meatballs. I was in agony. Absolute, total agony. Around me were hundreds if not thousands of people, all of us intent on being some of the first people to take a ride on Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure at Universal's Islands of Adventure theme park. I had seen the sneak preview video, and it looked amazing, like no other ride I'd ever seen. There was no way I was going to drop out of that queue, but the pain, oh my god the pain. I felt as if I was holding on to a rising balloon, and if I just held on a little longer I could make it, but if my grip failed me, I would fall and die. Well, That's just a metaphor, but in reality, I really was on the verge of death. Let me explain. First of all, you should know that I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, not just a fan of the movies, but the books and everything else related to the magical teen and his band of extraordinary buddies. You're probably thinking that I'm just a kid, but you'd be wrong. I was a kid when the first movies came out, but as some guys on the mean streets sometimes say, once an addict, always an addict. 
When I heard about the new ride in Orlando, I got in touch with another guy I knew from the Harry Potter fan club Facebook page, and we both agreed we'd try to get in on the inaugural ride. The reason I picked him is because we both live in Florida. I'm in Tampa, and he's in Jacksonville. We wouldn't have to travel too far, so the deal was made. The plan was to get a hotel close to the theme park and the next day wake up well before dawn and start queuing before the crowds came. As you guys all know, you can have the best intentions in the evening and when you get up in the morning, you don't have the same amount of enthusiasm. We were sharing a room and that meant when that alarm clock went off at 3 a.m., we weren't in the best of moods. Maybe those few beers the evening before had been a bad idea. Fortunately, the hotel had a 24-hour cafe, so I sank two double espressos followed by a bottle of water, followed by a mocha frappuccino to go. My friend wasn't into coffee. He said it gave him anxiety, but I can tell you this, soon after I downed those espressos, I was good to go. Since I knew we'd be standing in line for maybe a couple of hours, we bought some stuff from the convenience store and put the food, water, and soft drinks in our backpacks. What was surprising was the fact that when we got to the park around 5 a.m., there was already a stream of people lined up at the entrance to the park, all of them there for Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure. No kidding, we even met a guy who'd come all the way from England. The dude was dressed in a wizard's cape and written on it were the words potty for potter. He had to explain to me that potty can mean crazy in the UK. The guy was kind of condescending about having to explain that to me, but I paid it no mind. The guy was potty. There was no doubt about that. Flying over the Atlantic for a theme park ride, he told me he'd read in the media that the experience was one of a kind and the park had spent $300 million on it. He said some of his countrymen traveled the world to watch their stupid football teams lose, so what he was doing wasn't at all that crazy. You mean soccer? I asked genuinely. What did I know? No, he said, shaking his head in disdain. I mean football. Jeez, I thought, I'm gonna have to spend the next few hours next to this guy, and I've already upset him. After about an hour, we saw more and more people join the queue. It was hard to say how many because it wrapped around the corner. In front of us, I'd guess there were about three to 400 people. The time was now about 7 a.m., so there was only a couple of hours to wait before the park opened. But the thing was, I needed to pee. I'd only had those small espressos and I'd barely touched my mocha frappuccino, but I still felt those first pangs of pee pain. You know, the part where you're not quite sure that if you just hit the release button for a second if something would come out. At 9am, we were allowed inside the park and to my surprise, no one tried to cut in line. Every single person was directed toward the ride, with some of us now inside the theme park, and from what I could see, a lot of people still in line on the outside. That made me feel quite proud that we made the decision to wake up so early. The sun was now out, and I was in a bit of a predicament. I still needed that pee. Well, I needed it more, but I was also thirsty. Those beers the night before really had been a bad idea. I decided I'd just take a sip of some Coca-Cola rather than glug down the water. I'd later find out that that decision was a bad one because sweet soft drinks like the coffees I drank are what you'd call diuretics. What are they, you might wonder? Well, the answer is they promote something called diuresis. Okay, so you're still in the dark about this? The simple answer is they make you pee. Pee more than, say, water. Caffeine is the king of diuretics and I just had coffee and coke. I was really holding that pee in at around the 10 a.m. mark, about five hours into our queuing. There were some helpful distractions, such as videos playing with some amusing words from Hagrid, or pictures of the ride itself, and the pretty amazing forbidden forest that had been created. But still, I was now in pretty serious pain. At around the six hour point, I was standing cross-legged and slightly bent over. This seemed to ease the pain as if I were squeezing the tubes where the urine traveled to meet its final destination. What I would later find out after a bit of research was that at that point, I was in danger of weakening my bladder muscles, something which could harm my bladder for the rest of my life. In hindsight, that was the least of my worries. Sure, we were getting close to the ride, I hoped, and I just stood there looking like a man who was slightly demented or had recently been in an accident. My buddy had done the right thing and had just been taking small sips of the water. But to be honest, in his excitement, I really don't think he was that concerned about my predicament. I'd also later find out that the parts of my body that were helping me keep in the pee, now probably a tsunami waiting to happen, are called the urethral cylindrical sphincters. These are great when you tighten them for a short while, such as when you don't want a puddle of pee beneath you on a busy bus, but they're brakes, not doors. They can be worn out. At the seven hour mark, I couldn't overstate how much agony I was in. I knew we were getting close to the ride, so I held on for dear life. That British guy heard me telling my buddy that I thought I was about to pee myself. My friend laughed, but I can tell you it wasn't funny to me. 
My buddy said that if it was that bad, just go find a bathroom and he'd hold my spot in the queue, and you won't believe what happened next. That British guy overheard this and said in no uncertain terms that if I left the queue then I'd have to start from the back. He said he also needed a pee, but in Britain he said there's a thing called queuing etiquette. I think that this guy thought he was special just because Harry Potter is British. That or he was just a xenophobic snob. I can recall his exact words. He said the reason we have queuing etiquette is because if we didn't then there'd be chaos. Queuing chaos doesn't work, he said, and then he went about a time in the past he had difficulty buying a train ticket in India and how he'd almost gotten into a fight at a buffet when hordes of hungry Chinese people fought over the shrimp. He said he wasn't picking on me, only that if order broke down then order would cease to exist. Formal and orderly queuing, he said, in a patronizing way, is the mark of a civilized man. What a total jerk. He told me that if I left the line he'd make a complaint and say I'd cut in line. What I really couldn't believe is that the other people in the line didn't get my back, so I guess one less man in the line was good for them so they just kept quiet. The words that went through my head were, the milk of human kindness, and then I wished I hadn't thought about milk, gallons of it pouring over pristine porcelain mountains. At that moment my urethral sphincters almost called it quits. I'll fill you in later, but I'll tell you that I'd already caused myself some damage. I was at about the 9 hour point, then we were very close to the ride entrance. I'd almost made it, but the problem now was the excitement I felt almost made me lose concentration and loosen those muscles and let all the urine flood out. I had to concentrate, keep the door locked, I kept saying to myself. Everyone was laughing and joking, taking selfies and looking in awe at the ride we were about to go on, and I was undoubtedly the only man in that queue who did not have a smile on his face. If anything, I grimaced, a kind of agonized grimace, like someone who just won the lottery and then been told they only have a week to live. We finally got in the castle, but to be honest I was in no mood for taking photos. I was hardly even aware at this point if I was actually holding a pee in. It was like I'd gone into survival mode. It felt like my urine had become a hardened prisoner, my entire body was now some kind of detainment unit. That ride itself consisted of Hagrid's motorcycle with a sidecar next to it. I told my buddy that in the interests of me holding the pee, it might be best if I took the bike and he took the sidecar. It was all about control, you see, I needed to feel in control. That British guy was right behind me on the other bike, something he'd regret to this day. At something like 50 miles an hour, we drove past Fluffy the three-headed dog and other such things as Cornish pixies and a centaur. I didn't really care. I just wanted the experience to be over as quickly as possible. This was turning out to be one of the most painful and pointless days in my life and there would be consequences to come. I thought I had it under control, even on the biggest descents and through the sharp bends, but then there was a surprise drop and the heavens burst. The tsunami came. My bladder roared as its doors were kicked down by a violent torrent of urine. My pecker must have been flailing around like an out of control fire hose. Hours of backed up urine gushing from its spout like a great yellow geyser. The pee was everywhere, and it stunk. It was old pee, neglected pee. And when it ejected from me, it spread far and wide. I looked behind me and saw that British guy wincing, looking utterly disgusted. His eyes were glaring into mine. Was I embarrassed, you might ask? No, is the answer. I was relieved, incredibly relieved and almost ecstatic that my British foe had tasted the vapors of an agony he had been an accomplice in creating. I know guys, maybe I shouldn't have felt so overjoyed that someone had to experience great wafts of urine vapor in their face, but you know what? I paid for it. I soon got my karma. When I finally got back to Tampa after a pretty awkward farewell with my Harry Potter fanboy buddy, I felt a stinging pain every time I went to the bathroom to pee. After seeing a doctor, I was told I had a urinary tract infection. That could be cured, he said, and he told me he couldn't believe I'd done a 10-hour urine hole. If there are records, he said, I might have broken some. The bad news, though, was that he said the damage done could be irreversible. He told me that long-term bladder stretching could make it hard for me to pee in the future, and one day if I kept doing this kind of thing, I might have to put a catheter into my member and draw the urine out. On the other hand, all that stress on my bladder could lead to incontinence, so holding in even normal pees would be impossible. I had some blood checks and my kidneys were functioning normally, but he said, when you do anything as crazy as I did, kidney damage can occur, as can the appearance of kidney stones. Just don't make a habit of enduring those marathons, he said. 
A few minutes is fine, but holding it for hours isn't good for you at all. The one thing he said that really scared me is when he told me that the bladder can actually burst when you hold in a pee as long as I did. He said it was very rare, but it had happened. When it does happen, you can actually die. He told me not to worry though, because the cases he'd heard about all happened to people who already had compromised bladders. He said, like what happened to me, before the bladder bursts, people will just pee themselves. He said cases of healthy bladders just bursting are so rare that he doubted that it could have happened to me. But in the few cases it has happened, urine leaked into the abdomen, and when people didn't get straight to the emergency room, they died. The punchline to this story is that I could have actually told one of the attendants at the park that I needed the bathroom and gotten the green light to go, and he would have made sure I got right back into the queue despite what that British guy might have said about that. So you let things get out of control. The pounds seemed to pile on, and it was as if you weren't noticing the changes in your body. Then one day you looked in the mirror and thought, wow, I have really let myself go. Don't worry, that happens to most of us at some point in our life. As we age, love handles appear, the belly grows, there seems to be flaps of flab growing under your arms, and in general, you just don't feel as fit, strong, or flexible as you used to. The other day, you bent down to pick up a fallen coin and pulled a muscle, and you decided it was time to get fit again. Today we're going to tell you how not only to look good and feel good, but how to get shredded. It's not as hard as you think. We're going to start by telling you a true story of a man that in his prime was a competitive weightlifter, only for an injury to sideline him for quite a long time. His couch-bound days transformed his body, and what was once a chiseled physique became an ordinary body replete with bulging belly and a set of love handles a small person could hang off of. Don't worry if you've never been in great shape before like him, because his road back to being ripped is one anyone can follow, regardless of what body shape you have or have had. Although thanks to muscle memory, it'll be a lot easier for him to get back to being shredded than it would if you're not used to exercising. It's all basic stuff and you don't need to be an expert to do it, nor spend a ton of money. What you will have to do is make a plan and stick to it. We're asking you to commit maybe 30 minutes to an hour a day and make some other small changes. The transformation will be noticeable in a short period of time and the payoff will change your life. So first of all, you need to lose some weight. You know this because bending down to tie your shoes is an effort and well, the mirror doesn't lie, nor does your doctor. You might be strong, but it might not be noticeable on the outside. You want to look strong and you also want flexibility back. It's a cliche these days, but it's true. To lose weight, you can't just rely on exercise alone. Many studies have shown that Americans in general are exercising more, but many people are still overweight. Diet is important, and that's an understatement. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released a report in 2018, and this was their conclusion. Americans are exercising more, but the obesity rate is growing. The first thing you can do might sound extreme, but it's not that extreme. This is what the former weightlifter did. Go into your kitchen and look at what's in the cupboards and the refrigerator. All those highly processed foods, the stuff with empty calories, you'll throw away or at the very least don't buy them anymore. The chips, the cookies, the stuff you keep snacking on that couldn't be said to be a whole food. These things must go. You want to be eating wholesome foods, raw foods such as chicken, lean beef, vegetables for salads, whole oats, fish, some fruit, nuts, you get the picture. You don't want to be eating those sugary cereals, frozen pizzas, etc. There are a plethora of websites out there that can tell you what healthy foods are, but for now, look at what you have that's highly processed and get rid of it. We're not saying all processed food is bad, but just try and concentrate on eating what we might call nutritious food and certainly cut back on the sugar. We might also add that for many people around the world, intermittent fasting has helped them lose weight. This might mean just having a meal in the evening and then waiting 16 to 24 hours for the next meal. That includes not having sugar in your drinks. This is really not as hard as you think, and some people have even said it's the lazy person's diet because essentially it requires less effort than eating or shopping for food. It might also save you some money. We're not saying that you have to go vegan when you eat or follow a diet that makes it almost impossible for you to eat because of the time it takes you to buy all the healthy foods. It's okay to eat a burger, have some rice, but just go easy on the carbs and get rid of all the food that doesn't have a good calorie versus nutrients balance. This is already enough to make you lose weight, especially with some fasting now and again. One thing we should say about intermittent fasting though is if you have health issues, please check with your doctor before you do it. Now comes the training. If you want to get ripped, you'll need this part, of course, and it will take some effort. Saying that, you'd be surprised just how fit you can get from your own living room. 
We also suggest that when you can walk, walk. Get in as many steps as possible and do things like take the stairs instead of the elevator if you're not going too high up. If you work sitting down, try and get up every so often, then walk and stretch if possible. We suggest you try to work out six times a week and have a rest day. This can be any day, but sometimes your body will tell you when it's time to take a day off. Out of these six days, you can either have one or two cardio days. We understand that for some people who have packed on the pounds, running for one hour or cycling up a mountain is a big ask. Don't hurt yourself, so just do as much as you can. You can find some experts that will tell you to try to push yourself to 80%. If running is too much, in the gym you have two great machines to start on. These are the elliptical trainer and the rowing machine. Neither machine should stress your joints too much. You can change the settings, but again, why not tire yourself to about 80% of what you can do? Each time you use the machine, add 5 minutes to your workout. If you can row for 1 hour and halfway up the resistance levels, you're doing well. In fact, you really don't need any more than this for a good cardio workout. If you find 10 minutes is hard at rowing, the elliptical machine, or jogging, then just build up until you can reach an hour. Let's also remember that a lot of people will tell you half an hour is good to maintain weight and be healthy, but you're trying to lose weight and get ripped. Now let's say you don't have the time or the money to go to the gym. Well, there are lots of things you can do from your home. You might say a plank a day keeps the belly away, but it could be an exaggeration. But planking at least once or twice a day for as long as you can is very good for you and your shape. For ab exercises, you really don't need the gym at all. There are endless home exercise routines you can find online, some of which are free and can be found on YouTube. We warn you though, if you're a beginner, then don't feel bad if you feel pooped before the video even gets going. Some are much more high intensity than others. If you search for Spartan workout videos, you'll find some of these to be hard to follow. We don't mean understand, of course, we mean follow the guy or girl in the video as they take you through the exercises. The good thing is these videos can be seen for free, and they will get you into shape quickly especially now that you've changed your diet. You might also invest in two things. These are kettlebells and dumbbells. The dumbbell we have known for a long time, and we know what to do with these. Whether to do bicep curls, work the triceps, back, chest, or various parts of the shoulders. But kettlebells, these things are amazing. And fortunately, there are hundreds of possibly thousands of exercises and videos online showing you how these things can make you very strong. All the exercises can be done at home. Follow these exercises and you will burn fat, build muscle, and increase fitness. What about your chest? Well, again, just search to find out how to build your chest up from the comfort of your own home and you'll find scores of articles and videos. The same goes for back exercises. There are many exercises you can do that require no weights. And then, with those kettlebells and dumbbells, there are many more exercises you can do. As with the chest, there are just too many exercises you can do for your back at home for us to mention them all. Google will take you there and you'll find pictures and videos that will help you get it right. We suggest if you follow the high intensity workout videos, then you follow their 5 or 6 day plan. If you don't watch those videos and create your own sessions, then just do different body parts each day. Remember that you don't have to prove anything to yourself and go all out. Go at 80% and make sure you have perfect form before you add more reps or increase the weight. In all, try and do 1 hour of these exercises a day. But if that's not possible, start with what you feel comfortable with and just build up to 1 hour. With these strength exercises covering all parts of your body, as well as one or two days of cardio, plus the change in your diet, we assure you that in six months you will look like a different person. And try to see it this way. Most of us spend one hour a day just wasting time. That time wasted could transform you, give you loads of confidence, and the best thing? Stave off sickness and make you live longer. As for the man we talked about at the start of the show, he lost 50 pounds in 6 months and he looked completely transformed. His advice is envision what you will look like in a few months and don't let that vision out of your mind. It's not always easy making the first move, but you'll find that once you start, you won't want to stop. You'll even feel bad for missing a day. Don't worry, everyone gets sidetracked at times, but when you do get going, you'll not only feel better physically, but you'll have more mental clarity. Exercise is as good for the mind as it is for the body. You'll notice a big difference in your overall wellness and ask yourself this. Is one hour a day of making yourself a bit tired worth the effort if you look better and feel better and are much healthier in general? 
Ask any woman who's had children and she'll probably tell you that pregnancy sucks. Morning sickness, stretch marks, sore ankles, and the absolute nightmare that is childbirth, which many women have described as the most excruciatingly painful experience in their life. Normally, if a man said to a pregnant woman, I know how you feel, she would probably rightfully laugh in his face. Unless, of course, that man was William Bennett, a 79-year-old man from Sheerness, Kent, over in the UK. By 1981, he'd experienced his 30th pregnancy. This is the story of the man who kept getting pregnant and the extremely strange condition that caused it. We know what you're probably thinking. 30 pregnancies would be utterly insane for a woman, let alone a man. How is this possible? These are all fair questions. Maybe your mind immediately jumps to Thomas Beatty, the transgender man who reached tabloid stardom in the Guinness Book of World Record fame for being the first public example of a pregnant man. Or for a more modern example, Hayden Cross, another transgender man from the UK who became the first legal male in the UK to give birth to a child in 2017. But what makes William Bennett's case feel particularly strange is the fact that he's not transgender, and even if he was, at age 79, he'd be decades beyond menopause. William Bennett's strange pregnancies had everything to do with his four daughters. Every time one of his daughters got pregnant, William would begin to exhibit the symptoms of pregnancy. Specifically, his belly would begin to swell up and remain in a swollen state until the pregnancy ended. This came as a shock to Mr. Bennett, because this hadn't occurred at all when his wife was pregnant with any of his four daughters. He didn't, however, miss any of his 30 grandchildren. The Bennett family was apparently breeding like rabbits and William was feeling all of it directly. And before you say that all of this sounds like an urban legend, these strange symptoms were corroborated by William Bennett's general practitioner, recorded only as Dr. Fitzgerald. According to her tests, during one particularly severe incident, where three of his daughters were pregnant at the same time, Bennett's abdomen bloated out by an incredible 30 inches. If you're having trouble picturing that, that's actually half an inch bigger than your standard NBA-approved basketball. He'd need to invest in pregnancy pants and some very loose-fitting shirts to live comfortably during that ordeal. While no doctor was ever able to diagnose the concrete medical reason behind what was physically causing William Bennett's stomach to swell, there was actually some medical precedent for the condition he was experiencing. You may have heard the term phantom pregnancy or sympathetic pregnancy thrown around before, or the more arcane medical term Quavad syndrome. While this typically occurs in more expectant fathers than grandfathers-to-be, and cases are rarely as severe and dramatic, cases of phantom pregnancy are actually a lot more common than you'd think. In 2007, researchers at St. George University in London carried out a study into 282 expectant fathers who were experiencing phantom pregnancies. These men had experiences that ran the gamut of pregnancy woes. Swollen stomachs, like William Bennett, cramps, sickness, mood swings, pregnancy cravings, depression, insomnia, fatigue, fainting, and back pain. In some studies, doctors have noticed subtle physical changes in the biological makeup of the men experiencing these phantom pregnancies. There were slight hormonal shifts in prolactin, testosterone, estradiol, and cortisol. Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology Dr. Amos Gruneberg also noted that hormone changes tend to kick in after the first trimester and persist until birth. While these dry scientific descriptions might make it seem like this experience isn't too bad, to actually suffer through this bizarre condition is kind of a nightmare. Here are some of the ways the men in the study described their extremely strange conditions firsthand. One man said, I was constantly hungry all the time and had an unstoppable craving for chicken kormas and papadoms. Even in the early early hours of the morning, I would get up and prepare myself one. It was strange, to say the least. And another one said, it seemed like my pain was worse. Her contractions were fairly strong, but she couldn't push, and as that was happening, my stomach pain was building up and up and getting worse and worse. Even though medical science had advanced significantly by 2007, scientists still couldn't find a concrete physical reason for these strange psychosomatic symptoms. There were also other commonalities. Symptoms would more often manifest early on in the pregnancy, often persist throughout the nine-month course, then dissipate after birth. Some doctors had theories about why this weird anomaly was popping up. One of the researchers, Dr. Arthur Brennan, said, These men were so attuned to their partners, they started to develop the same symptoms. Some people may perceive this as men trying to get in on the act, but far from attention-seeking, these symptoms are involuntary. Often the men haven't got a clue about what's happening to them. Brennan went on to declare, Doctors don't recognize Quavad syndrome. There's no medical diagnosis, yet this research proves that Quavad syndrome really exists. The results speak for themselves. Luckily, for people suffering from phantom pregnancies, they don't have to deal with any of pregnancy's unpleasant after-effects. 
There have been no reports of men suffering postnatal depression. This, however, doesn't mean that the experience doesn't have some scary psychological side effects. Some men have reported having extremely distressing dreams and night terrors. One man describing a dream where he was lying in bed, the ceiling caving in above him, and millions of spiders crawling through the hole. Some have also reported disrupted sleeping patterns and even sleepwalking. Though, to be fair, if you were suddenly mysteriously pregnant, you probably wouldn't sleep well either. Why William Bennett had such a severe case of phantom pregnancy if he actually did have the symptoms, or if he ever even existed at all, we may never truly know. Whether it was down to a particular cocktail of hormones or a really empathetic disposition is a detail lost to history. But one thing is for sure, if you're a man whose wife or girlfriend is trying for a baby, maybe invest in two pairs of pregnancy pants just in case. Thanks for watching this episode of the Infographic Show. If you want more pregnancy facts, why not check out what happens before you're born and and what happens when you're born. In the meantime, we'll be over here eating some pickles and ice cream. There are two very different stories when it comes to steroids. The first is one of hope. The other is one of overindulgence and addiction. There are types of steroids that can save your life. However, when steroids are taken in excess and without the approval of a medical professional, they can also lead to your death. Which type of steroid should you never put in your body? Let's find out. At a basic level, steroids are synthetically created hormones that the adrenal glands in your body produce normally. Hormones are chemical messengers that tell your cell which biological processes they should carry out. For example, the hormone insulin signals your cell to take in more sugar from your bloodstream and use it to create energy. The human body also uses hormones such as testosterone and estrogen to signal different physiological changes during someone's life. These hormones can also aid in the growth of muscles, which will come into play later. Corticosteroids are the steroids most often prescribed by doctors due to their anti-inflammatory properties. They have a number of applications and can aid in recovery of countless medical conditions. The other, more dangerous type of steroids are anabolic androgenic steroids. These are the steroids that bodybuilders and athletes use to enhance their muscle strength and performance. It's these types of steroids that can be dangerous if used incorrectly. First, let's understand why steroids, if used properly, can help you or even save your life. Again, remember that most steroids need to be prescribed by a doctor to ensure the right dosage and type of steroid is given. You're struggling to breathe. Every time you take in air, it feels like your windpipe has been sealed shut. You scramble for your inhaler and fumble it. The precious device falls to the ground. Your lungs feel like they're going to explode as you reach down to pick up the device. You stick the inhaler in your mouth and push down. A cool, moist mixture of air is forced down your throat. For a moment, you hold your breath and then, with a sigh of relief, you breathe out and you can now gulp down the much-needed air. Your chest heaves up and down as your lungs once again bring in oxygen and release CO2. People with asthma suffer from long-term chronic inflammation and swollen muscles in their airways. When the airway becomes inflamed, the body also produces extra mucus, all of which blocks the airway and causes difficulty breathing. It's the swollen muscles that the mixture of steroids and bronchodilators and an inhaler help to relieve. The anti-inflammatory effects of steroids allows the muscles to relax and the person to begin breathing normally again. When steroids bind to the membranes of muscle cells in the throat, they signal the cells to shrink in size through a series of biological processes. This causes the swelling in the throat to go down and allows the person to breathe normally again. It's absolutely terrifying for those several seconds that someone is having an asthma attack and can't breathe. Their body is literally choking them to death and depriving them of the oxygen they so desperately need. An asthma attack can become life-threatening without the aid of the anti-inflammatory signals the steroids and inhalers send to the muscle cells. This is just one way steroids can be used to save lives. Doctors can prescribe steroids for a number of different reasons. Many times, they're used to relieve uncomfortable conditions that can arise in the body but might not be life-threatening. However, without them, people would be in an incredible amount of pain and discomfort. So you're sitting at home when your eczema begins itching like crazy. The condition is caused by an overactive immune system along with environmental factors that affect the skin. As you scratch and scratch and try to relieve the discomfort, it feels like your skin is on fire. The swollen part of your body becomes so inflamed that you just want to cut off the entire body part and be done with it. Luckily, the doctor prescribed you steroids to help reduce the inflammation and return the skin to its normal state. The steroids can either be taken in pill form or by rubbing a cream on the infected area. If taken orally, the pills are broken down in the digestive tract and then diffused into the bloodstream, where they are carried around your body by the circulatory system. When they reach the inflamed site, the steroids bind to the muscle and skin cells and signal them to carry out the process to reduce inflammation. 
Similarly, when a cream containing steroids is applied directly to the body, they bind to the skin cells and suppress the immune response that's causing the irritation and inflammation. Although eczema is uncomfortable, there's another disease that is much more painful and even life-threatening that steroids can help with. For inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's and IBS, steroids can help reduce some of the most intense discomforts of someone's life. These diseases cause the gastrointestinal tract to become inflamed, resulting in truly nasty side effects. Medical professionals are not entirely sure what the exact cause of Crohn's or other inflammatory bowel diseases is, but the swelling in this region of the body is due to the fact that the immune system is attacking the cells, which causes irritation and swelling. Doctors think these conditions might be caused by a virus or a bacteria infecting the cells in the gastrointestinal tract, but no single pathogen has been identified as a culprit yet. In these situations, doctors will prescribe steroids that reduce the swelling in the intestines and bowels to allow waste to pass through the system more easily. If left untreated, the excretory system might become backed up with waste, which would eventually start to poison the body. In these circumstances, bowel inflammation can become life-threatening, and surgery must be conducted to remove the scarred tissue causing the blockage. Before this point, however, doctors will prescribe steroids to aid in reducing inflammation and get the swelling under control. When the steroids bind to the cells in the colon and the intestinal tissue, they suppress the immune system in the region, allowing the inflammation to go down and waste to flow out of the body. There are some side effects to taking steroids prescribed by doctors, such as an increase in appetite, mood changes, and difficulty sleeping. These are all a result of the chemical composition in your body being changed by the steroids and the process they trigger. Don't forget that steroids mimic hormones, which signal changes to occur in the cells of your body, and although steroids might be used for the anti-inflammatory properties, they also change the chemical levels in your body, which will inevitably affect multiple organs and tissues. This brings us to the really nasty things that steroids can do to you. You have probably heard that people who abuse steroids can have lower sperm count or suddenly explode into fits of rage. And although this may be true, there are some much, much worse side effects that result from steroid abuse. The type of steroids that are often misused are called anabolic androgenic steroids, which is also abbreviated as AAS. These are the types of steroids that people take to increase their metabolism and build larger muscles. AAS is typically a synthetic form of testosterone, but females and males produce testosterone naturally. It's one of the hormones in the body responsible for growth, and in males, testosterone signals the body to develop male characteristics during puberty. In women, testosterone also plays an important role in growth and development. However, it's present in much lower quantities in females than males. People have found that by using AAS to trick the body into thinking there is testosterone present, it speeds up the growth of muscles. This is by no means a healthy process, and although it can create the desired results of muscle growth, abusing anabolic androgenic steroids can have some serious consequences. So, what actually happens to your body if you take these types of steroids? Well, muscle mass will certainly increase, but everything else that will happen should make you think twice before pumping your body full of AAS. Performance-enhancing drugs such as anabolic androgenic steroids are banned in most sports and competitions. Each year, athletes who are caught using steroids are fined heavily and forced to forfeit their right to compete. Therefore, it seems crazy to use steroids as the risks far outweigh the gains, yet it still happens all the time. Imagine you're an athlete who's obsessed with gaining bigger muscle so that you can be stronger and faster than your competitors. You train hard but hit a plateau, so you decide to take steroids to enhance your performance. After every workout session, your muscle fibers are stretched or torn apart. Your body naturally repairs any damage, which results in more muscle mass developing. But if you can trick your body into thinking it's also growing at the same time, muscle creation will increase exponentially. You pump iron all day to break your muscles down, then gulp down an energy drink full of steroids. These steroids circulate around your body and attach to your muscle cells. They signal the cells to produce more proteins to aid in the repair and strengthening of your muscles. Simultaneously, the steroids trigger cell division, causing the body to create more muscle cells. These processes can create a hormone imbalance, which may cause your body to start developing characteristics that it shouldn't, while also affecting your brain chemistry. Neither the growth of the muscles nor the unpleasant side effects develop right away. It may take weeks for these things to happen to your body, but it's estimated that anabolic androgenic steroids increase strength by around 5 to 20 percent, which is why people abuse AAS. Each time you take steroids, the cells in your body ramp up protein synthesis. This is important for muscle growth but can also lead to the overdevelopment of certain male traits. This happens in both men and women who take anabolic androgenic steroids. Since your cells are working harder, they require more energy, which is why you experience an increase in appetite. The feeling of hunger is just your brain telling you that your body needs more nutrients to make more energy. 
Anabolic androgenic steroids also trigger the body to break down fat stores and use the fuel in them to increase muscle mass and promote growth. This causes body fat to decrease drastically in people who take steroids. The steroids also signal the body to create more red blood cells to aid in oxygen delivery around the body so more energy can be made. These might all seem like good things, but it's what comes next that should worry you. Anabolic and androgenic steroids contain a combination of different chemicals. It's the ratio between the anabolic chemicals and the androgenic chemicals that determines what the steroid actually does to your body. Anabolic refers to chemicals that signal and promote muscle growth, while androgenic signifies the chemicals that promote the development of male sex traits. A steroid needs to contain both these properties to work effectively. For example, a steroid that only contains anabolic chemicals will not allow muscles to grow at the desired rate due to the fact that the other hormones and proteins are needed to facilitate the process that can only be triggered by androgenic chemicals. The ratio of androgenic to anabolic steroids can also cause a certain negative reaction in the body to occur. Using steroids increases your blood pressure and heart rate as the body needs to circulate nutrients more quickly to fulfill the needs of the cells that are now producing more proteins and dividing more frequently. Unfortunately, both high blood pressure and heart rate can lead to heart disease or stroke. Therefore, the very thing the steroids are telling your body to do might also kill you. With a steroid that simulates testosterone, like with many anabolic androgenic steroids, there are some mental side effects as well. One of the byproducts of high levels of testosterone, especially in males, is that they can become aggressive and prone to mood swings. Again, this is due to an imbalance in chemical levels as a direct result of the steroid stimulating protein synthesis, among other cellular processes. The new proportions of biochemicals in the body affect the neural pathways and the composition of the chemicals in your brain. When these symptoms are taken to the extreme, it can cause you to lose control of rational thought and lash out in aggressive ways. This has come to be known as roid rage. There also seems to be a correlation between steroid use and body image disorders. The chemical imbalance caused by anabolic androgenic steroids might distort your view of your own body and push you to work out more to lose fat you don't have and gain more muscle. This is a vicious cycle because if your brain is telling you that you don't look good and that your body should be more muscular, you'll likely take more steroids in order to reach an unobtainable body image. This leads to steroid abuse and is relatively common for people who use AAS without consulting their doctor. In these circumstances, steroids are not just messing with your biochemical processes, they have also become an addictive drug. Anabolic androgenic steroids themselves might not be classified as addictive, but what they do to your brain chemistry can make you crave them as if they were a drug you can't get enough of. While you gain muscle and the biochemical processes in your body are altered due to the steroids, other dangerous side effects are occurring. The liver filters blood while also balancing nutrients and metabolizing certain chemicals, such as the complex molecules found in steroids. When you take steroids, it forces your liver to work overtime to break down the chemicals in the drugs and the byproducts generated by the increased levels of protein synthesis happening around your body. Protein synthesis, like most cellular processes, generates waste, which also needs to be broken down by the liver. What this means is that steroids overwork the liver. People who abuse steroids never allow their liver to rest or recover, which leads to complications or liver failure later on. This is when steroids become life-threatening. It doesn't really matter if anabolic androgenic steroids give you larger muscles if your liver fails and you die. There are also other more noticeable side effects of taking anabolic androgenic steroids. Females might start growing hair on their faces where they normally wouldn't. Their voice might deepen while their breast size decreases. Other changes such as an enlarged clitoris and irregular menstrual cycle also occur. All of these side effects are a direct result of the chemical and hormone imbalances that happen within the body as a result of taking anabolic androgenic steroids. For males, there are some much more strange physical side effects. Abuse of anabolic androgenic steroids can cause gynecomastia. This is a condition in males where the breast gland tissue increases due to an imbalance in the hormones estrogen and testosterone. When this happens, breasts grow in size. Gynecomastia usually affects both breasts but sometimes only causes one to grow extra tissue. Either way, this condition does not provide more upper body strength and is therefore not the desired result of most people using steroids. Although most anabolic androgenic steroids mimic the hormone testosterone in some way, they are not always a perfect substitute. In fact, abuse of steroids can actually lead to hypogonadism, which is a condition that causes the testes in males and ovaries in females to stop or produce very small amounts of sex hormones such as estrogen and testosterone. When this happens in males, it can cause the testicles to shrink. In both sexes, it can render the person infertile. Again, this is a perfect example of how steroids can produce big muscles but with consequences. 
is risking the ability to have future offspring worth increasing your muscle mass and becoming stronger for a brief period of time? For some, it is, but for many younger athletes who start taking steroids, they don't know the risks or consequences these drugs have on their bodies later in life. Some of the most severe consequences of using anabolic androgenic steroids are the long-term health effects they have. In order to build bigger muscles, your body needs to increase hemoglobin production along with a number of red blood cells to deliver more oxygen to your cells. This oxygen is then used to create different proteins and energy. However, increased levels of blood cells and hemoglobin can thicken your blood and increase your chances of having a heart attack even after you stop taking the steroids. Anabolic androgenic steroids are also known to have long-term effects on your cholesterol levels. Research shows that these steroids can reduce your HDL cholesterol while raising your LDL cholesterol. Basically, it increases bad cholesterol overall throughout the body. Again, this has nasty consequences for your heart and can lead to several other complications. The use of steroids to increase muscle size and strength is just not a healthy alternative to working out and eating a well-balanced diet. Athletes and bodybuilders will take steroids to gain an advantage over their competition, but at a great cost to their bodies. If you take anabolic androgenic steroids, there's a good chance you'll not only experience unintended physical side effects, but your brain, heart, and liver will suffer as well. The short-term gains are never worth the long-term damage that anabolic androgenic steroids can cause. That's why they should only be taken when prescribed by medical professionals and in specific circumstances. The Male Body What a wonder of engineering it is! It contains half the genetic information needed to reproduce and continue civilization. It can produce milk but has useless nipples, and it has the uncanny ability to get an erection at the absolute worst of times. Prepare to be fascinated. Number 50. Male fetuses actually get erections while they're in the womb, and while no one can be absolutely sure why it happens, some reports state it's just to keep the thing healthy. Number 49. Men also have a G-spot. You can find it by pressing on your prostate. For reference, that's about 2 inches from the entrance of your anus. Number 48. Men over 50 might start growing breasts. This is due to the anomalous hormone production that happens as we age. Number 47. It differs from man to man, but in general, a healthy guy will ejaculate 40 million sperm in one go. Still, a man could produce anything up to 200 million sperm each time. You heard that right, that's more people than live in most countries. Number 46. According to one study that was published in the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the member of an American male had an average size of 5.1 to 5.5 inches when fully erect. The study didn't mention how it got its volunteers stimulated in order to measure them at their fullest, but it did confirm the sizes were professionally measured, not self-reported, so there was no room for the men to lie. Number 45. Nationality doesn't impact the size of your member. The conclusion in one study consisted of over 15,000 men from across the world was that the average penis size was 5.17 inches. Genetic factors have a much bigger influence according to a paper by the Nature Journal, but does size even matter? Number 44. Studies have shown that if it's a one-night thing, women on average like a larger phallus with research showing that they prefer a penis around 6.3 inches in length and 4.8 inches around, which as you know is larger than the average. But did size correlate with pleasure? We also looked at anecdotal accounts from women and as you'd expect every woman had her unique take on the penis. The consensus was that there had to be a balance, not too long and not too short, with one woman saying, he had these moves that compensated for his size. Small penises aren't bad at all, if the man knows how to use it. Ok, one last thing about your precious product down there. Number 43. We've all heard about growers versus showers, but is there any truth to it? A study by Healthline showed that 26% of men are growers, with the rest being showers. This is because of a person-to-person -person difference in how much collagen there is in the penis, which is genetic. The amount of collagen might mean you're a grower or a shower. The amount of blood flow may also make a difference. What's hilarious is that at the bottom of the article, Healthline explained how men can measure their penis. From the base of the shaft, of course. But they also gave this important bit of advice. Just don't do it in public. Now a special mention not to the penis, but to the bulge. Number 42. Throughout history, there's been a preference for a smaller penis, but in cultures, a big one was a sign of greater manhood. For example, in Norse mythology, there is a proud reference to a man whose bratwurst is almost as big as a horse's. Alright, now for some fast fire facts. Number 41. Men typically have darker hair than women, with one reason being their higher levels of melanin. Number 40. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine said around 40% of men are chronic snorers, but only 24% of women habitually make that noise from hell. Number 39. 
You might have heard that if he has a large feet, then his member will be large too, but this is just another myth in a long list of myths when it comes to the penis. Number 38. Semen is not just a load of sperm. According to one scientist's website, it also contains citric acid, free amino acids, fructose, enzymes, phosphorocholine, prostaglandin, potassium, and zinc. Number 37. Men tend to have a faster metabolism. Due to the fact that they usually have more muscle than women, that means that even if they're just sitting around, they'll be burning more calories. But are men's and women's brains different? Number 36. If you say that men and women have different brains, you run the risk of being accused of neurosexism. We don't want that to happen to us, but we did read some scientific articles that told us that some parts of the brain might be different in the sexes. Some research says because of the different brain structures, men might be better on average at completing spatial and motor tasks. At the same time, though, women might be better at learning languages and expressing emotions. Remember, though, not all scientists agree on this. Number 35. On average, a man might have three to five erections every night while he's sleeping, and some of the erections might last as long as 30 minutes. This might have nothing to do with a wet dream or the fact that he's just cozied up closer to his lover. It's a natural phenomenon that scientists call nocturnal penile tumescence. We imagine some of you guys out there have on occasions woken up in the morning and felt something very stiff down there. Or perhaps your girlfriend has stood back in shock and said, oh dear, whatever could that be in your pajama pocket? Morning wood is absolutely normal. The reason it happens down there is something called the parasympathetic nervous system. It can be stimulated at night since it doesn't switch off during sleep. But why it happens during the night is something science isn't so sure about. Number 34. If you don't get any stiffies throughout the night, there might be a problem. In fact, one study said 52% of grown men experience some kind of erectile dysfunction, with it happening more when men pass the age of 40. Still, a study published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine said 26% of men under 40 also experience erectile dysfunction. The main culprits are booze and drugs in the short term, but in the longer term, diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, obesity, depression, and anxiety can all affect the ability to make the man stand to attention and stay that way for a useful amount of time. Number 33. In a study titled Prevalence of Pubic Hair Grooming-Related Injuries, it was said that 25% of groomers reported an injury, but this study also included female groomers. How bad can the injury be? Number 32. The absolute worst thing we could find related to cutting and shaving injuries down there was something called Fournier gangrene. Simply put, if there really was hell in this world, then this disease would be Satan's proudest achievement. It's described as a necrotic infection of the scrotum or catastrophic gangrene of the penis, and in some cases, it's happened when someone has nicked their scrotum while grooming. Thankfully, it is very rare. Amen to that. Number 31. A gastroenterologist working at Princeton named Anish Sheth wrote an entire book on poo, from what colors mean to how solid they are. He also wrote about something he called pooforia, which is when a person has an orgasm while dropping the kids off at a pool. He said for some people it can be like having a religious experience due to it feeling so good. He said that this kind of stool high is related to the vagus nerve being stimulated, adding the stool high is relatively safe, but can become an addiction for some. Number 30. Did you know that men have thicker skin than women? They do, and it's because of testosterone. In fact, one study showed that on average men had 10 to 20% thicker skin. This can also be good news to some vain men because this is one reason why many healthy men don't age as fast as women. How you age, though, is obviously partly determined by your genes and more importantly all the environmental factors the skin experiences over the years. Alright, now we'll settle that argument between you and your partner, if you're in a male-female relationship, that is. Number 29. Have you ever been in a room with someone of the opposite sex and one of you is arguing that it's too warm or too cold, but you are wearing similar types of clothes? One reason for that is that men generally are warmer than women. One doctor explained it like this, since women have a lower metabolic rate, they tend to produce less heat than men do, which makes them feel colder. Sometimes the difference is quite startling, with one health website writing, some studies have shown that while men feel comfortable in rooms with a thermostat set to 72 degrees, women tend to feel comfortable in rooms with a thermostat set to 77. Now we'll ask the question, what on earth is that thing that some people call man flu? Number 28. According to an article in the British Medical Journey, some scientists believe that man flu is nothing but man whining. The paper said despite the universally high incident and prevalence of viral respiratory illness, no scientific review has examined whether the term man flu is appropriately defined or just ingrained pejorative term with no scientific basis. It's a long paper, but the upshot was that a man's antibody response to the flu could be inferior to a woman's. The paper also highlighted the fact that more men end up in the hospital with the flu and their bout of the sickness on average lasts longer. This is ongoing research, but there is a possibility that the man is not a wimp and might actually be experiencing a higher level of suffering. 
Now let's talk about man nips. Number 27. Men in theory can produce milk. That's because their bodies make the hormone oxytocin and prolactin which are responsible for milk production. Men also have milk ducts, so milk can in theory come out. That means that given the right circumstances a man could breastfeed. In fact, this is something recorded throughout history. Even the Greek philosopher named Aristotle said men could produce milk if they squeezed their breasts enough. Later in the 19th century, a book called Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine talked about some real-life cases of men giving their own milk to babies, although these cases are not verified. It could, as we say, happen in theory, but a man's hormone levels would have to be through the roof. Number 26. You might also not know that for a time, young males might have female-looking breasts. A researcher interviewed by the Scientific American said, actually, a significant number of boys around the age of puberty do develop breasts, so the tissue is there, but it regresses. It's a condition called gynecomastia and is related to a hormone imbalance. The good news is that things usually balance and the boy breasts go. That's not always the case, though. A man named Merle Yost wrote a book about growing up with breasts where he recounted his years of bullying at school and his final jump to get breast reduction surgery at the age of 33. Number 25. In general, men have less body fat than women. It's thought the reason for women having more body fat is an evolutionary adaptation related to them being able to have children. Number 24. A paper published in the U.S. National Institutes of Health had this to say about male and female natural differences. The results showed that the male teeth were consistently larger than the female teeth. But why? Number 23. It's not always the case, but it's thought that it has something to do with men having more dentine in the crowns of their teeth. Dentine is one of the tissues that make up a tooth. The other parts are the enamel, cementum, and pulp. Now, let's try and settle that old age debate on pain thresholds. Do men feel more pain than women? Number 22. You might have heard this before, with people telling you that women have a higher threshold of pain due to the fact that she's evolved to go through childbirth. The thing is, though, pain is subjective, so it's still hard to measure. In studies where men and women have been subjected to the same pain stimuli, it seems men had a higher pain threshold. The study is actually more complicated as it does take into account that culturally men are expected to not express pain. Number 21. You might also have heard that men have fewer ribs than women. That is utter balderdash, although some people might not have the standard 12 pairs of ribs. Number 20. In some studies, it's written that women generally find men with high testosterone levels more attractive. The good news for all you single guys out there is that single men tend to have higher levels than men who are already with a partner. Number 19. A man's testosterone levels might go up and down within a day, but some men do have higher levels in general. There's also something called irritable male syndrome, which could account for men becoming grumpier in old age because their testosterone levels drop. But as you'll now see, men can get very old and still do the business in the bed. Number 18. There's no age limit for men being able to produce sperm and make a baby. In 2010, it was reported that a guy in India named Ramajit Raghav just had a kid. He was 94. He didn't give up either, having another child just two years later. When asked about his secret, he told the British media, I've been a vegetarian all my life, and I credit my stamina and virility to the diet of vegetables and grains. Being a vegetarian is the secret to my strength and good health. He died in 2020, aged 104. Number 17. Still, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine says male sperm is of a higher quality while men are under the age of 40. In fact, sperm donors are usually asked to be under that age. Number 16. This is one reason why when there's an age gap in a male-to-female relationship, the older person is more often the man. Sure, there are lots of other things to take into account, such as the woman liking a settled-down man who is more likely to be faithful, have money, etc. But one simple fact is some men like younger women because a younger woman from an evolutionary perspective can still procreate. Number 15. Going bald might be some men's worst nightmare, but is it really that bad? Many studies have shown that women like bald men. Trust us, when it comes to being attractive, there are many things that come before your hair. Plus, if you're so insecure and lacking in confidence, well, she might think you're too vain or too weak. In one study, it showed 44% of women were attracted to bald men, but those women were aged 35 to 44. Just 19% of women aged 18 to 24 liked bald guys. Some studies have shown that some women perceive bald men as being more dominant, more masculine, and more successful. Number 14. Studies have shown half of all men will show some amount of male pattern baldness by the time they're 50. Usually it's down to genetics and is related to sex hormones called androgens. Number 13. As we said, this usually starts happening as a man matures, but there are some cases of teenagers going bald naturally. The Guardian talked to a guy named Sam Wolfson. He said he was 16 when his hair started thinning, and then by the time he was in his early 20s, he had only some wispy fuzz on top and two bushes at the sides. That's a bit sad, so let's talk about orgasms again. 
Number 12. The male orgasm is different from a woman's. Guys shoot their load and it seems after that someone has taken all the air out of them. They're like a sex doll that's just been burst. Women, though, have longer orgasms and they're often ready to go again right away. Teen males tend to have more forceful ejaculations, so it's in these years when a guy might fire someplace where he never thought he could reach. What usually comes out is 2 to 5 cubic centimeters of sperm. That's enough to fill a teaspoon at 5 cc's. As for how much in one sitting, it depends on many things such as genetics, mood, prior absence from ejaculating, lifestyle, and general health. In terms of how many rounds men can go, young folks could possibly squeeze out 5 sessions, but older people would likely not go that far. Number 11. With the male orgasm, there's something often called the point of no return. This is called ejaculatory inevitability, and it means the semen's already started making its way to the urethra and is about to experience liftoff. At this point, there will be a series of contractions of the penile muscles in the location of the base of the anus, the pelvis might also start the thrust. Those nerves that have caused the contraction send messages to the brain and everything feels good. Number 10. Before all that happens, a man will need to be aroused. Messages are sent from his spinal cord and this makes his member stiffen. During this period, he might also let out some liquid from his urethra. This is called pre-ejaculatory fluid and it's there to affect the pH balance in the urethra. This helps the survival of the sperm to come, but it doesn't contain sperm itself. Once the job is done, the male goes through what scientists call a refractory period. It's basically downtime before he's ready to go again. In a young man, it could be just 10 minutes, but in an older guy, it'll usually be hours. Number 9. Your sperm needs your semen, remember the whole bundle, to get to the egg. Without the rest of the ingredients, it wouldn't get very far at all. But if sperm does take off, it can live inside the woman for up to around 5 days. If it lands somewhere it isn't intended, well, it can only live for a few minutes. Number 8. If you're wondering if you could take a look at sperm, you can't. It's about 1 500th of an inch long, which is around 10,000 times smaller than the egg it wants to meet. Under a microscope, the sperm meeting the egg looks like a tiny spacecraft landing on a vast planet. Number 7. When a woman is ovulating, men can actually pick up on that just by smelling her. Ovulation is when a woman's egg is matured and so has been sent off by the ovary and down the fallopian tubes where it can wait for one of those lucky sperms to make contact. Number 6. Okay, so what would you think if you read this start to the research paper? Individuals and some species prefer mates carrying dissimilar genes at the major histocompatibility complex MHC, which may function to increase the MHC or overall heterozygosity of progeny. Yep, that's a bit of a mouthful. What the paper is saying is that women can detect dissimilar genes in men, so by choosing them, their offspring might be healthier. We bet you never thought about that as you moved your stool in the pub closer to a woman. But it gets even more complex. Number 5. Talking to CNN, a scientist said that the egg itself might be able to attract the right kind of sperm. He said human eggs release chemicals called chemoattractants, which leave a sort of chemical breadcrumb trail that sperm use to find unfertilized eggs. Now let's move away from sperm. Number 4. Did you know that guys in general see fewer shades of color? We'll let a scientist explain why. She said this is because retinal cones are on the X chromosome, which men only have one of. Men, however, have more testosterone in their visual cortexes, meaning they sense brightness better than women. Number 3. Something you probably thought we would have talked about already is the male nipple. What's the point of it? The reason men have nipples is that when the embryo is forming, males and females are pretty much the same. They share the same blueprint, which is the reason all humans look alike in terms of basic structure. But after around 7 weeks of gestation, the gene of the Y chromosome makes some changes and the testes start to form. It's then that that little bundle of blood starts producing testosterone, but that doesn't mean the nipples have to go. What would be the point in losing them? They aren't doing anyone any harm. Number 2. Another thing men might not need is that thing we call foreskin. After all, in some cultures, they get rid of it. Is that the right thing to do? In a paper called Vital or Vestigial, the foreskin has its fans and foes. The writer cites some scientists who have called the foreskin the floppy disk of the male anatomy, meaning it is no longer needed. If you think about it, men have very long time ago might have wanted to walk around with the penis hanging out, and that can mean some damage being caused to this Jonah Hill. This is really bad news in evolutionary terms because the only real reason we're here is to make other people, so the foreskin acted as a protective shield. It could also act as a lubricant back then and now. Number 1. This is personal. When the writer was a kid, he kept hearing boys talk about their balls dropping, as if one day those things just went plop and fell down. It never happened, but his balls looked fine as they were. Still, he was concerned. For many kids waiting for their balls to drop, it can be quite worrying if nothing seems to be happening. Actually, there is no sudden drop at all when the child is already grown. Balls don't really drop. They are tight to the body for sure when men are younger, and then when a boy matures and he produces more testosterone, his balls get larger, and it might seem like they are lower at that point. 
You're born with it and it'll stay with you for the rest of your life. You look at it every day and you never get bored of it. It gives you intense pain and gives you immense pleasure. Sometimes when you look in the mirror, you're reminded that it doesn't last forever. You go on Instagram and you compare it with other ones, sometimes hoping you can change it, obscure it, give it a bit of a makeover. But whatever your body looks like, it's a marvel of engineering. It's actually almost difficult to comprehend. In the words of Shakespeare, the human body is unlimited in thinking, admirable in his shape and movement, angelic in action, godlike. Today, you're going to see just how your body is infinitely amazing. You might have heard that women are stronger than men when it comes to surviving disease and also in many other ways. But when it comes to brute force, men on average win hands down. But do you know why that is? It's said that on average, men's upper bodies have much more muscle mass than the average woman, as much as 75% more. Men have stronger lower body strength too. They grip harder, they throw harder, they punch harder, and they run faster. And we'll say this one last time, on average. We've all just accepted this as a fact of life. But what we don't ask is why? Why shouldn't women have evolved to be just as strong or stronger than men? Well, scientists say men evolved to fight, men are designed for combat. In some of the natural world, females are very often bigger than males, but that's because they're designed to carry lots of eggs. It's different for land-dwelling vertebrates, which includes humans. Those males evolved to be bigger due to competition with other males regarding finding a female to procreate with. All this fighting over females in the past has led to men being more violent overall. Men are responsible for something like 80% of violent crimes, while the prison population, at least in the US, is made up of 93.2% of men as of April 2021. Are men just naturally violent? It's like this, according to one scientist. Men are not more violent because they're stronger, but stronger because they've needed to be more violent over evolutionary history, which has shaped male psychology in all sorts of ways. So never mind how puny you are, you've been designed to be a fighting machine. But what about the brain? Do men have a different kind of brain? Ok, so we're walking on thin ice even bringing that up. We don't want to offend anyone, so we'll remind you not to shoot the messenger. If you're a scientist and you say that men and women's brains are fundamentally different, you might be accused of neurosexism. But quite a few studies have shown that men's brains work better at completing spatial and motor tasks. They might look at a puzzle and have to think about how a shape can be manipulated to fit it in the right hole. And according to those studies, men will on average be better than women at this. Still, other scientists have called this a myth and indeed a kind of neurosexism. So the jury is still out on that one. One thing we do know for sure is men's brains are bigger, but that doesn't have any effect on intelligence. Men might have bigger parts of the brain for a reason, but again, this is still a controversial issue. Some studies have found that the parts of the men's brains are bigger which are associated with the survival instinct and reacting to stimuli. Women might have bigger parts of the brain that are related to language and emotion. Ok, so now we think we should get down to business and talk about that taboo subject of the male phallus, the penis as your doctor will refer to it. It's a pretty amazing thing to behold, even if it sometimes gets in the way of having a quiet life. First of all, it's a hard worker. It even does the night shift. Did you know that the average man will get 3-5 to five erections during the night, often lasting as long as 30 minutes? What's up with that? It's not as if you need it in your sleep. The medical term for this phenomenon is nocturnal penile tumescence, something we imagine you'd never say to your partner after she asks what that pressure is on her leg. Don't worry darling, it's just nocturnal penile tumescence. Basically, you get wood when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated. Sights, touch, memories, even sounds make this happen. Arteries in your pecker dilate, blood flows in and hey presto you got lift off. The penis is not a muscle by the way, it's been described as more like a sponge that gets bigger when it fills with blood. When you're sleeping, much of your body might slow down, but the parasympathetic nervous system is still switched on. You aren't getting a stiffy because of dreams and because of that leg of your lover. It's just the fact that your nervous system is functioning well. Why it happens other than that is still a mystery to science. One scientist said nighttime erections serve no purpose whatsoever and are merely a byproduct of the nervous system. So don't worry about it if every time you wake up you feel like you have a Toblerone stuffed into your underwear. Ok, so now to the question you all want answered. Is there such thing as a grower and a shower? Do some men walk around with great big dongs while others walk around with a lip balm in their pants? Well, just remember that a lip balm can almost double in size with a bit of rubbing. There are such things as growers and studies have proven it. If you have a lip balm kind of John Thomas, it's very likely you'll grow a lot more than the guy with a flaccid Toblerone. One study showed that out of 2,770 men with small flaccid willies, their growth was 86% when fully erect. 
Meanwhile, the bigger boys only showed a growth of 47%. Basically, things even out when men get down to business. As the saying goes, don't judge a book by its cover. Scientists say you cannot assess the size of a man's wiener until you see it in all its glory. Some studies have shown that about 80% of men are growers and the rest are showers. Sticking with subjects that make people blush, you might not know that men have a G-spot. Yep, just tunnel about two inches into the rectum and you'll find it there. It's at a place called the perineum between the scrotum and the anus, and with a bit of pressure, not too much, it can be activated. It might also be stimulated when you're taking a poo, giving you the feeling of pooforia. There are cases of men having what's been called defecation-induced orgasms. Dropping the kids off at the pool can be ecstatic, but usually they'll have to be at least one very big kid. You also might not know that men can produce milk and so can breastfeed. Yeah, that's true. Although the man might have to take some hormonal drugs. In 2002, there was a guy in Sri Lanka who fed his two babies because his wife was dying. He stepped in and saved the day. It usually doesn't happen without any drugs. Although certain things can happen in the male body that makes it produce more of the hormone prolactin. One of those things is starvation. When women are pregnant, the levels of prolactin in your body increases, but sometimes it does in men too. Although that's an anomaly, not an evolutionary requirement in nature. Due to hormones, men tend to stink a lot more than women. On the other hand, women are better at picking up the scents. According to science, the smell of a man gives women a better idea of who they might be mating with. It's said women find men with high testosterone more attractive and they can sense this with their olfactory sense. Research has shown that single men tend to have higher testosterone levels than men with partners, which makes sense in evolutionary terms. Ok, on to something new. Something that might stop men and women arguing about turning up or down the heating in the house. Did you know that men generally feel a little bit warmer than women? You probably do know that, because there's no doubt you've been in a situation where she's cold and you're not. There's a simple reason for this other than what you're wearing. Men generally have more muscle mass and because of that they burn more calories to fuel those muscles. This creates heat, and when heat evaporates it warms the skin. As one doctor puts it, men have their own little heaters. Studies shown that women tend to feel the most comfortable in a room that's slightly hotter than a room men feel the most comfortable in. So don't argue, just accept you're different in this respect. And when it comes to skin, men's skin is anywhere from 20 to 30% thicker than the skin of a woman. Men also tend to have firmer skin which becomes more apparent in older age. This is why women usually get wrinkles before men, and so men often look younger than women as they age. Sorry women. As one scientist put it, female skin thinning occurs at a significant pace after menopause. Hence, signs of skin aging in older women are generally more pronounced as compared to men in the same age group. Still, there are many factors such as work, stress, and how many days you've been under the sun trying to get a tan or grow some rice. Talking about later in life, men can actually get something that's not unlike PMS. It's called irritable male syndrome, and it usually happens when a man ages and his testosterone levels drop. It might happen at any time in life since testosterone levels do change in men for various reasons. They might suddenly drop and then they might increase, even within one day. When this happens, men might experience fatigue, depression, low self-esteem, anger, anxiety, and moodiness. When it does happen in older age and the levels seem to drop for good, that's called male menopause. Still, with some men they have a gift that keeps on giving. They can have children at a very late age, even if they might not be the bull on the springs they used to be. In 2010, a guy in India named Mr. Ramajit Raghav had cause to celebrate. He had a child. The strange thing is, he was 94. And get this, he had another child two years later. It's actually not uncommon for men to have kids when they're still in their winter years. The age-defying rubber legs lead singer of the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, had his eighth kid when he was 73. A man might have less chance of having a kid at an older age, but he can still produce testosterone and sperm cells even though he might be walking around with a Zimmer frame. Still, as he approaches those winter years, there will be some changes. He might not produce as much sperm as he did before and those sperm might not be as good at swimming as they used to be. It's usually in the 40s that the quality of sperm takes a hit. Older men might also produce sperm that can lead to abnormalities in the child. No man likes losing his hair, but it's a fact of life that many do. Word on the street is bald men tend to be more sexual due to what some people have said is the increase in testosterone. But is this a myth or is it true? Firstly, don't worry baldies, when it comes to attraction studies have shown that there are many more things women think about than the mass of hair on a man's head. Some studies have even shown that bald men are seen as more masculine and attractive to women, but that's debatable. Jason Statham's bald head isn't exactly comparable to a man who has a very unsuccessful comb over. 
Studies have shown that women tend to be attracted to guys that have shaved all their hair off rather than guys that let hanging curtains decorate their head. As for baldness being related to virility, it's a complex matter. Castrated men who have hardly any testosterone can still have hair, while guys with hardly any hair might have low testosterone levels. Genes are what make their hair fall out, not testosterone. In conclusion, if you're bald, it's your mom and pop's fault, not the fact that you're a super sexual being. What about the Adam's apple? Why do men tend to get bigger ones? The part of the body is made of cartilage and it gets bigger when you hit puberty. Men usually have a larger larynx, an Adam's apple, and that's why they usually have deeper voices. But with both men and women, how large those things grow is down to hormones. Hence, some voices are deeper than others in both men and women. As for why men tend to grow bigger voice boxes in Adam's apples, some scientists say they developed this deeper voice to attract the opposite sex and give off more threatening sound to male rivals. The female body is full of mysteries. From having a self-cleaning reproductive system to using more of the brain when making decisions, women have men beat in a number of unique ways. You're about to learn things that will amaze you, shock you, and gross you out. Number 50. On average, men might be stronger than women, but female muscles are definitely more resilient. Research has shown that muscles in the female body not only stay stronger for longer compared to men, but they can also recover from damage more rapidly. Women also don't tire quite as fast as men, meaning that they can go harder for longer. Basically, the female body evolved to be a high-endurance machine capable of doing incredible things. Number 49. Not only do women's muscles last longer than males, but they tend to live longer as well. This is because their bodies are built to withstand extreme trauma from childbirth and protecting their young. On average, women live between 5 to 6 years longer than men. Some scientists think this is because they take better care of their bodies and typically choose healthier lifestyles. However, women have also evolved to be extremely tough, as a large number of healthy, strong females is vital to the survival of the species. But lifestyle isn't the only factor that contributes to female longevity. There is something even crazier about the female body that gives them a higher life expectancy. Number 48. The female immune system is a force to be reckoned with. Studies show that the female immune system is more powerful than their male equivalent. One reason for this might be because they need to protect a developing fetus for nine months before giving birth. Having a strong immune system that's able to destroy pathogens before they can harm the baby is essential, although females have a higher rate of autoimmune diseases, which might also be linked to their active immune systems. There is a surprising way that females can boost their immune system even more, and it has to do with sex. Number 47. Recent studies have found that female immune systems can increase in efficiency if they have more sex. It was uncovered that women who have sex two to three times a week have 30% more IgA antibodies in their blood than people who did not have sex. IgA antibodies are one of the first lines of defense against foreign invaders and can be found in the mucus lining of the nose and airways. So, sex can give additional protection to the body, meaning the carnal act has other benefits besides just feeling good. And speaking of sex, the female body has an organ that's sole function is to provide pleasure. Number 46. The clitoris has one purpose and one purpose only, to provide the female with sexual satisfaction. There is no other organ in males or females that can claim the honor of only functioning as a pleasure center. Number 45. The clitoris and penis are analogous structures. This is not super surprising when you think about it, since we all start off as a single cell and then develop more or less in the same way. However, if a fetus contains the instructions to become female, the genitalia cells will differentiate into a clitoris. Conversely, those same cells will become a penis if the fetus is programmed to become a male. Now, we're going to stick with the clitoris for a little while as it's an incredible organ. Number 44. The clitoris continues to grow throughout a female's life. By the time a woman reaches menopause, her clitoris is around three to four times larger than when she started puberty. This is fascinating because since the clitoris is responsible for pleasure, some scientists have hypothesized that a larger clitoris might play a role in more orgasms or at least more sexual satisfaction in mature women. The thought is that the larger the clitoris, the easier it is to stimulate. Number 43. And speaking of stimulation, around 75% of women report that it is the stimulation of the clitoris that makes them orgasm, not the intercourse itself. Let's step away from the female reproductive system for the moment and focus on another pleasure center of the body. Number 42. Some women have reported that they're able to achieve orgasms just from the stimulation of their nipples. A study published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine found that when the nipples are played with, the genital sensory cortex part of the brain becomes excited. This is the same region of the brain that's known to become active when a female is sexually satisfied through the clitoris or vagina. The research suggests that the nipples should not be neglected during sexy time 
as they can provide women with a significant amount of pleasure. Number 41. What's even crazier is that the part of the brain which is aroused during sex and sexual stimulation can also be aroused when a female thinks about food. This is especially true when they have cravings connected to their menstrual cycles or pregnancy. It's funny to think about how the stimulation a partner gives a female can be replaced with some chocolate or a juicy steak. It begs the question if women really need men at all. Number 40. One breast is always larger than the other. Normally, the size difference is barely noticeable, but every female has a slight difference in size between their two boobs. There doesn't seem to be a pattern into which breast is bigger, but on average, the left breast usually is larger than the right. The size discrepancy varies from female to female, but it's improbable that a female will have two breasts of identical size and shape. What makes someone biologically female? The answer to this question may be more complicated than you realize. Number 39. A main indicator of whether someone is biologically female is their sex chromosomes. There are two different sex chromosomes, X and Y. Females have two X chromosomes, while males have an X and a Y chromosome. However, it's possible for a female to also have an X and a Y chromosome. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, half of the resulting cell's chromosomes come from a mom and half from the dad. If dad passes on a Y chromosome, the baby will be biologically male unless there is a missing section of the transferred Y chromosome, known as the SRY gene. This is the portion of the DNA responsible for developing male traits such as the penis. If the SRY gene is missing or damaged on the Y chromosome, the cells will revert to their default setting creating a female. When the SRY gene is turned off, testosterone is not released and the amount needed to cause the cells to differentiate into a male body. This makes it possible for a female to have XY sex chromosomes. Circadian rhythms are what help our bodies regulate its day-to-day -day processes, but the female body has a surprisingly long cycle. Number 38. Women tend to go to bed and wake up earlier than men. There's a biological reason for this. The female circadian rhythm tends to be slightly faster than males. The biological day for a female is around 6 minutes shorter than for males, which is why they tend to go to sleep and wake up earlier. There doesn't seem to be much benefit to this, but it might explain why more women report having insomnia than men. Over time, this discrepancy between a female's inner clock and the 24-hour day can really start to affect them negatively. Some women who have circadian rhythms that run extra fast struggle to stay awake and focus throughout the day because their body is telling them to go to sleep even if the sun is up. This can also lead to restless nights and sleep deprivation. There's no doubt women are strong, yet they cry more often than males do. This is not because they are more emotional but because of the size of their tear ducts. Number 37. Adult women cry about five times more a month than men do. Women's tear glands are actually anatomically different than men's. They tend to be larger and have a different biochemical makeup, which leads to females crying more often than males. Also, women produce around 50% more prolactin in their bodies than males do, which is a hormone that regulates lactation. This molecule also plays a role in the production of tears. It is the higher levels of prolactin and the biological differences in their tear ducts that are probably responsible for females crying more often than males. Not that they're more emotional. In fact, many studies suggest females are more level-headed than men and are able to cope with emotional stress better. The vagina is a surprisingly hostile place, yet there are creatures living in there even though it's acidic. Number 36. The pH level in the vagina is around 4.5, which makes the vaginal environment around the same acidity as wine and coffee. This is not the ideal environment for many creatures, which is one of the defense mechanisms the vagina has against foreign invaders. However, there are a plethora of microbes that call the vagina home. Number 35. A group of acid-producing bacteria called lactobacillus find the vagina a great place to live. In fact, they even help maintain high levels of acidity so they can thrive. This in turn keeps other bacteria that can cause yeast and other types of infections away. Without a vaginal microbiome, a female's reproductive system would be much more prone to diseases caused by harmful pathogens. Number 34. The female reproductive system isn't just damaging to pathogens, it can also make the sperm's job very difficult. Almost every single sperm out of the millions ejaculated into a female during intercourse die before reaching the egg. This is why getting pregnant for some women can be so difficult. Sperm are hardy and can last up to 5 days in the female reproductive system, but more often than not, the hostile environment inside the female's reproductive tract kills them within hours. There are other creepy creatures that the female body seems to have an adverse effect to besides microbes and sperm. Number 33. Researchers at Carnegie Mellon University conducted a study where they gauged the reactions of human babies when they were shown pictures of a human face versus a spider. What they found was that female babies spent more time looking at human faces than spiders. Males, on the other hand, spent about the same time looking at both. This might suggest that the female brain has evolved a natural awareness that those creatures can be harmful and should be kept away from. 
This is evolutionarily beneficial as females are much more vital to the continuation of the species than males are. If a male gets bit by a poisonous spider, he can still provide sperm even as he's dying. If a female gets bit by a poisonous spider while pregnant, it could harm the offspring. Number 32. Unfortunately for females, they are much more likely to suffer than males. This is because the pain that females feel is more intense. Scientists aren't sure why this is, but it might have to do with hormones in the female body. It's been hypothesized that estrogen can dampen the body's painkiller signals, which then amplifies the pain itself. This could explain why females feel more severe pain even if the affliction is the same for both sexes. Pain can even be amplified further by the female body in this next situation. Number 31. Women need to plan ahead when looking into getting a root canal, otherwise their bodies could turn against them. Estrogen not only dampens painkiller signals, but it can cause dry sockets in the mouth when there are high amounts of the hormone in the body. If a dry socket becomes infected, it's reported to be one of the most painful experiences of someone's life. One way to avoid this catastrophe is to schedule dental work when the estrogen levels are lowest in the body. This is typically in the last week of the menstrual cycle. Number 30. What do human females and sharks have in common? They both produce a compound called squalene. In females, this molecule helps keep the vagina lubricated. In sharks, squalene is found in the liver. Although human females produce the same compound, we use shark squalene in moisturizers and skin creams. It acts as an emollient, which moistens the skin. This isn't surprising as it does the same thing for the vagina. Surprisingly, scientists at the American Cancer Society have found that the squalene from sharks can also help reduce the effects of chemotherapy on normal human cells. It does this without inhibiting the chemotherapy drug's effect on the cancerous cells. Scientists aren't quite sure why this is, but more research is being done. Number 29. Sometimes women find that hair is clogging the shower drain. This isn't surprising as their pubic hair only lasts around three weeks before falling out. When compared to the life cycle of hair on the head, this is an incredibly short amount of time. So when cleaning the drain, there's a good chance that some of that hair being pulled out is from the pubic region. Men can typically drink more alcohol than women. We're not sure that that's something to be proud of, but the reason why has surprisingly little to do with body type. Number 28. Most females can't drink as much as males of a similar size because they produce less of the necessary stomach enzymes used to break down ethanol. This leads to higher intoxication levels as more and more ethanol gets into the bloodstream and circulates around the body. The result is that females tend to get drunker quicker than most males do. Another downside to drinking alcohol as a female is that hangovers can be worse than for males. This is because the female body contains lower percentage of water than the opposite sex, which causes worse dehydration, nausea, and headaches after drinking too much alcohol. Number 27. It may sound crazy, but some females are born with not just one but two uteruses. As the fetus develops, the uterus starts as two separate tubes. Over time, they join together to create one large organ. However, sometimes a condition called uterus idelphus occurs and a female is born with two separate uterus. In unique circumstances, a second vagina might form as well. This creates a forked path within the body to the uteruses. Number 26. The uterus is an amazing organ. It's incredibly elastic as it needs to stretch out a lot during pregnancy. How much does it stretch, you might be wondering? Normally, the uterus is only around 4 to 5 inches long. However, during gestation, it can grow many times that size. In fact, the uterus can extend all the way up to the belly button around 20 weeks into pregnancy. The midsection of a female is full of tightly packed organs. This is exacerbated by the fact that there is a part of the digestive tract which is extra long in their bodies. Number 25. The female body probably didn't need to have anything else crammed into its midsection, but part of the colon called the sigmoid is longer in women than men. This is the end of the large intestine where fecal matter is stored until the waste is ready to leave the body. Theoretically, this means that if a female held in their bowel movement, which we definitely don't recommend, they could have larger poops than a man. Number 24. Everyone poops, even females. Number 23. Having all of the reproductive organs and the extra portion of the sigmoid in the midsection means that there's not much room for expansion. Everything is squeezed into such a small space that the female body digests food and gas builds up. It can cause abdominal distress. This is just a fancy way of saying that females get more frequent stomach aches and release more gas after eating due to the limited space for expansion. There is one fascinating fact about the female reproductive organ that seems almost unbelievable. Number 22. Females are born with all of the eggs they will ever have already in their ovaries. Around 6 to 7 million oocytes or unformed eggs are created during development. But when a female baby is born, she normally ends up with closer to 1.2 million eggs in her ovaries. As she ages, more and more eggs are destroyed and their remnants are absorbed back into the body. By the time a female reaches puberty, she has around 400,000 eggs. Then when menopause occurs, there are about 1,000 eggs left in her ovaries. The menstrual cycle occurs when an egg leaves the ovary and is not fertilized. When this happens, there's bleeding, but not as much as you might think. 
Number 21. Everyone's body is different. Some females lose more blood than others during their menstrual cycle. However, on average, women lose around 4 tablespoons each month due to their period. It's important to note that some females bleed a lot more than that, as they might have a heavier flow. Number 20. A female's period does not just cause pain in the midsection, but can actually mess with the brain as well. The pain associated with the menstrual cycle causes the brain to lose focus. Research has shown that this can hinder a female's ability to do complex tasks while the body is trying to mitigate the pain from cramps and the shedding of the uterine lining. But worry not, even when a female's brain is distracted, they still have a leg up on men. Number 19. In studies conducted around memory and the ability to retain information, women between the ages of 45 and 55 perform better in almost every category. Even more impressive is this study was conducted while the females were going through menopause, which is known to negatively affect memory recall. Yet, women still remember things better than men, who had no biological excuse for their low scores. This means that throughout a female's life, she will likely be able to recall and remember things much better than the males around her. Number 18. Females have a strong connection between the two hemispheres of their brain. When given a difficult task to solve, research has shown that women use many parts of their brain simultaneously rather than just sticking to one portion. Men, on the other hand, over-engage a single section of their brain. This means that women might combine both logic and intuition when problem-solving, allowing them to think up better solutions more quickly than the opposite sex. Number 17. There is no denying that women are better multitaskers than men. A possible reason for this was published in the Journal of Neuroscience. The section of the brain called the corpus callosum makes sure that both hemispheres are communicating with one another. The female corpus callosum is larger than the males, which is theorized to be one of the main reasons why women can multitask with such high efficiency. Females have some unique abilities when it comes to their senses. It's often said that women are much more perceptive than men, and there's a biological reason for this. Number 16. The gene that allows people to see the color red is only found on the X chromosome. This means that unlike males, females have two of these genes. The researchers have found that a combination of a normal gene for seeing red and a mutated one allows females to see a broader spectrum of red-orange colors than males. The fact that males only have one copy of this gene also explains why more men are red colorblind than women. Females are also better at differentiating color hues in the yellow-green spectrum, which means they literally see the world differently than men do. Number 15. Both women and men have the same ability to sense smells. However, women can learn to detect a particular scent much better than men can. This ability develops during a woman's childbearing years, and research at Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia has shown that women can smell certain aromas at one one-thousandth of their original concentration. This likely has to do with hormones that are present in the body, somehow making the olfactory neurons more sensitive. Might sound crazy, but females can even sense when their partner is stressed just by smelling the body odor of their shirt. And this isn't the only sense that females have the upper hand in. Number 14. Females have more taste buds on their tongues than males. This means that they have the ability to taste more flavors that might be hidden in food than men. It's also hypothesized that extra taste buds give females more sensitive, sophisticated palates. Number 13. Women can experience multiple orgasms during sex. Once a male's orgasm, he has to wait for his refractory period to end before he can climax again. Females don't have this problem, they can just keep going and going. And this brings us to a mysterious part of the female reproductive system, the G-spot. Number 12. There's a belief that a magical portion of the female sex organ can cause an incredibly intense and pleasurable orgasm when stimulated. This has become known as the G-spot. The original name for this region was the Grafenberg Zone, named after Ernst Grafenberg, the German physician who proposed the area existed. As of yet, there has been no actual proof that a G-spot exists. The best guess of what the G-spot could be as of right now is that it's an internal extension of the clitoris. However, many doctors doubt it exists at all. Another myth of the female body that needs to be debunked also has to do with sex, or the lack thereof. Number 11. For centuries and even today, many people believe that the hymen needs to be intact for a female to be considered a virgin. This is absolutely not true. The hymen is a thin layer of tissue that's located just inside the vagina. It's flexible but not very strong, meaning that physical activities such as biking, horseback riding, or even inserting a tampon can stretch or tear the hymen. Just because a female's hymen is broken does not mean she's had sex. Although this next female fact might seem messy, it's actually part of the natural cleaning process. Number 10. The female reproductive system will sometimes release discharge without warning. This can stain underwear, but it's a natural process the body needs to make sure the vagina remains clean and infection-free. Number 9. 
The vagina is full of folds and rugi, which are a series of ridges created by the folding of tissue. The reason that the female body needs to create discharge and why it's so important for the vagina to remain clean is because microbes can find refuge in these folds. The ridges are caused by an increase in estrogen that thickens the vaginal tissue. After menopause or while a woman is nursing a newborn, she produces less estrogen, and this causes the folds to flatten out and the entire vagina to become thinner and drier. Number 8. The reduction of estrogen in the female body might result in women in the later stages of life experiencing discomfort during sex. Luckily, with a little bit of lube and patience, the side effects that low estrogen levels have on the vagina can be mitigated during sexual intercourse. Number 7. Women lose collagen at a faster rate than men do. This can lead to more wrinkles in the skin. However, numerous studies have shown that even though men retain more collagen, they look older than women of the same age. This is likely because men tend not to take care of their skin and their body as well as females do. The other reason for this has to do with skin thickness. Number 6. Women's skin is thinner than men's skin on average. This means that the female body shows fewer facial lines and aging spots. It might also account for why some women feel colder than men do, even while the temperature around them is the same. Are females actually more flexible than males? And if so, why? Number 5. The female body contains more elastin than the male body. Elastin is a protein that allows connective tissues to stretch. The fact that the female body contains more of this protein means that they are indeed more flexible than men. On top of that, females tend to have a wider pelvis that gives them a more extensive range of motion. What time of year do women crave sex more? Number 4. Surprisingly, the answer to this question isn't wintertime when it's cold and you're stuck inside. Instead, investigations have found that women actually crave sex more during the summer. Researchers think the reason for this is because of the scents that are present during this time of year. As discussed earlier, females have a strong sense of smell and are able to recall scents better than men. It's not exactly known which smells trigger the female drive of sex, but whatever they are, they appear to be more plentiful in the summer. Another factor that might explain this phenomenon is that sunlight helps activate serotonin in the body, which is a key neurotransmitter that allows humans to experience pleasure. Therefore, if the summer sun causes the female body to want to be pleased, it might cause them to seek out one of the more gratifying experiences in life. Number 3. Regardless of the time of year, women are better at identifying sexual intentions than men are. Both sexes tend to miss cues of sexually interested individuals from time to time, but women are much better at identifying the difference between a friendly interaction and one that has other connotations. This means that in the game of finding a mate, females will likely have much more success than males as they will miss fewer opportunities. And if that last fact got your heart racing, it's nothing compared to our next insane fact about the female body. Number 2. The female heart beats faster than a male heart. This is because female heart tends to be smaller even when compared to similar body size. To make up for the smaller dimensions, female hearts beat more frequently to ensure enough blood is circulated around the body. The average male heart beats around 70 to 72 beats per minute, while the female heart beats around 78 to 82 beats per minute. Number 1. Females don't need males or their sperm to reproduce anymore. Using in vitro fertilization and other assistive pregnancy methods, two females can combine their genetic information and have a baby. However, two sperm will never be able to be combined to create a viable offspring since an egg is essential for an embryo to form. This means that females might not have any use for males in the future. Now watch Lady Death, world's deadliest female sniper, or check out Female vs Male Prison. How do they compare?